Imps. How are we doing today? Uncle Gumball Dank, Cat Lord, Page, Punk Corpse, Mr. Krabs123, Chopped Liver, Straw Hat, Monty, Nasty, Redacted, Alioth, Nerodia, thank you for the subs, by the way. Incredibly generous of you. JS Masochist, Sentient Rat, Little Morphine, Annie, Dark Slime Zero. Killjoy, 40K, Emerald Queen, Retcon, 404, V1, and only, truly, Snoogan, Ashmar, Mayfleet, DX3. Uncle Gumbald, I am going to slap you comedically in a cartoonish manner. Comrade Girl, 2018, Glitchmaster, Cushmilk, from the YouTube chat. We have Zach Fletcher, Lillibror, Ma Machionio, Leth, Leith, Leth, I don't know. I always don't know how to exactly to say it, but I always say Leth, Leith. I don't know. I guess I vary. But regardless, sick name, love it, love to be, not, love to not know how to pronounce things unironically. Tori Cassiatori, Eddie Spencer, Laureate, another board person, Caravican, Ron's KFC. Thank you so much for being here today. I hope you are doing well. Oracow, Pam Urin, Trickster Jackal, David Bryant, Goofer. Wow, we have a we have a we have a quite a decent number of people here today. Uh, if you are so inclined, please press like on the stream right now. As you have, can tell, my goodness gracious, what is going on? As you can tell, I have new glasses. I'm quite excited about them. I really like them. I think they're really great. However, there is a problem with these glasses that you might already be noticing, which is that they are significantly more reflective than my previous glasses. And that kind of sucks at the moment because I think they look really good. I do, Orakau. Turn down the lights. Well, that's not so easy. But what I did do is I did raise my light to a actually hilarious height. There's the full, that was the glare that was on them before I made adjustments. But actually now my beautiful lighting is just slightly off. It's not noticeable probably to most of you, except for unless you guys are like film nerds and shit. But to me, it's driving me crazy. And another thing is there's a reflection that I haven't figured out how to solve yet when I'm looking at chat. And that's driving me nuts. It's driving me nuts! Thank you so much. I really like these glasses. I've gotten a lot of compliments on them and that makes me feel like I went in the right direction. Watch, you guys can see in real time the difference between my old glasses. Here's my old glasses, okay, ready? I'm gonna put the old glasses on. Old glasses. Mm 
New glasses. New glasses for a new era. See, I think they're really great. Honestly, I really like them. The old glasses, I think, have a dignity that I enjoy, and I like that. I don't hate them, but I'm happy and ready for something new. Um, yeah, so. Aska, thank you so much for the gifted tier one sub. Incredible, incredible. Um, it means you'll have a d dramatic anime glasses sheen, says another bored person. First of all, thank you so much for the super chat. And secondly, uh, yes, I will, I suppose, when I go like this. <laughs> it is kind of cool, right? I should use Philips Hue. Um, I don't use the Philips Hue. Um, I actually, ha I do have some modifiable lights, but they don't work well in my setup. What I have up there is a studio uh, soft light, which I'm very, very happy with for the most part, but it's actually not soft enough for how reflective these glasses are. Um, I even got a, a, a glare proof coating. I got an anti-reflective coating, but this is just, a, these glasses are big, so they're a big change. I'll figure it out though. Additionally, we have begun work on the new studio. That's right. Uh, I mentioned some time ago, uh, it's been, it feels like it's been forever now, but I mentioned some time ago um, that I was, um, that I've been working on a studio revamp and we're actually going to be moving, not to a different house right yet. That will happen sometime in the future, of course, but for now, I'm just moving to a different room in my house that is a little bit better tuned. So I don't know an exact timeline. I'm going to say probably about a month from now, we will finally have a new, completely new studio setup. It is going to look nothing like this. There might be some passing similarities because of my stylistic touch, but it's going to be a pretty amazing revamp. We've begun that process. Uh, I was working on it this week, in fact, um, in addition to a bunch of other things. Um, so that should be... Uh, uh, that should be pretty cool. Um, I'm very excited about it. I think you guys are going to love it. I think it's going to have a lot of character and I think it's going to be as exciting as the change to this studio because I'm making a lot of changes to it. And when I go to that room, I'm actually going to be changing the lighting setup. We're gonna be doing some more dynamic lighting. We're probably going to have variable lighting. We might even have a green screen which would be pretty fun. We'll see how it goes. I'm not 100% sure if I want to have a green screen, but we might have a green screen. In fact, we might even do a green screen that we can wheel in, which would be pretty amazing. You want lighting that sp that sinks to the bazinga? B -b 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 bazinga. Hold on, there's a way I could do that. Hold on. Mm. Actually, it's a little hard in this room because my app is... Yeah, actually, it's going to be really hard to do. Hold on. There might be a way. Hold on, there is a way I can do that. Hold on, here we go. Wait, 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 wait. Hold on. I'm committing to the bit now. Filters. Let's add a color correction. Color correction two. Okay, ready? Bazing, buzz, 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 bazinga, 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 bazinga. There we go. That was a really lazy effect, but I'm sure it, I'm sure it was fairly funny. Okay, there we go. I look deep fried. Yeah, because I was just cranking the saturation bars. I was just going. <laughs> oh my god. Oh my goodness. Oh god, I have so much to talk about. Uh, I I didn't mean to not to not stream for the last week but I was so crazy busy this week. And also, uh, then I saw Dune 2, and after I saw Dune 2, all I did was read Dune for days. I was just like, it's time. And I've read like 300 plus pages of Dune in the last few days. I did other things too. I mean, I had a lot of other stuff to do this week. It was a busy week, but yeah. I'll talk about Dune. Oh my God, I have so much to talk about. God, I have so much goddamn stuff to talk about. Ron's KFC with the $20. 
Speaking of anime, can we have a moment of silence for the great Akira, Akira Toriyama? Um, first of all, thank you, Ron's KFC, for supporting the show. It truly means the world to me. Thank you so very, very much. Um, and yes, we can have a moment of silence. Not too long, though, because as we all know, what Akira Toriyama would really have wanted us to do was not spend too much time grieving him and instead fight onwards with the spirit of Goku, always facing forwards, always improving, always fighting to be the best that we can be. So that's what we're going to do. That is what we are going to do. But honestly, I probably will talk about Akira Toriyama later in this stream. Um... I, I don't know, I don't feel like I can properly give words uh, that would do honor to an artist of such incredible caliber. Um, Akira Toriyama's works were a big part of my young life. Um, his art for Chrono Trigger uh, has stuck with me since childhood. Dragon Ball Z was like, one of the most exciting and interesting shows I'd ever seen as like a, a, you know, going into my early teen years. It was something that was a constant source of excitement and interest and inspiration. Um, my God, he changed the world and, and he touched so many aspects of art that I enjoy. Um, so I don't know that I can do him justice, but, you know, uh, I'll probably talk about some of the stuff as a bit of a tribute. Uh, my goodness. Chrono Trigger was one of the most important games uh, of my youth. And uh, and his art brought so much life to it. It's incredible. It's actually incredible. Um, yeah. Jupiter Siren with the $10. Thank you so very much. Jupiter Siren says, those glasses look incredible on you. In terms of the reflection, you might be able to flag it off with one of those picture thingies with an alligator clip on it and a piece of cardboard on your desk. Maybe. It might be possible for me to flag, but the problem is that this light is my primary light source. So maybe, but it might also cast a huge shadow if I do that. Um, in its current form, it's not too, too bad. It's mostly only when I'm looking over and up to like read over here. But um, but yeah, I've actually, this one, the little, there's a little reflection that's when I'm looking, when I'm looking at my, uh, at my OBS stuff, which is fairly frequent. And that one is really driving me nuts. And I think I can get that, I think that one I'll be able to block out because it's just a fucking Windows toolbar that doesn't have a dark mode. Which is a sin, by the way. If you're an app developer out there and you don't put a dark mode into your goddamn app, what are you doing? What are you thinking? Just, what are you thinking? What the fuck is going on over here? Hold on a second. What is, what the fuck is happening on the YouTube side of things? Is this for fucking real? Oh. Okay. It's the new YouTube ad settings. Okay, so it's everyone is not getting hit with them. That's crazy. YouTube is telling me every five seconds that it's gonna be sending ads out. By the way, we have 137 viewers right now, but only 93 likes. Why do we only have 137 viewers? Wow, that's actually kind of small. Did I do something wrong? Is there something wrong with my title? Am I, do people not like me anymore? That's sad. Oh well, it is a Sunday night, I guess. Maybe people are sleepy. Oh shit, it's the Oscars. That's why. Fuck, why did I, what was I thinking? What was I thinking? Shit, it's the goddamn Oscars, isn't it? Isn't this the Oscars tonight? Or is that not tonight? Yeah. Yeah, it's like right now. God damn it. And I do have a lot of film buffs in my audience. Oh, that was a foolish idea. Oh well, such is life. People, that means more people will watch the VOD. Boy, I didn't, I didn't think that one through. Oh well, 
the true fans will be here and you guys will get a special experience. Like for example, I was thinking we could goof around real quick. Hold on, something's wrong here. Hold on, wait. Stop! Stop the music! Ah! Wait. Okay, so both are going through right now. Right? Did they hear both my voices? Or just one? Tell me. Tell me now! Did you hear both my voices or one? Yes, it's working. Yes! <laughs> okay, hold on now. There was a, there was a thing I wanted to do. How am I gonna figure this out? There we in! It's great to see you! I was just thinking about you! I'm a- I'm a Kawaii now! I sound small? Yeah? Small? I'm a small bean! So small! 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 Okay, hold on a second. There's another thing I wanted to do. Banana? What the fuck is a banana? Please, Lolita! With a tear for some! The first white maid you must rid the world of is your own! True! We must rise together as the proletariat and seize the means of protection! Of Kawaii characters! Okay, this one's kind of funny, but I don't love these AI ones. They have them, they drop out and they're whiz. Like, watch this, if I do the baby. Here's the baby. Whoa. Excuse me? There we go. Alright, now we're at the baby. The baby, doesn't it sound so much better? Because it doesn't do that AI shit. It's like... It is way more goofier, but it's functional. It works. <laughs> Mithro with the five gifted YouTube subs. Thank you. You're the best. Better for the potato. Taking care of the white bulls in the audience. Maybe I should pitch it down just a little bit. There we go. That's a little better. Now, when I scream, you know, it won't be like ear piercing. You sh I should do the whole stream like this. Unironically, can you imagine how funny it would be if we did the entire State of the Union commentary with this? Oh my god, it would be so bad. Oh, it would be so evil and cursed. Nobody would watch it and everyone would unsubscribe. But guess what? I might just do it. What I wanted to do, though, was I wanted to do... I wanted to figure out how to do... Oh, a custom voice. Ooh, okay, hold on. Give me a second. I want to try something. I want to try... Um... Oh, they get rid of all these. Oh, that's so silly. I want to find one that sounds like the... Oh, what's this one? 
Oh, you have to import all these. I want to Okay, maybe they've got one here. That I can do. Ooh, a Kylo Ren would actually be so good. We got a Kylo Ren. We got... There's so many cool ones that are made by the, the fucking community. There's also a lot of stupid ones I'm seeing. And what I was hoping to do was to... to I want to spoil it. I want to try and figure it out. Let's see if I can do it. Here, let's try this. Test. No. That doesn't sound right. Ah. Uh, wow. Why is it? See, I wanted to that actually works great! This is perfect! Hold on a second. You are now watching the intro to Dune. What I said was, um, uh, uh, uh the Dune OC, I couldn't get it. Oh man. Oh my god, it does make me sound like fucking Seth Rogen. But with a weird voiceover. Ooh, what's this one? Hello. It triggered its own looping detection with its own echo effect. It was doing it, it's triggering itself. This one's just supposed to be like a cathedral and it actually works pretty well. I want to find one. I mean, there's some that I already had that I love that are like really good. Like you guys know, we did this one. Hold on, I'll, I'll put this one on. There we go. Approaching. Payload ready to drop. Warheads in tow. We are ready. Target identified. Aiming and fire. Bazinga. Kind of cool, right? Uh. Hello. This one's a good for if I need to shout somebody down. But the default is always pretty good. Going to the baby is always safe. Now this is content. Oh, I can make some Helldiver jokes in this joke. Attention Helldivers. Wait, that's the... No, this is the right one. Attention Helldivers. You fight for managed democracy. We spread it to the buggy bugs from all over the galaxy who wish to steal your loved ones, your wives, your children. They want to fuck your dog, and you are going to stop them. Make sure to remember to input your stratagems and not to blow up your teammates unless they are having anti-democratic thoughts. Oh, is that a, is that my liberty? Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to keep transmitting. Uh, give me a second here. <laughs> oh, sorry, <laughs> I'm choking on my liberty! Oh, shit. 
So if I do that, now it should be back to normal. Okay, now we're back to normal. Everybody, you can hear me now. Everything should be good. See, this is the wonderful, great, cool stuff that you get to hear and see if you come early and if you are a true fan who doesn't go and fucking watch cultural events like the Oscars. Listen, um, I find the Oscars fairly interesting to like reflect upon, but I don't like watching them. I'll be completely honest. I don't like, I don't like watching them, you know? It's just, uh, I don't know. I don't know, there's something about it. It's so slow. It's definitely, it's, I will say the Oscars are way more interesting than the video game awards. The video game awards were miserable. Like that shit was pathetic. But um, does anybody really care about them anymore? Yes, yes, many people do care about them anymore. Yeah, they do. Um, but yeah. The VGA was like all ads. Yeah, it was like 90% ads and then they rushed through some of the most important awards, which was pathetic, honestly. <sighs> I should find a Lich King voice filter. Ooh, that would be a good one. I bet those do exist. Here, let me check if I can find one. I was happy that the... Um, I was happy that the, the the Space Marine one let me do the Dune burm bam be loop that shit. I love that intro, by the way. One of my favorite things about the Denny Dune is that that the Sardaukar voice chant thing where they do the cheeseburger hamburger. That shit, cool as fuck. So cool. What a great touch. One of the few, I gotta talk about Dune 2. Oh my God, I gotta rant about Dune 2. I gotta do it. I gotta talk about it. Denis Villeneuve. Um, God, there's so much I wanna say about Dune 2, but also there's so much we have to talk about today. So, um, Oh yeah, I didn't mention Dragon Quest. The thing is, I never played Dragon Quest. I, I did play one of the Dragon Quests, but uh, I, I, Dragon Quest was not something I ever got into. Uh, I know there that people really love them, but I, it was not something I did. You gotta dip out for the Dune stuff. Well, I'm not gonna do it right now. I still gotta warm up and stuff. However, you wanna know what I'm drinking today? I'm drinking spiced Coca-Cola. It's a new flavor of Coke, and it's actually really fucking good. It's like, I don't know how to describe it. It tastes like Coke, but it has like, they like, it feels like they doubled up the cola spice, which is awesome because I love, like, I love the cola flavor of colas. Like the, the spiciness is really good. It's not like strictly better than normal Coke, but it is very good and I like it a lot. And it fits because I'm gonna be talking about Dune at some point. Is it more like sarsaparilla? It's more like, hmm. yeah, I guess it is kind of like sarsaparilla now that I think of it. All right, got your memes down, Mr. Krabs. It's really good. I've been drinking it a bunch since I bought it and I really enjoy it. It's a little strong, but I don't know, it's good. It's actually really good. I'm a big fan, as you all know, I'm a diet coker, okay? I'm one of those people. I'm one of the, I, on the on the cola wars, I fight for diet coke, okay? I, I'm, I've been, you know, I've been plugged into the machine and I, I'm fueled by it. I really like diet coke and uh, coke zero too. And uh, um, so this is like a cool thing that I like, I guess. Yeah, yeah, true, Uncle Gumbald. I'm in the Matrix. Louie Boy says, Demon Mama, in honor of the rapidly approaching Pride Month, Pride Month, Pride D Month, uh, I want to share that I'm getting into drag for the first time. Based! My drag name is going to be Svetlana Baha Blast. 
and I'm sewing some long gloves. That's amazing. I love that. That's really good. And that sounds amazing. I, oh my God. Oh God, it is rapidly approaching. This year is flying by. God, it's tormenting me. The speed at which 2024 has rapidly blasted out of, out of my control has been, it's so unsettling. But I've been doing a lot, to be fair. But I've been doing so goddamn much this year. And it's been good for me. I've been taking good care of myself this year, I guess. Um, but it's also been a hard year in its own ways. A lot of weird things. What a mess. But, you know. Goofer says, Demon Mama has been propagandized by Diet Coke. Clearly, Dr. Pepper is better. Uh, Dr. Pepper is really good. My partner is a pepperhead. Uh, my partner loves Dr. Pepper, and I get it. Dr. Pepper is really good, but there's a problem with Dr. Pepper, which is that the diets, the diet Dr. Pepper is fucking terrible. It's, it's abhorrent. It's not, it's not good at all. It's terrible. It's genuinely bad. Um, and yeah, I don't know. So, have you tried hot Dr. Pepper? No, but I've heard about that. I've heard that Dr. Pepper was originally designed to be drunk hot. But, uh, but yeah. A lot of apples with the tiers three sub. Oh my God, thank you so much. That's so generous. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sprite, I like Sprite and I like Sprite Zero too. Sprite Zero is good. Uncle Gumbald says, you hit an oil slick at 30 and then it's just careening towards the grave, Demon Mama. That's not actually been my experience. Um, honestly, my 30s, which I'm in my early 30s still, uh, believe it or not, <laughs> but I'm still in my early 30s and my 30s have been, they have felt fairly long, honestly. Um, when I look back, I'm like, oh my God, it was 2020 was the first year of my 30s that feels like a hundred years ago. The entire pandemic era was is so strange, you know? And it, it kind of sucks that my early 30s were were in the pandemic because I, I don't know. It feels like that may have impeded me from being, from growing to the maximum amount that I could have. But you know, at the same time, sometimes surviving a plague transforms you. And I do think that I've been, in a lot of ways, I'm, I'm there's this horrible thing, okay? And I'm, you know what? We're going to talk about it, all right? We're going to talk about it. That's right. There's a weird fucking thing in American culture. And I think part of it is just because of the, the constant, perpetual, like, uh, uh, I don't know, flood of youthful people, really young people, I should say, on the internet. There's this thing in American culture where people act like you're dead once you're 30. Like it's fucking over. And I'm just like, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense to me. And I remember feeling that when I, when I turned 29 was when it hit me the most. I felt really weird when I turned 29. And um, I was like, what the fuck? Wow, Jesus Christ, my 20s like disappeared. But the reality is that like, your 30s are when you're like, I feel like, at least for me, and I think for a lot of people, your 30s are like when you figure yourself out for the first time in your life. And you go, oh, oh, wait a second. I think I've started to figure some shit out about myself and I know how I work. And that means that I know how to like, I don't know, engage with the world in a way that works for me. And that makes you instead of like i don't know the tw your 20s are always like okay i don't want to generalize too much but i feel like like in when you're in your 20s there's still so much like your early 20s especially is like there's so much residual influence of your of your high school years of your family and all of that type of shit like you have so much fallout or or whatever even if you have like a really good and supportive family and all that you're still so attached to them in your early 20s and then you get you finally get away from that 
like in your mid 20s for most people uh some people get away from it in their early 20s but it for a lot of people it takes until your mid 20s until you're really like kind of all right i'm not completely entangled with everything that's going on in my family at all times you know your mom your siblings or whatever and you might even be connected with them still, but it's di it's different. You've learned to stand on your own a little bit. And then you kind of have to figure shit out for a couple years where, where you're kind of just trying shit. And it's like, does this work for me? What is this? You know? And then you hit, get to your 30s and you've figured a couple things out. And even if you've only figured out a few things, even if you've only got a couple pieces of like you that you've got, this works for me. It's such an advantage. Like, I don't know. Like, one that I was talking about recently is, like, I have, like, a complete a completely different policy towards sleep than I did in my 20s. And it's not even that I'm, like, overall less energetic, um, though definitely I feel that's a little bit happened, especially since I got COVID twice and, so you know, I hurt my back and all that shit. But even still... I feel like I do way more than I used to do when I was in my 20s. I do way more shit than I did in my 20s, in my 30s. But there's one thing that I just won't play ball with anymore, which is like, if I'm fucking ready to go to bed, unless there is a very goddamn good reason for it, of something I care about, a family member, uh, somebody that I love, if I, like, jobs, fucking ob social obligations, whatever... I don't fucking care anymore. In my 20s, I would de I destroyed my sleep schedule to, to get more hours at work because I thought I needed to do that. I would never fucking do that anymore. There is no advantage to it. You, like, nobody can fucking pressure me in that way. If I want to break my sleep schedule or whatever to go do something, I'll do it. But Jesus fucking Christ. Hey, welcome. Come on in and get comfortable. Thank you so very much for the raid from Vosh. Welcome, everybody. Come get comfortable. Very, very good to see you all. I'm ranting and rambling right now. So if you're into me dropping random takes about life and shit like that, this is the stream for you. But I, we have a lot to talk about going forward. Wait, maybe I should... Wait. Now I'm back to my regular voice now that we've welcomed everybody in. No malarkey. Oh, I forgot malarkey. I was talking about the Biden and I forgot malarkey, but that's because I was distracted with other things. I was ranting about how, uh, how in my 20s, I would let my, let other people disturb my sleep schedule, especially work. And now I'm just like, nah, no, I'm sorry. If you don't value my my work and my labor and whatever um enough to to fucking let me sleep so that i can do my job well fuck you basically that's my attitude um yeah <laughs> sorry sector c didn't mean to destroy any of your didn't mean to destroy any of your ears um if you're having issues uh, on the website with viewing, I apologize. Uh, YouTube is very aggressive about ad blockers. So consider just turning off your ad blocker during the time that you're watching. Uh, if you use uBlock Origin, you can just power it off on 
YouTube and on my website, and it should solve the lagging problems. But, you know. Um, help! Please end this! Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Hey, thank you, Nuts. I appreciate that. Good call. Um, I didn't say no tomfoolery either. Ms. Molina with the five gifted tier one su uh, subs. Thank you so much. Thank you so very much. And Kenova Kingamon with the tier three sub. Thank you very, very, very much for supporting the show. Ms. Molina with another gifted tier one su sub. Thank you so much. Um... Hey, no problem, Jazz Dog. I hope you're doing okay. I've seen you active, so I'm happy to know you're doing you're doing good. It has been a while. Uh, we've been playing your your track a lot, although we've added to the repertoire of tra tracks recently. By the way, how do you all like my new glasses? Some of you who are coming in have probably seen me before, but you haven't seen my new glasses. Aren't they cute? Minus the stupid glare, which I'm trying to fix. I'm trying to fix the stupid glare. Uh, I, I, when I booted up my stream today, I got my glasses two days ago. Well, I ordered them like, like a week and a half ago. And then I got them two days ago and I sat down for stream and realized that the new shape, uh, produces a glare. You can actually see the glare when I'm looking up like this. So I had to move my light way ridiculously high and move all kinds of shit around. You should be proud of me is what I'm saying. You should be proud of me, goddammit. You look like femme Harry Potter. F Shut up. Shut the fuck up. The I know you're saying that to trigger me because I know you were here when I ranted about the stupid fucking Harry Potter comparisons the other day. Fucking... This is so dumb, okay? Let me, I'm gonna rant about it again just because you said that, okay? It's so fucking stupid. When I got my hair cut short, I didn't like that haircut, okay? But you know how it is with a haircut. Sometimes you get a haircut and you go, shit, that didn't work out. Uh, now I just have to wait for it to grow out. Now you can see it's luscious and long again. Oh, it's beautiful. I'm so happy to have my long hair back. My short haircut, I didn't love it, okay? And... Some people said it kind of looked like Harry Potter's haircut. Now, it doesn't really. It was just kind of short. And I, so, whatever. And I had round glasses at that time, which, for the record, are not the type of glasses that Harry Potter has. And people kept trying to force the meme so hard that they would say that I had Harry Potter glasses and they would make a image of me and then they would edit my glasses out to be Harry Potter glasses. And then they would tell me that I have Harry Potter glasses. And I'm like, what is fucking wrong with you people? And then I realized they're probably trying to gaslight me, which is why I never really talked about it until like literally two entire, no, three entire sets of glasses later. You know, you guys haven't heard me do the fucking Harry Potter rant because that was ancient goddamn history. I've had three, yeah, three other pairs of glasses. It's, anyway, it's so fucking annoying. Is your hair naturally straight? Yes, Smelanie, my hair is naturally straight. I do not straighten my hair at all. I have, uh, for better or worse, uh, very, very straight hair. Oh, that's really weird, Sarah Daughtery. I don't know what's going on. I'm really sorry about that. YouTube has been really fucking weird about ads. That's cool, Socialist Kowalski. That's a big dub. 
Socialist Kowalski says, I want a Vietnam War style Timex watch that looks identical to the, to the CQC one my husband bought me for $1 and we sold for $600. It's nice to have this one to wear as a memento now that he's no longer around. Can I get a W? That is a fucking mega W. That is so cool. Wow. Vermin says, this is your equivalent to Hassan's head size. Yes! If people are gaslighting me about it. Oh my god! Now I know what it's like. By the way, if you are here, we have currently 360 beautiful viewers, which I appreciate very much. Thank you very much for being here. But if you would be so kind to press like on the YouTube stream, it takes but one moment to press that like button. And the cool thing about that is it always brings in new viewers, which means a lot. We only have 204 likes, but we have 360 viewers. So if I could get 160 or so likes, it would probably bring us up to, you know, who knows, like 500 fucking viewers. And then I'm going to talk about politics, which is going to be really funny and fun. In fact, I have a feeling that I'm going to generate some serious discourse tonight because I haven't even told you guys what we're going to talk about tonight. First, we're going to talk about the Biden State of the Union. We're going to watch it together. And we're going to react to it. Then we're going to do something of a double feature, which is first, we're going to talk about democracy and we're going to talk very bluntly about the problems within democracy. And then after we talk about it, we're going to sit down and we're going to watch a video that was put together by Mia Mulder about exactly this topic. Mia Mulder uh, ran for office and won. The first ever YouTuber politician. No, I don't know if that's actually true. But Mia Mulder ran for office and won and made a video about her experiences with it. And I have been recommended this video over and over and over again in the past few days. And I want to watch it because I feel that it will supplement a conversation about democracy very, very well. Um, so we're gonna do that. And then if we have time, we will, oh, I'm gonna talk about Dune 2. I'm gonna give a little, little, little reviewy poo of Dune 2. You guys missed me here, I'll do the voice. Here, let me do the voice for, uh, for everybody who just got in here, hold on. There we go. Do it. Wrong, wrong button. There you go. Now you guys have it. Now you have, for those of you out there who, uh, who speak, uh, what's that, what's that language? Is that the, uh, it's the, uh, what the hell are they called? That la what's the language? Hold on, the language that they use. I can't think of it. I'm blanking on it. It has a uh, has a term in in the books, but uh, in the movies they just made it sound like fucking like that. Anyway, it's cool as fuck. True vermin, of course, of course. The Sardaukar don't have, well, okay, they do have a planet, but the Sardaukar, their planet is called like Secludus Secundus, something along those lines, Secludus Secunda. Uh, I, I, why am I blank on this? Sel Seleucus Secundus, Seleucus Secundus. Thank you, I was so close. Um, and it's, uh, it's a, horrible prison planet where uh, where prisoners are sent and imprisoned and forced to basically fight for their lives constantly and the ones that survive get to become soldiers, get to become like in light, like, like they get raised up into elite soldiers and paid a fuckload of money. It's nightmarish. Chakobsa is the uh, Chakobsa is the hunting language of the Fremen. It's like a, a code language. It's not actually the one that the Sardaukar use.
You, I, oh, I remind you of the sad, of the sadness from inside, inside out, inside out. Aw, thank you. I guess that's a compliment. Thank you. Wait, did I miss a dono donation? Hold on a second. Let me get you. Let me read it. I, I did miss it. I'm sorry. I always go back and check them, but oh, what the hell? Let me, let me check that. The feed. Mistress Lin with the tier four sub. Thank you so very much. Oh my God. Love for the best streamer. Hope that you are doing well and your critters are too. Thank you so very much, Mistress Lin. Thank you. Seriously, you make this shit possible with your very kind donations. Thank you so very much. This is a 100% viewer supported show. So you all who donate, you're the chosen ones. Thank you. Fleabag Kitty 404 thank you so very much for the tier one sub. Really appreciate that. And also, I missed a lot of apples with the tier three sub. Thank you so very much. Thank you so very much. I think that's all of them. Oh, did I get you a lot of apples? Okay, well, I got you twice then. You want me to do the cheeseburger hamburger? Okay, oh, okay, yeah, that's great. That's a great idea. Hold on. Cheeseburger, hamburger, Big Mac, Whopper. Cheeseburger, hamburger, Big Mac, Mac, Whopper. Oh, there's a lag there. Hamburger, cheeseburger, Big Mac, Whopper. Whop, there we go. Oh, the feedback was fucking voice jamming me, and then it was glitching. Oh, it's because it's this, this one is AI powered. When they say AI powered, that's a load of fucking crock is what that is. Whoa, wait a second, hold on. Tass. Tass. Hamburger cheeseburger, Big Mac Wop Whopper. Hamburger cheeseburger, Big Mac Whopper. There we go. Is this going to be the whole stream? If I want it to. <laughs> I almost just spilled my drink. Holy shit. I'm going to put that one into the voice lab and I'm going to tweak it and I'm going to make it the perfect fucking weirdo voice. I'm going to put that one in the favorites. I'm going to voice lab that shit. By the way, what I'm using to change my voice is a voice mod premium, which I've used for a really long time. And uh, voice mod is pretty good overall um it used to have some pretty big issues but they've fixed most of them and it works pretty well now so um hey thank you internet baby i really appreciate that internet baby says whoa demon mama i love the new glasses thank you i like them too i've been feeling so good about them people have been complimenting me so much in my personal life and it was like the best feeling in the world I liked my old glasses, but I will admit they didn't, they weren't the perfect fit for my face. And I feel like these ones are perfect. They're also, it's kind of hard to see the details, but the edges have a like vine-like engraving all around them. So there's like a little vine-like pattern, which I really enjoy. What is that soundboard bite? It's a Ultra Instinct Goku. You want to know what I really want to get on here? Hold on. Can I play something for you? This is something that I've considered getting as a soundboard thing. Hold on a second. Um, I think it's the level up sound. or it's the, I can't remember if it's level up or the... I think it's a level up sound.
from Outer Wo Outer Worlds. God, what a banger! Oh, beautiful. What a beautiful level up sound, right? Isn't that great? Uh, I, I played Outer Worlds and I was okay with it, but my partner really likes Outer Worlds. And so Outer, uh, my partner has been playing it a ton. And every time I hear that level up sound, cause my partner has been playing it on the um, Steam Deck. We have a Steam Deck. And uh, every time I hear the sound, it like, it perks up my mood. Demon Mama, you have a bunch of partners. Yes, I do. Uh, my partner, uh, Gynotype, is the one who's been playing Outer Worlds so much. Um, Outer Worlds is fine. I didn't, the thing for me, something, so I really liked the, like a lot of the writing in Outer Worlds. Uh, and I liked a lot of the characters, but the gameplay just didn't, wasn't doing it for me. So I couldn't finish the game. I found the combat to be like, not engaging at all, unfortunately. And, uh, yeah. But, yeah. What about Outer World? No, not out. No, Outer Worlds, not Outer Wilds. I loved Outer Wilds. Outer Wilds gave us this fucking banger. Hold on. want it. Let's just enjoy this together before we get into the heart of this stream. Brutus Magnuson with the incredibly generous $5. Anyone wondering what to do in November? Just remember how you felt in 2016 versus how you felt in 2020. Okay. I'll try to try to talk about that in a bit. I don't know exactly what the point was that you were making, but cover of Travelers from the game Outer Wilds, and the person who covered this is the incredibly talented Luminifere. If you'll notice, Luminifere has only 519 subscribers, okay? This talented genius, 519 subscribers, and I happen to know that a lot of those subscribers are imps. 
um, because I've boosted this channel multiple times. But if you liked Luminifaria's cover of Outer Wilds, I'm going to link it in the chat one more time. 519, I know. We'd love to see. Even though this video got 68,000 views, only 519 subscribers for all that talent. Joseph Bros Tito says, what is an imp? I have no context. An imp is an enlightened fan of Demon Mama. If you're a fan of Demon Mama, you're an imp. It's based, it's cool. Being an imp is great. <sighs> well, then I'm an imp, great to have you. Um, Brutus Magnuson says, my point is that I never want to feel that dark cloud in the sky again that existed in 2016. We are going to talk about that. Uh, we'll get there. We'll get there. Uh, somebody in chat asked, um, what is Outer Wilds about? Well, let me see. Let me make sure I get this correctly. Um, I need to play. Oh, wait, wait. Who said this? What is Millie? Millie from YouTube chat said, what is Outer Wilds about? Outer Wilds is a game about inevitability, togetherness, and music. It is a game about confronting mortality. Hi. Hey, how are you doing? Oh. Oh, it's the uh, Steam Link. Uh, would you mind refilling me with fresh uh, spiced Coke? Sure. Ah, what can I say? The spice. Spice yes, melange. the geriatric spice melange. Oh, you should have heard me earlier. I got a voice changer, and I was doing the boom. The, I had it. I got it. You want to hear it? Uh, I can, I'll, I'll be able to okay, hear yeah, it. you'll have to rewind back I'll, and go I'll play. Find it. I'll find you'll it. find it. It's at the beginning. I was tooling around with it. It was great. The chat's been going yeah, crazy. Cheese, I did that, too. I, I hit that with it. It actually was really hard for me to do that when I was doing that because, I don't know, it's... It, the voice is weird, and it was giving me a feedback loop, and then it was oh, glitching sure, as well because sure. it's an AI voice. It's anyway, whatever. You'll go see it. I love you. I love you. I'm happy you're back safe. Do y'all end up getting food or? Yes, well, I'm gonna bring you yours in a minute. Wow, thank you. What'd you get me, by the way? Banana. Oh, okay, cool. All right, I'll eat they that have, before. The only, they had a like burger sandwich. Ah, uh, that's no good. But not like yeah. tortas or anything. What does spiced coke taste like? Spiced Coke tastes like double cola. It tastes like they doubled up the cola flavors in the Coke. It's very good. It's very cola-y. And I love strong cola flavors. So it just tastes like that. It's just extra double Coke. It's double cola up. I like it a lot. Anyway, I was talking about, uh, I was trying to answer Millie's question about the Outer Wilds. The Outer Wilds is a really, really good game. Um, some... I, I noticed somebody in chat said that they tried to play the Outer Wilds, but they felt overwhelmed by how much there was to do. The Outer Wilds is slightly deceptive in that regard. There's actually less to do than you think. Um, you can just kind of start the story from any angle, and that's kind of part of the beauty of the game. Um, the puzzle, the core puzzle of the game, and there is, there's one big puzzle in the Outer Wilds, and you, ha you can start in a bunch of different directions, but you won't be able to see the answer until you've gotten all the pieces necessary. And so don't worry too much. Just go and explore at your whim. Uh, I used a notebook, which was very helpful for me. Uh, I just took down notes of things to remember, and that meant that I never had to worry about forgetting something. And eventually you'll get all the pieces together and it will become apparent more or less what you need to do with one exception in the game, which I found was kind of hard to figure out exactly what you needed to do. Um, but overall, it's pretty good. Um, yeah, it's a really good game. It is a very beautiful game. And the music is to die for. Um, my God, it's the music is just incredible. Um, I didn't, I haven't finished the DLC yet. Um, Echoes, of what echoes of the eye i haven't done that one yet um but i have uh i have played it and echoes of the eye was also really good so far 
Uh, but I haven't beaten it yet, uh, just because I've been distracted with a lot of other things. I'm sure I'll revisit it and do that. Um, that's Outer Wilds. Outer Worlds, which uh, is a... Um, it's space fallout, is the best way that I can describe it. It is a... Um, it is a space RPG in the style of, like, New Vegas, um, where you, you know, you build, you have a little character sheet, and you build up your character sheets, and, uh, it has a lot of, it parodies corporate culture, uh, very heavily. Um, it kind of decided, it, like, because Fallout has gone a different direction from its roots, uh, the Outer Worlds not the Outer Wilds, which I was talking about before. The Outer Worlds um, is a... It kind of tries to restore the uh, political aspects of Fallout that have kind of fallen off as Fallout has continued. Um, it's a good game, and there's a lot that I like about it. Um, it's got good voice acting. It's got good writing. Um, it's got a very creatively presented world. Um, but I just, I couldn't get behind the combat, uh, which is a problem, by the way. I know this is going to make, there's going to be a riot the moment I say this. Um, uh, but I've never beaten New Vegas, believe it or not. Um, I know people are going to go, what the fuck is wrong with you? What the hell? But I haven't, I haven't done it. Um, and, uh, uh, the fallout, the part of the reason for that is just the, I hated the combat so much, and it made me feel like it was a chore. Um, yeah. So, you know. What is the setting in Outer Wilds, though? Uh, the setting in Outer Wilds is wood punk, is the best way I can describe it. You are in a, uh, you are in a, a solar system that is full of planets that are like from the little prince they're like miniature planets that you can like you can literally like jump your way across most of the planets in uh outer wilds or in outer world or outer wilds oh my god this is i'm this is going to be the most confusing segment any ever that's why it's not going to be a segment but in outer wilds um they're like little mini planets and you fly around in wooden technology you have like a wooden spaceship and you have little wooden wet like tools and gadgets. You don't really use weapons. Oh my god, that looks amazing. Do you want beans and rice? Um, no. I think I'll just eat this for now. I'll have beans and rice later, I guess. Um, do you mind grabbing me some... Oh, there's paper towels right there. Would you mind doing that? Oh, I'm so worried I'm gonna get this on me. Oh my god, I'm gonna have to be so careful. I'm gonna eat my food and then we're gonna do some content. Are you guys ready for some content? I love you. Thank you so much for bringing me this. This looks amazing. Genuinely incredible. Look at this. These are chile rellenos, uh, which I'm very excited to eat. I love these, and these are from a food truck, and I'm extremely excited to eat this. <clears throat> oh, holy shit. Oh my god, it's actually a little spicy. Fuck. That was spicier than I expected. Wow, that is good. Holy shit, that's like one of the best ones I've had. Wow, that's fucking good. I'm about to be careful though, it's saucy. Saucy. Chiles rellenos, delicious. Everything is delicious with bread, when breaded and fried. But, um, I mean, they're fried, but they're not breaded. Usually, well, I guess they. Oh, I guess they are. They do put some. Some some places do put flour. It's actually an omelet. They're they're the chili rellenos is like a big full green chili, and it is cooked in a, an egg. Some places do add some flour. This one tastes like just egg, and then it's full of cheese and covered in salsa, which is amazing. This one does not taste breaded at all. This one tastes like it's egg. Rellenos. Trickster Jackal says, <clears throat> I tried the fish sandwich from Wendy's and it was delicious. Right? 
I I think I think the Wendy's fish. Oh my god. Oh shit. I forgot. I didn't tell you guys about. Oh my god. I tried the fish sandwich from A and W. Holy shit. I went to A&W and I tried their fish sandwich because it's Lent and I was I watched that fish sandwich review video. It was fucking putrid. I have I literally couldn't finish it. I threw both the fish sandwiches that I ordered away. They it was so goddamn bad. Holy fuck, the A&W fish sandwich was fucking putrid. I've it's A&W in general is not fucking garbage, okay? They have they have the best fish, uh, the best cheese curds that you can get, unless you have a Culver's near you. Their their pop their big papa sandwich is good, but their fish sandwich was repulsive. It was repugnant. It was, oh my dear God! I have like, I tried eating it. Like I tried I tried t t scraping off some of the extra sauce. It was buried, okay? So here's what I want you to imagine. Two fish sticks, okay? Not not actual crispy fish, just two fish sticks, triangular shaped fish sticks put onto a shitty bun, doused in the crappiest tartar sauce that you've ever had in your entire life with fucking sweet pickles. What the fuck? No cheese. They don't put a slice of cheese on it. It's shitty fish sticks, horrible tartar sauce, and fucking sweet pickles. Putrid. Right. Oh my god, it was so goddamn bad. No, not crispy, just mushy. Oh dear fucking god, it was so bad. I was, I was so pissed off. And they charge a lot for it. It's just, it's an expensive fish sandwich. It's like a, it's priced like a fucking special. Jesus fucking Christ, it was bad. Genuinely, shockingly bad. Oh yeah, A&W in Canada is a different company. It's the same branding, but it's a different company. So I can't speak for the Canadian fish experience. This is only for the American one. And boy, oh boy, was that a fucking putrid mess. Just terrible. Just goddamn terrible. Why is this one not cutting? Maybe it's because I'm using a fucking fork. God damn it. This is so goddamn good. Spicy as fuck. Um, I haven't had Long John Silver's. I don't think we have a Long John Silver's near, near me. The fish sandwiches I've had recently are the Wendy's one, which is a banger. The Wendy's one is really goddamn good. Obviously, the McDonald's fish fillet, great. A&W, fucking trash. Wouldn't feed it to a fucking animal. Not even kidding. Trash. Um, I guess I haven't had any others yet because Carl's Jr. doesn't do a fish sandwich and, um, at least I don't think they do. And I haven't gone to the, I wanted to try the Dairy Queen one just for shits and giggles, but yeah. I heard about that Hypno Amber. I think they backed off on it already because it receives such negative, uh, negative press, which makes sense. It's a stupid idea.
the fucking Wendy's uh, surge AI pricing or whatever. That's a terrible idea. The Wendy's fish sandwich is legitimately good. I have never, I don't think I've ever eaten at a Long John Silver's now that I think about it. No, wait, I think I've had it once. But I don't know what I had. For some reason, Long John Silver's just like, there's something about Long John Silver's that just upsets me. Like, it conceptually. I don't know. It's very weird. And I don't really know anybody who regularly eats there at all. We have a Skippers. What Skippers? I'm almost done with my food. Then we can do the content. Well, this is content. I'm ranting and raving about fucking fish sandwiches. This is fucking, this is gold. This is goddamn gold. What are you talking about? This is gold. What the fuck am I talking about? This is goddamn magical, you bitches. I don't know why I'm calling you bitches, but fuck you. Arby's is like the middest of the mid. <clears throat> Look at that. No spills. <laughs> Good call. Good call, Nuts. Good call. All right, we're done. Oh, that was so good. Damn, that was good. <sighs> I didn't call you a bitch specifically. I called everyone a bitch. And I admitted my mistake. Don't you care about apologies? <sighs> okay, everybody. Wow, that spice is hitting me. That was a good one. Damn, that was good. You want to talk about, should we talk about Dune 2? We should probably get the Dune 2 thing going, and then we should jump right in. We really got to get going on this. Uh, we really got to get going on the presidential um, State of the Union, don't we? Okay, we'll do Dune later. Fuck it. We'll do we'll do we'll do the politics right away. We'll do Dune in a bit so nobody has to go away. Okay, don't worry, don't worry. Um I realized something though. There was a dono that I got before and the link was broken. And I want to say if you donated an image of your cats earlier, hold on, let me look it up real quick. Cuz I feel I always I feel bad if I don't get to everybody's dono messages when they specifically donate something for me. Or a cow, or a cow, your link didn't work. I would like to look at it, but the link just didn't work. So I'm really sorry about that, or a cow. If you want to send me a new link, you don't have to donate again. Just just ping me in chat and I'll try to look at it. Or a cow donated $5 and said, tuning in for the first time in a good while. Say hi to Peaches, our fur baby we got back in December. Hello, Peaches. I would like to see, take, take a look at you, but... Um, TFRSB, we're Voshites. We just want politics. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. Wait, here we go. We're going to zap the contrast, crank up the contrast. 
to drop down the gamma. Brightness up a little bit, no, brightness down. There we go. You step into my domain, and you think that you can tell me what type of content you want. The fact that you're a boshite, and I'm in, that's the problem. You watch here, step onto my capital world of daily crime. And you think that you can determine the future in any way. This is my domain. I will do funny voices for hours before I bend the knee to you. It's my nephew's birthday and we're about to have a bone on me. And you just want to have hot politics. No, this is a time for rapturous joy. In the spilling of blood, enjoy our jelly fireworks. You're right, though. It's really weird. You're actually kind of right. The, 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 the AI voice does absorb all of the emotion. It actually flattens out the delivery. That's kind of funny. So what I should do for this one is I should actually just put on something like this. Well, let's try this one. Test. Mm. Hello. Here we go. You believe that you can walk yourself onto my homeworld and ask for politics on the birthday of my glorious nephew, who will spill blood on the pathetic Atreides today. You think you can ignore the jelly the jelly fireworks? You think you can ignore completely our drugs concocted in the most Beautiful drug factories you've ever seen, made with the most beautiful slaves you've ever seen. And you think you can demand politics? No. No. In fact, I believe you will be the next to die in our pens. Guards, seize them. Drag them out till my nephew may slit their throat and bathe in their blood. Install a heart plug immediately. There we go. There we go. Here we go. Now I can, now I can remove this. Yes. There we go. Now we're back to normal. Everything's okay. I'm okay. I'm all right. Everything's fine. Don't worry. Don't worry. Because that voice is much better. The AI completely ruins delivery. And I can't have that because, like, I'm all about that line delivery. You guys know that. Like, so much of my fucking comedy comes from how I say words. Don't worry. We're still going to do politics. That was mostly just me goofing around. Since you increase the gamma, when will you become the Incredible Hulk? Soon. Soon. Okay, I won't lie. Uh, we got some goofiness to talk about, okay? Are we ready to do some... Are we ready for the content of the day? We've been, we've been fun and... We've been goofing around. We've been giggling. We've been having a good time. But we have to actually do something mildly serious. And you know, you know how I am. You know that I'll always bring a lot of fun and goofy commentary and whatever. Especially when we're talking about such a silly billy like Brandon. Like Joe Brandon, you know. Let me, let me clean my glasses real quick. I had a focus. <gasps> Was I out of focus and nobody told me?
I was out of focus and... Wait, I just took my glasses off? <laughs> Wait, it's because I took my glasses off! Was I also out of focus? <laughs> I'm an idiot. Okay, this is what I get. <laughs> take my glasses off to clean them and then I'm like what the fuck I look so fucking blurry what the fuck is going on oh my god oh Jesus listen it's the spice okay it's the goddamn spice <sighs> I'm having the spiced coke that's why it's the spice Oh my god. What? Oh, I'm so sorry, Baphomet. I know, YouTube is brutal right now. Okay, everybody. It's time. It's time, that's right. By the way, this is real quick. Before we go into it, we still have 300, almost 350 current viewers, but only 270 likes. So if you could smash that like button, I'm telling you, we're going to have a good time. We're gonna have a beautiful time. So smack that like button. It's gonna be perfect. All right, let's do this. Fix my hair. Oh goodness, oh goodness, oh, okay. My lovely, lovely imps. Today, together, we are going to go through President Joe Brandon's State of the Union Address 2024. Yes, that's right. Together, we are going to go through something um, that we always have done on this channel. We've basically watched every State of the Union f since I started my channel, so we're going to do it again. And we're going to talk about the politics, because you guys know I love talking about politics, even when I don't. Um, and there's a lot to talk about right now, because um, Joe Biden has put himself in a very weird place with regard to the American electorate. Um, <laughs> did you guys see, did you all see him welcoming the Nikki Haley voters the other day on social media and television, I believe? Which is a kind of crazy thing to do where he's like, you know, uh, you all might not like Donald Trump, but we also don't like Donald Trump. Come vote for me. And I feel like that's the most Democrat thing to do. Because, like, remember, like, there, nobody said shit when DeSantis, like, like, Donald Trump barely said anything when DeSantis dropped out. Oh, okay, sorry, I should revise that. Donald Trump said that he's been spending lots of time with Ron DeSantis' wife when Ron DeSantis uh, stepped out of the race. Why the fuck are Democrats spending their time congratulating and inviting the voters of a, like a second-rate Republican candidate who has some of the most deranged politics in the world to come join them? It is such a strange move. And people might go, well, yeah, but don't you think that Joe Biden like needs all the votes he can get? Yes but he actually alienates more people by being welcoming to the strange, strange people in Nikki Haley's audience instead of just letting it happen. He could, he could just let it go. It's not like it was a momentous historical event or anything, but he went out of his way to be like, come on, come on in and join us. Well, a lot of his electorate don't feel like they want those people to, to hang out. They don't, agree with them at all. In fact, their worldviews are completely opposite. So Joe Biden has been basically doing all of this shit to try and reach out to what he sees as like a reasonable Republican. But that demographic just doesn't exist to the same degree as it used to. There are no Republicans in America who will consider voting Democrat, okay? That is a thing that maybe used to be the case in like the 90s, but it's not anymore. The one, the most single unifying trait of the modern American Republican Party is 
owning the libs, okay? They hate Democrats. It is the most tribal the Republican Party has basically ever been. The Republicans become Republicans because they, more than anything else, they hate Democrats. So the idea that you're going to get Republicans to vote Democrat because they have some, you know, conceptual issue with Donald Trump is just like, bro, what? And in the meantime, him playing to that audience and pitching to that audience shakes the already shaky um, faith that his own voters have in him. Democrats do not feel strongly about Joe Biden. His approval rating is terrible. He's not even popular in his own party. People see him as meandering, as a uh, as somebody who compromises when he doesn't need to, as someone who's weak on the topic of genocide. That is a terrible thing to be perceived as. Um, they see him as potentially infirm, unable to lead, too old. This is not a good state for him to be in. And I'm very interested because believe it or not, I have not seen essentially anything outside of a handful of very short clips from this State of the Union. So this is going to be a very interesting thing for me to watch together with you all and analyze to see how he angles his rhetoric going into his new year. And it's got to be a good one because let me tell you right now, uh, Joe Biden is the only one to blame if Joe Biden loses against Donald Trump, okay? I want you guys to really internalize that fact. Joe Biden had this in the bag. Donald Trump is so unbelievably unpopular. Donald Trump has the biggest audience of people who just absolutely hate him, okay? And for very good reason. Winning against Donald Trump should be a cakewalk at this point, okay? The amount of anti-Trump people is massive. It way outnumbers the Trump cult, okay? And the Trump cult might be very loud, but Trump really offended a lot of people's basic sensibilities and their understanding of the flow of American politics, okay? And somehow, Joe Biden has managed to fumble that lead. And there's a couple of ways in which he's done that, but... One of the most significant is how badly he has fumbled his own response to the ongoing ethnic cleansing that Israel is perpetrating in Gaza. Joe Biden has essentially failed on every single front and his entire administration has failed. Not just, they haven't just failed, they've failed spectacularly. There are clips after clips after clips cycling all over the internet on every platform, not just one social media, of, of, uh, of, of journalists asking specific questions about the horrific and nightmarish scenes that are coming out of Gaza. And the only thing that the White House press secretary has to say is, we unequivocally support Israel's right to self-defense. Um, next question. We unequivocally support Israel's right to self-defense. Uh, next question. And they will be like, what about the flower massacre? What about the bombing of a hospital? What about this, the, the death of a bunch of children in a clearly preventable incident? Uh, we, we, uh, 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 we clearly, we, we, uh, we unequivocally support Israel's right to, uh, to defend itself. Next question. Pathetic. Okay. There is just, they are asleep at the wheel and it is severely, severely hurting their ability to motivate their own voters. A lot of people, and I've seen this a lot on the internet. I've seen a lot of liberals, a lot of Joe Biden fans who are basically angry at lefties, which is really weird. They're angry at lefties. They're angry at, uh, at, at liberals. They're angry at the average American for not doing enough to hype up Joe Biden right now. And to me, that is an absurd position to take. Joe Biden is the fucking president of the United States. He has the world's most powerful political machine behind him currently. The currently single most powerful person on, plan on the planet Earth is Joe Biden and his Democratic Party. And somehow it's the fault of the average American voter and or the 
the left minority? It's an absurd claim to make, especially when we know that Democrat voters just simply outnumber Republican voters. We know if every Democrat voter and every Republican voter in the country voted, the Democrats would win the popular vote every single time. They would likely win the electoral college vote every single time by like a huge margin. And so somehow when, when Joe Biden drops the ball so hard that his own voters are having second thoughts and don't feel the, the, the emotional urge to get super involved in politics on his behalf, it's somehow their fault for not it's, 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 it, is the lit, it is the mentality that the beatings will continue until morale improves. It is such a terrible uh, uh, inability to take responsibility, and I hate it. So I wanted to say this, and I wanted to spend a little time just talking about this before we jump into it, because this is what I've been seeing. And I wanted to stress the need for Biden to have a strong, motivating message of actually taking responsibility for him and his party's current position of power. Uh, we'll see if he does that. We'll see if we've, we'll see if he does that. It's, uh, it's wild. Um, yeah. I, I have, I've actually had numerous people. I did a video. Um, I did a vid, not to, not to distract further before we jump into this, but I did a video talking about one of my personal failings with regard to critiquing Biden. People got very mad at me about that video. And when I talked about this subject on social media, I was flooded with uh, liberals who were basically trying to tell me that it's, uh, that it's everyone's fault except for Biden if he, if he starts losing the election. And you can tell that the Democratic Party and its operatives are nervous that that's the case. Otherwise, why would they be breaking out all of the excuses this early? They know there's a real risk that he loses. And instead of saying, okay, shit, we need to analyze and restructure our approach, uh, they go, uh, you guys, they start setting up the gaslighting in advance. Oh, it's going to be your fault. It's going to be the fault of the left who was just too critical. They were so mean to the president of the United States. They were so, they were so rude and critical and they just couldn't put it aside. They, they're going to say, oh, it was these, these no voters who realistically are people who felt completely, who already voted for Joe Biden in the past, but who felt completely unlistened to, completely demotivated, who've lost touch with politics and don't care to listen to smug assholes talking down to them. Uh, they're going to scream that it's people who have too much principles when the, when the Democratic Party, and this is fucking important, the Democratic Party urges people constantly, Joe Biden himself has told people, vote your conscience. And then when people take that message that the Democratic Party puts out and go, well, my conscience says I can't support somebody who's refusing to acknowledge a ongoing mass killing event of innocent people, of civilians, a horrific genocidal push to, to clear all of this, all of the people out of, uh, out of the Gaza, out of Gaza Strip. And then they go, what the fuck is wrong with you? The Democrat, what the fuck is wrong with you? How dare you vote your conscience in that way? When we said vote your conscience, we meant vote for us. Pathetic. It's pathetic. And another thing that happens is that people will then go, well, what, you think that Trump is better? No, obviously not. In fact, I think Trump is a goddamn disaster. And I think that Trump would be a bigger disaster than Joe Biden, for sure. But that doesn't change the fact that Joe Biden has blown his own goddamn lead, okay? Joe Biden is the one who is losing the election for Joe Biden right now. So with all that said, shall we jump into the State of the Union? Are we ready? Because I'm ready. Let's do it. Let's jump in.
I almost started playing the wrong video. Here we go. Okay, first notes, not gonna lie, Kamala's looking really good now. Wow, that's a sharp look for Kamala. He, wow. Good evening. Good evening. If I were smart, I'd go home now. <laughs> this is. <laughs> okay. Good start. Good start. Good start. I'm sorry, but uh, this is this is this is not a substance critique. But Joe Biden is the best when he's like a when he's perceived as like a jovial grandpa that you can rely on. That's his literally historically. That's his strongest. Uh, his his strongest mode. I know that lately they've been leaning on the dark Brandon thing. Talk about killing a meme. The dark Brandon thing only worked as an ironic joke. And the joke was that he was going to go sicko mode and he was going to put Trump in jail or something. And he didn't do any of that. Obviously, he didn't even do anything even close. So they failed on the, the dark Brandon front. They could have probably done something with that. But um, they started leaning into the dark Brandon memes right as right as the, the uh, ethnic cleansing in Gaza began. And that's a really bad look when you're like, yeah, dark Brandon. And by dark, I mean, you know, that I look the other way at genocide. Y yeah. So you know what? I'll give him this strong start. By the way, thank you very, very much for the raid. President Sunday. Come on in, squids. Come get comfortable. We are currently uh, angrily and also comedically reviewing the State of the Union. Uh, by President Joe Biden. And then we're going to have a very interesting conversation that's right up your alley after this. We're going to be talking about democracy. And we're going to be watching a really good video on democracy. So come in, get comfortable. Thank you very, very much for the raid. And welcome. We would love to have you. Let's continue. Let's continue. Speaker, Madam Vice President, members of Congress, my fellow Americans, in January 1941, Franklin Roosevelt came to this chamber to speak to the nation, and he said, I address you at a moment unprecedented in the history of the Union. Hitler was on the march. War was raging in Europe. President Roosevelt's purpose was to wake up Congress and alert the American people that this was no ordinary time. Freedom and democracy were under assault in the world. Tonight, I come to this same chamber to address the nation. Now, it's we who face an unprecedented moment in the history of the Union. And yes, my purpose tonight is to wake up the Congress and alert the American people that this is no ordinary moment either. Not since President Lincoln and the Civil War have freedom and democracy been under assault at home as they are today. What makes our moment rare is the freedom and democracy are under attack at both at home and overseas at the very same time. <clears throat> Overseas, Putin of Russia is on the march, invading Ukraine and sowing chaos throughout Europe and beyond. Interesting angle. If anybody in this room thinks Putin will stop at Ukraine, I assure you he will not. Yeah, people are saying Slurpee Joe. I noticed that as well. I really hope he fixes that up. That is, well, it's not a, it's not a strong look. Let's continue. <laughs> But Ukraine, Ukraine can stop Putin. Ukraine can stop Putin if we stand with Ukraine and provide the weapons that needs to defend itself. That is all. That is all Ukraine is asking. 
They're not asking for American soldiers. In fact, there are no American soldiers at war in Ukraine, and I'm determined to keep it that way. But now, good to bring that up. Assistance to Ukraine is being blocked by those who want to walk away from our world leadership. It wasn't long ago when a Republican president named Ronald Reagan thundered, "Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall." Now. This is the type of shit that I'm talking about, by the way. Drawing a comparison between himself and Ronald Reagan, saying, yeah, I'm here, I'm Ronald Reagan now, is like, that is the thing, that, that does not, that is not going to sell well to the people that he needs to convince to vote for him right now. And um, also, now, I, I, I think overall, the, uh, the, the sort of framing of, of Ukraine as a responsibility is probably the right move for him. Uh, there are obviously portions of the left that are going to see that as confirmation of what uh, they worried about, that, that uh, you know, that Ukraine is, is a cynically, is a cynical tool in uh, the sort of uh, vying for American control of the world. Which is true. It is. Everything that America does is a cynical ploy to increase its power. That just, that's how states work. Um, but to be honest, that portion of the left is not exactly who he needs to reach right now. And uh, if he's trying to beat Donald Trump, uh, making this a, this, making this a, a issue of this type is probably a good move. Uh, for communicating to his base that he's he's committed on this particular issue. That said, I don't think that comparisons to Ronald Reagan are a good call. And honestly, it's kind of telling, isn't it? Um, like Ronald Reagan, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, the 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 Ronald Reagan uh, 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 privatiz march of privatization and and uh, and I don't know scything the ca carving out of the uh of of the american working class is one of the things that people have been most worried that biden will represent that biden will basically sort of be a mouthpiece to vaguely state that he supports americans while ultimately putting policies into place that will r remove power uh, uh from the working class of america and i don't know um kind of seems like a bad move to compare yourself to Reagan in that regard. Reagan is not well liked by Democrats. Uh, there is a per very particular type of heavily invested neoliberal that really thinks Reagan was a stand-up guy, but that is not a popular position. That is a niche. Let's continue. Now my predecessor, a former Republican president, tells Putin, quote, do whatever the hell you want. That's a quote. A former president actually said that bowing down. Um, Delance says he's not comparing himself to Ronald Reagan. I already seen the speech. She stopped halfway through the Reagan Trump sentence. Yes, he is comparing Trump to Reagan, but he's also comparing himself to Reagan because he says he's saying, oh, yeah, look at where Republicans are. Me, I'm doing what Reagan would have done. Donald Trump, look at where he is. It is implicitly both, he is obviously comparing Donald Trump to Reagan, but he's also comparing himself to Reagan. Anyway, let's continue. I'm a Russian leader. I think it's outrageous, it's dangerous, and it's unacceptable. <laughs> America is a founding member of NATO. The military alliance of democratic nations created after World War II prevent, to prevent war and keep the peace. And today, we've made NATO stronger than ever. We welcomed Finland to the alliance last year. And just this morning, Sweden officially joined, and their minister is here tonight. We're going to stand up. 
Welcome. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And they know how to fight. Mr. Prime Minister, welcome to NATO, the strongest military alliance the world has ever seen. I say this to Congress. We have to stand up to Putin. Send me a bipartisan national security bill. History is literally watching. History is watching. If the United States walks away, it will put Ukraine at risk. Europe is at risk. The free world will be at risk, emboldening others to do what they wish to do us harm. My message to President Putin, who I've known for a long time, is simple. We will not walk away. We will not bow down. I will not bow down. In a literal sense, history is watching. History is watching. Just like history watched three years ago on January 6th, when insurrectionists stormed this very capital and placed the dagger to the throat of American democracy. Many of you are here on that darkest of days. We all saw with our own eyes the insurrectionists were not patriots. They'd come to stop the peaceful transfer of power, to overturn the will of the people. January 6th lies about the 2020 election and the plots to steal the election posed a great, gravest threat to U.S. democracy since the Civil War. But they failed. America stood. America stood strong, and democracy prevailed. We must be honest. The threat to democracy must be defended. My predecessor and some of you here seek to bury the truth about January 6th. I will not do that. This is the moment to speak the truth and to bury the lies. Here's the simple truth. You can't love your country only when you win. As I've done ever since being elected to office, I ask all of you, without regard to party, to join together and defend democracy. Remember your oath of office is defending against all threats, foreign and domestic. Respect. Respect free and fair elections. Restore trust in our institutions. And make clear political violence has absolutely no place, no place in America, zero place. Again, it's not, it's not hyperbole to suggest. Okay, so there's a couple things I'm going to talk about here. First off, um, overall, probably a pretty good statement to make, um, overall. And the reason I will say that is uh, explicitly using the, the, pretty much the biggest central platform you're going to get uh, the State of the Union has a lot of eyes on it. A lot of people talk about it. We're talking about it right now, obviously. Um, and a lot of people pay attention to it. Using that to explicitly um, target the the fact that th that there was so much falsehood involved in the, the narrative that has been presented around January 6th. And also to explicitly denounce it. And also to explicitly call out the... Uh, the, the previous president's involvement in that particular event is a good move. Unfortunately, it does ring a little hollow um, given the fact that um, if this is true, if it is, if January 6th represented an ultimate threat to democracy, why have the Democrats been so lackadaisical in their approach towards January 6th? Why have they, um, why have they treated Donald Trump with comparatively such kitty gloves if it's true and i tend to believe that it is a pretty the january 6th was a pretty obvious 
a state statement of intent. If the ex the execution was obviously quite embarrassing, um, we've talked about all that. We've watched it all in the past. But the statement of intent uh, in January sixth and the very clear, uh, not just direct endorsement by Donald Trump, but the mo but the the involvement of basically all of Donald Trump's inner circle, all of Donald Trump's political allies were directly involved in the in the creation of an organization of of January 6th in some way or another. Like we talked about uh, uh, how uh, uh, t Turning Points USA had buses and buses of people that they deliberately brought to the camp to to the capital knowing that there was a good chance it was going to pop off that day they were talking about it they were planning it they were giving away bus tickets to people in affiliated with their organization to get as many goddamn bodies there as possible and their messaging was everything everything just below the line of saying you guys got to pop off hard you guys got to go wreck some shit they were agitating like crazy okay and if that's true um the 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 political campaign against the disqualification of Donald Trump should be so much stronger. This should be something the Democrats are hitting every single day. They should be pulling out all the stops, and they're not. Now, on the contrary, most Americans are not going to think about that particular aspect. But they could be. If Joe Biden used his pulpit if the Democratic Party used their messaging systems to continually focus on this, the political energy against Donald Trump as some, as a, a anti-democratic freak would be more present. But people don't care because they haven't heard it. They've heard CNN talking heads loosely and vaguely talking about January 6th. They've heard vague references from uh, Joe Biden from time to time, but mostly they've heard silence from Joe Biden. Joe Biden is a, he doesn't make a whole lot of public appearances, nor do his representatives. Kamala Harris has been quiet as a mouse for the last few years. They could have had Kamala out there fucking pushing this shit everywhere, every day, if it's truly the greatest threat to democracy as they say it is which I do think it's a big threat, maybe not the greatest. Now, of course, there's something a bit strange um, that, that Joe Biden said at the end of this, which of course is there is zero room for political violence in America. And it, that's, that's where my job as a lefty comes in, to tell you guys how fucking bullshit that statement really is. Um, political violence is a daily experience for Americans, okay? Political violence is what the state does. That is what Joe Biden does. You guys remember Joe Biden saying, you know, don't shoot him in the face, shoot him in the leg. You remember that speech, that infamous speech that he gave in response to uh, the the uh, BLM protests? Um, political violence, the idea that you can make a statement from the seat of the president, political violence has no place in America when political violence is, oh, and, and it's especially absurd to talk about when Joe Biden just capitulated with, with Greg Abbott. He capitulated when Greg Abbott was, was making a push to take the, the National Guard in, in Texas to deliberately, uh, put razor wire in the way of innocent people, okay? In the way of unarmed, everyday people who are trying to cross the border. Whether or not you feel that, that, uh, that you know, it's illegal or bad or whatever to cross the border, which, of course, uh, the asylum process requires that you declare a need for asylum on American soil, which kind of means that if you want to declare asylum, you kind of got to get across there first because you can't exactly get in any other way. Kind of an interesting setup. Almost seems like that situation is designed to do as much violence as possible to people trying to save their, their, their own and their families' lives. 
and that Joe Biden just capitulated to that guy and is now offering, freely offering the Republicans, we want to come to a deal on immigration. There's a flood of people pouring across the border, giving in to, not, to their rhetoric, giving in to their fear mongering so that they can do political violence. This idea that Joe Biden is against political vi violence is fucking bullshit. And it needs to be called for what it is, a load of crock. Joe Biden uses political violence perpetually. What do you think it is when you, when you give billions of dollars to your ally so that they can mass slaughter civilians? What do you think that is? That is political violence. What do you think it is when you maintain a drug war, which Joe Biden is still doing, maintain a drug war that puts people in fucking prison for life, that gets people beaten, killed, uh, stripped down, blasted with chemicals, shoved into iron uh, barred cells because of uh, a, a handful of marijuana leaves. That's political violence. That is using violence to assert your political worldview. So his idea, this, this is, it's a load of crock. And it's absurd that he would even say that, especially that he would say that in response to the January 6th situation. All right, let's continue. Let's continue. History is watching. We're watching. Your children and grandchildren will read about this day and what we do. History is watching another assault on freedom. Joining us tonight is Latoya Beasley, a social worker from Birmingham, Alabama. Fourteen months ago, 14 months ago, she and her husband welcomed a baby girl thanks to the miracle of IVF. She scheduled treatments to have that second child. But the Alabama Supreme Court shut down IVF treatments across the state, unleashed by a Supreme Court decision overturning Roe v. Wade. She was told her dream would have to wait. What her family had got through should never have happened. Unless Congress acts, it could happen again. So tonight, let's stand up for families like hers. To my friends across the aisle, don't keep this waiting any longer. <laughs> Guarantee the right to ABS. Guarantee it nationwide. Like most Americans, I believe Roe we Wade got it right. I thank Vice President Harris for being an incredible leader, defending reproductive freedom, and so much more. Thank you. My predecessor. They, yeah, they had decades to make Roe v. Wade law. Uh, <laughs> this is this is what we call kicking the can. This is Joe Biden, after being in power for four years and making no progress to meaningfully protect abortion, kicking the can to a Congress that he doesn't have full control of. It is uh, the, uh, the, the in vitro fertilization, the IVF issue, is a serious issue. For those who don't know what he's referring to, um, abortion bans in Alabama have made it functionally impossible to legally... Uh, uh, do in vitro fertilization because in the process of in vitro fertilization, multiple eggs will be fertilized and uh, the one that is basically the, he the, the healthiest one will be implanted and the rest will be discarded. Um, and that is now illegal under Alabama abortion law. Absurdly, of course. Um, it's a good thing for him to bring up, but it rings very hollow. And this is one of the issues, by the way. Uh, I focused in the very beginning of my of this conversation on the uh, Gaza issue. Um, but abortion is an issue where the Democratic Party's lack of fervor, the Democratic Party la l like lack of a sense of urgency has completely uh, shut off the minds of some of their electorate. It is one of the most important issues to American voters, and they've been zipped right up about it. 
They've done basically nothing except for defer to Congress. That's it. Oh, we want Congress to make it law. We want Congress to make it law. And they've done basically nothing except continually say that. They've exerted no pressure. They haven't used the office of the president in any way. They've, been, they've, they've not truly fought for this. And people have seen that. And it, they've turned off. They go, oh, the Republicans just took away my right to abortion. Why should I care about any of this? You told me I was going to be safe if if Donald Trump wasn't elected. I voted for you and you didn't protect me. Why should I trust anything that you have to say? And this is a real thing that Joe Biden has to deal with. And going up to the State of the Union and just doing the same thing. Oh, yeah, uh, Congress needs to do it. Take a look at this real quick. Just take a look at this real quick. We're going to watch just right back here, okay? Look at how many, look at how this room is split. They stand up. The Dems all stand up. The Republicans don't. You are not going to get convince the Republicans uh, that they can vote their conscience in favor of abortion because they don't believe that you have a right to abortion. You have to have a more strong-armed approach to this uh, as the President of the United States. You have to be willing to fight tooth and nail to play a little fucking dirty. You can't defer to Republicans. And that's what they're doing. They're standing up and going, Republicans, you got to do the right thing. Make them do the right thing or come up with another path. You see, you see, you know, no, just look at the differences between Donald Trump and Joe Biden's approach. Donald Trump, anytime that bitch wanted something, he would, if he couldn't get it through telling people to vote the way that he wanted, he would, he would aggressively utilize executive orders like crazy. Donald Trump didn't give a shit if his executive orders got overturned. He put them in. He made it a culture issue. In fact, arguably, if it got overturned, that's even better for him because then it created a culture war issue. He created a culture war issue by uh, banning trans people from the military, by doing a uh, by attempting to imp to put in a Muslim ban, both of which got overturned, and it didn't matter because his cult made it a culture war issue. And I'm not saying that Biden needs to do the exact same thing, but that's who he's contending with. He's contending with a guy who plays dirty. Donald Trump got to stack the Supreme Court with a bunch of deranged anti-abortion Christian nationalist judges, okay? Joe Biden has sat around twiddling his thumbs and saying, Congress, you better fix our rights. And the Congress goes, the Democrats go, we'll do it. And the Republicans go, fuck you. Thank you. My predecessor came to office determined to see Roe v. Wade overturned. He's the reason it was overturned, and he brags about it. Look at the chaos that has resulted. Joining us tonight is Kate Cox, the wife and mother from Dallas. She's become pregnant again and had a fetus of a fatal condition. Her doctor told Kate that her own life and her ability to have children in the future were at risk if she didn't act. Because Texas law banned her ability to act, Kate and her husband had to leave the state to get what she needed. What her family got through should have never happened as well, but it's happening in too many others. There are state laws banning the freedom to choose, criminalizing doctors, forcing survivors of rape and incest to leave their states to get the treatment they need. Many of you in this chamber and my predecessor are promising to pass a national ban on reproductive freedom. My God, what freedom else would you take away? Look. It's a decision to overturn Roe v. Wade. The Supreme Court majority wrote the following, and with all due respect, Justices, women are not without electoral, electoral power. Uh, excuse me, electoral or political power. You're about to realize just how much you get right about. Oh, he fumbled at the worst time. Oof. That is such a terrible point to fumble. He was winding up for a strong statement and he goofed. He was that close. And now it just comes off as bad. Clearly.
clearly. Those bragging about overturning Roe v. Wade have no clue about the power of women. But they found out when reproductive freedom was on the ballot, we won in 2022 and 2020, and we'll win again in 2024. <laughs> If you, if you, the American people, send me a Congress that supports the right to choose, I promise you, I'll restore Roe v. Wade as the law of the land again. No, dude, you got to go further than Roe v. Wade. You have to go significantly further than Roe v. Wade. Roe v. Wade was was a the problem with Roe v. Wade, Wade is that it was purely on uh, that it was purely on privacy. It wasn't actually the right reproductive freedom. It was a privacy issue, and by by sort of second hand as a side effect, that allowed for abortions to be legal because you have a privacy right. What they need to do is th this is such an absurd and this is a perfect example. This is a perfect example of where the Democrats just suck completely and where Joe Biden personally just sucks completely. He's like, I believe that we need to, if we get full control of Congress, I'll get you a milk toast version of what you used to have. What a stupid position. Who is motivated by this? You know, there's that joke that everybody makes at Kamala's expense where it's like, I believe that we should give a $10,000 tax break to people making between twenty-five dollars and $35,000 in their small business in a qualified neighborhood in the suburbs of major American cities. You know that fucking joke? The one where it's just like 900 qualifications on a thing and you go, uh, 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 do I even qualify? That's what this shit comes off as. When Joe Biden says, y if you give me the power that I definitely didn't already have, I'll give you a basically what you had before, kind of. It, they need to, they should, he should have said, if I get a Congress that is willing to think rationally about American freedom, Women deserve to be free. This is America. We live about, for liberty and freedom. And if you get me a rational Congress, if you vote for people who support freedom for women, I will make sure that women have reproductive freedom in this country. I will sign that law. And it'll be better than Roe v. Wade. That's what he should be saying. But you want to know why he doesn't? Because there's a part of his brain that still wants to appease the Republicans. The Republicans who did this. The Republicans who are, he just said, were cheering about it. The Democrats are so fucking lost. Oh, God, it's so bad. It's so bad. <laughs> Folks, America cannot go back. I'm here to, tonight to show what I believe is the way forward, because I know how far we come. What a thing to follow up what he just said. America can't go back. Literally the line after he promises that he'll bring America back to Roe v. Wade. Holy God. What a terrible line to follow up with. Who wrote this speech? Oh my God, he needs to fire his speechwriter. Four years ago next week, before I came to office, the country was hit by the worst pandemic and the worst economic crisis in a century. Remember the fear? Record losses? Remember the spikes in crime and the murder rate? Raging virus that took more than one million American lives? of loved ones, millions left behind, a mental health crisis of isolation and loneliness. A president, my predecessor, failed the most basic presidential duty that he owes to American people, the duty to care. I think that's unforgivable. I came to office determined to get us through one of the toughest periods in the nation's history. We have. It doesn't make new, but in a th news in a thousand cities and towns, the American people are writing the greatest comeback story never told. Yeah. 
So let's tell the story here. Tell it here and now. America's comeback is building the future of American possibilities, building an economy from the middle out and the bottom up, not the top down, investing in all America, in all Americans, to make every sure everyone has a fair shot, and we leave no one, no one behind. The pandemic no longer controls our lives. The vaccines that saved us from COVID are now being used to beat cancer, turning setback into comeback. That's what America does. That's what America does. <clears throat> Folks. Hey, he really won over those. Hey, look at that. He really won over those Republicans with uh, that comparison to Reagan. He really won over that Republican, the, those Republicans by saying, uh, yeah, you know, vote your conscience, guys, and uh, make sure, you know, on all, if you vote your conscience, I'll bring Roe v. Wade back, the thing that you guys destroyed. It's working. Oh, it's working. He's got all those Republicans. All of them. Look at them. <clears throat> Folks. My inherited economy is on the brink. Now our economy is literally the envy of the world. 15 million new jobs in just three years. A record. A record. <laughs> Unemployment at 50-year lows. A record 16 million Americans are starting small businesses, and each one is a literal act of hope with historic job growth and small business growth for black and Hispanics and Asian Americans, 800,000 new manufacturing jobs. Act of hope. With historic job growth and small business growth for black and Hispanics and Asian Americans. Eight hundred thousand new manufacturing jobs in America and counting. Where is it written we can't be the manufacturing capital of the world? We are, we will. More people have health insurance today. More people have health insurance today than ever before. The racial wealth gap is as small as it's been in 20 years. Wages keep going up, inflation keeps coming down. Inflation has dropped from 9% to 3%, the lowest in the world, and tending lower. The landing is and will be soft. And now, instead of importing, importing foreign products and exporting American jobs, we're exporting American products and creating American jobs. Right here in America, where they belong. And it takes time, but the American people are beginning to feel it. Consumer studies show consumer confidence is soaring. Buy America has been the law of the land since the 1930s. Pass it in. Yeah, I don't know what he's talking about with health care. I don't feel like the health care situation has gotten better at all in America. Um, uh, as, as people in chat have brought up, uh, tons and tons of people have been kicked off of Medicaid. And additionally... Um, like, oh God, there's been basically no progress made to, Im to improve healthcare in America in any real way in the entire time he's been in office. Remember that Joe Biden, people were looking at Joe Biden because he was the vice president when Obama did Obamacare. Now, Obamacare made Republicans very angry, but Obamacare was considered fairly popular um, with a lot of people, especially because Obamacare brought reforms that got rid of pre-existing conditions, eliminated that as a legal concept whatsoever, which is a really big deal here in America. And he did nothing like that. So I don't know. I don't know what he's talking about, trying to boast about health care. Um, I think it's good that he uh, that he, you know, basically said that Trump dropped the ball on on covid. Uh, it's a strong argument for him, although I also think that he dropped the ball on COVID as well. Um, uh, Biden not only, I mean, keep in mind that one of people's earliest memories of Joe Biden is the uh, lying about how much money they were going to get from the pandemic, uh, the pandemic stimulus. That was one of the first controversies. That's fresh in a lot of people's minds. So when they hear him say that, you know, oh, Trump fucked up. 
uh, they he fucked up COVID, but I didn't. And then they go, well, Trump didn't lie about how much money he was going to give me, and you did. A lot of people, that's like a thing that a lot of people bring up. So, yeah. I don't know. Um, I wouldn't say that Biden dropped the ball on COVID more than Trump did. Trump literally, like, I think that Trump, like, Trump has blood on his hands in a very real way. Uh, Joe Biden didn't do a good job, but at least they kind of took it seriously to some degree. There was, you know, uh, a promotion of, of vaccines and promotion of masking, and they stopped too early, and they didn't, uh, they ultimately caved to the demands of corporate America. But Donald Trump was was using the pulpit of the White House to actively, um, to actively, uh, you know, promote... Um, uh, uh, anti-masking to, to, to downplay, uh, 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 the need to get vaccinated. He was constantly photographed, deliberately not wearing masks. He talked about, uh, sunlight therapy. There was the actions of Donald Trump likely got hundreds of thousands of people killed a number, which we can never fully know because it's hard to, to gauge exactly how far uh, uh, you know, his approach to COVID reached, his denialism, his constantly pivoting to try and blame China instead of actually take precautions against the illness, his constant, him and his party's constant opposition to basic safety procedures. It's pretty bad. Um, so, yeah, I think that he's good to hit Trump for that, but I don't know that it was, I don't know that it's going to do that well with his voter base. Let's continue. Administrations, including my predecessor, including some Democrats as well in the past, failed to buy American. Not anymore. On my watch, federal projects that you fund, like helping build American roads, bridges, and highways, will be made with American products and built by American workers. Okay, he's been talking about the Biden infrastructure plans since the beginning of his uh, time in office and nobody's really seen it. Nobody can feel that thing. And what everybody does remember is all of the infrastructure bills that failed and that they dropped. So uh, once again, I think this is a pretty fucking weak uh, point that a lot of people, even, li even like milquetoast Dems are not gonna find this particularly motivating. Uh, first of all, infrastructure is a pretty difficult thing to sell to people because most people don't actually feel the results of improved infrastructure if you're not showing it to them. The reason why FDR was able to run on infrastructure is because everybody could feel that. They were not they were churning out uh, uh, every type of coverage you possibly could of every change they made. National parks and highways and sewer systems and new parks and all this stuff was constantly being pushed. They were talking about it constantly. That has not happened for Biden. When was the last time you saw like the Democratic Party celebrating some major uh, infrastructure win? They haven't. And most people haven't felt it either. And there's not like they, he can, it's not like he did some giant product like a uh, project like the, uh, you know, the American highway system. There's nothing like that. So he's just kind of deferring to a vague sense. And I don't know if you know this, but Americans across the political board, they kind of hate American infrastructure. In fact, the reputation of American infrastructure is that it's garbage. Everybody complains about the potholes in their road, the lack of public transit, the, the lack of safety, how everything's fucking falling apart. All the bridges are getting shut down constantly. Uh, roads are shut down constantly. Americans hate infrastructure. So him deferring and saying, I did that is a bad move because he hasn't set it up. He hasn't set himself up to make that play. Now, if he had a hundred different things that he could list that he did, and they had also been churning out, you know, photographs and news stories and interviews about that stuff, maybe that would sell, but this just doesn't. It just doesn't. Creating good paying American jobs. Oh, Jesus, what's happening to the audience? And thanks to our Chips and Science Act, the United States is investing more in research and development than ever before. During the pandemic, a shortage of semiconductors, chips, that drove up the price of everything from cell phones to automobiles. And by the way, we invented those chips right here in America. Well, instead of having to import them, 
instead of we private companies are now investing billions of dollars to build new chip factories here in America, creating tens of thousands of jobs. Many of those jobs paying $100,000 a year and don't require a college degree. <laughs> In fact, okay, look, you want to see a Giga Chad move? Look at this guy over here on his cell phone. Front row, okay? Front fucking row of the of the state of the union on his goddamn telephone. That that takes some goddamn balls, okay? That's a fucking Invited to the Presidential State of the Union, sitting in the front row, don't care. In fact, my policies have attracted $650 billion in private sector investment, in clean energy, advanced manufacturing, creating tens of thousands of jobs here in America. Thanks. My jobs have created hundreds of chips. Chippy chippy chips. Cheesy chips. Spicy chips. Chili lime. Salty. Salt and vinegar. Sour cream and onion. So many chips. More chips than you can imagine. And thanks to our bipartisan infrastructure law, 46,000 new projects have announced all across your communities. And by the way, I noticed some of you have strongly voted. <laughs> what? This cameraman? Who did this? Why did they fire the camera directly into the face of Pete Buttigieg? He's, li he's literally doing the stare. <laughs> oh my God. against it or they're cheering on that money coming in. I like it. I'm with you. I'm with you. And if any of you don't want that money in your district, just let me know. <laughs> Modernize our roads and bridges, ports and airports, public transit systems. Removing po poisonous lead pipes so every child can drink clean water without risk of brain damage. <laughs> providing affordable, affordable high-speed internet for every American, no matter where you live, urban, suburban, or rural communities, in red states and blue states. Record investments in tribal communities because of my investment in family farms. <laughs> because of my investment in family farms led by my sector of agriculture knows more about this than anybody I know. We're better able to stay in the family for the, those farms for the, and their children and grandchildren won't have to leave. Oh, dude. Holy shit. This is a mess. Oh, my. Oh, my God. That was a mess. What, what was he trying to say there? Leave home to make a living. They need to have the they need to have the the uh, the guy who has the uh, the amphetamine injection gun. They need to have him go whoop so he gets whoa and wakes up. You know, maybe there's a guy under the podium with like a little a little gun that goes and it's like a stim. You know, it's like a stim pack from a video game. It's transformative. The great comeback story is Belvedere, Illinois home to an auto plant for nearly 60 years. Before I came to office, the plant was on its way to shutting down. Thousands of workers feared for their livelihoods. Hope was fading. Then I was elected to office, and we raised the Belvedere repeatedly with auto companies, knowing unions would make all the difference. The UAW worked like hell to keep the plant open and get these jobs back, and together we succeeded. Instead of auto factories shutting down, Auto factories reopening, the new state-of-the-art battery factories being built to power those cars there at the same. <laughs> Folks, 
The folks at Belvedere, I say, instead of your town being left behind, your community is moving forward again. Because instead of watching auto job, jobs of the future go overseas, 4,000 union jobs with higher wages are building the future in Belvedere right here in America. Well, everyone, you know what you can do right here in America right now? If you're enjoying this coverage, if you're laughing and having a good time, if you're getting angry with me and enjoying my passionate speech that's like 20 times more energetic than the President of the United States, make sure that you press subscribe down below and the like button. Whether you're watching live or are one of our glorious citizens in the future video watching, press that button right now. Subscribe and like those buttons. There's actually two of them. That's how free and liberty we are. We're so amazing and, and uh, uh, you can be an American citizen on a private family farm and a low earth rider. Uh, 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 anyways. Here tonight. Is UAW President Sean Fain, a great friend and a great labor leader. Sean, where are you? Stand up. And and Dawn. And Dawn Sim. This is a pretty good move. I, I don't think I have anything negative to say about this. Um, one of the things that was very popularly liked among his own voter base was his willingness to actually show up at a major strike um, and uh, highlighting the guy who was sort of the, the leadership face of that at your State of the Union is a good move. Uh, that's gonna play well with Democrats. It's gonna piss off Republicans, but literally, who cares? The Republicans who are gonna get mad about that are the biggest, are literally just corporate simps and literal billionaires themselves. So doesn't really matter. You're winning numbers by shouting out union leaders. Uh, unions have lots of membership. They tend to be, you know, members of unions tend to be very in tune with the issues of unions. Playing to the strength of unions is a good play for Biden. Just a good play. I think this is one of the best moves that he's made so far. A third generation worker, UAW worker at Belvedere. Sean, I was proud to be the first president to stand on the picket line. And today, Dawn has a good job in her hometown, providing stability for her family and pride and dignity as well. Showing once again, Wall Street didn't build America. They're not bad guys. They didn't build it, though. The middle class built the country, and unions built the middle class. I say to the American people, when America gets knocked down, we get back up. We keep going. That's America. That's you, the American people. It's because of you America's coming back. It's because of you our future is brighter. It's because of you that tonight we can proudly say the state of our union is strong and getting stronger. Tonight, I want to talk about the future. I'm cringing. I am cringing. That is... Look, I'm not saying Republicans invented the term four more years, given that, I mean, it's been forever that presidential terms are four years long. But in recent memory, the four more years thing is a Republican pro-Trump chant. That is where it was. This is literally the liberals doing like a clap back, snap, snap, like, oh, we didn't. That's right. We're saying four more years now. Oh, yeah. Oh, God, it's fucking cringe. Oh, it's so goddamn cringe. Future of possibilities that we can build together. 
a future where the days of trickle-down economics are over and the wealthy and the biggest corporations no longer get the, all the tax breaks. And by the way, I understand corporations. I come from a state that has more corporations invested than every one of your states in the state of the United States combined. And I've represented it for 36 years. I'm not anti-corporation, but I grew up. Horrible, horrible thing to say. Just terrible thing to say right here. He doesn't, there is no need to go out of the, I mean, of course, I believe this is wh where he's showing what he actually does believe, that he does support corporations. I don't know if you know this, but corporations are not fucking popular in America. They're not popular with anyone other than literal corporate, like direct corporate employees, okay? Even right-wingers don't, pr they pretend they don't like corporations, okay? Even though they do a lot to basically do it all the time, the that is like the most anti-populist -popul thing you could possibly do right now. The the way to to like damage your appeal with the most people possible is to say, you know, I'm from the place that has the most corporations ever. Delaware, a place notorious for, for helping corporations uh, uh, get exactly what they want. A place that's notorious for being ruled by corporations than saying, I'm not against corporations. Why? Just don't say anything. Again, the ball dropping with Joe Biden is just constant. This guy is fumbling constantly. Terrible. We live in the Amazon era. We live in the post-Bernie era. You are not going to win anyone over by saying you like corporations. Well, you might win corporations over. But that's going to hurt your electoral chances. Because as it turns out, big surprise, but corporations don't actually vote. When you're going into an election, you need to be appealing to the people that vote. Oh my God, whatever, let's go. In a home where trickle-down economics didn't put much on my dad's kitchen table. That's why I determined to turn things around so middle class does well. When they do well, the poor of a way up and the wealthy still do very well. We all do well. And there's more to do to make sure you're feeling the benefits of all we're doing. Americans pay more for prescription drugs than anywhere in the world. It's wrong, and I'm ending it. For the law that I propose and sign, not one of you Republican buddies worked, voted for it. We finally beat Big Pharma. Instead of paying $400 a month or thereabouts for insulin with diabetes, and it only costs 10 bucks to make, they only get paid 35 a month now and still make healthy profit. And I want to... Now, that's a, that's a good play. That's a good play. Unironically, this is just a good tactic. Obviously, he's over, you know, he's kind of overselling his own thing. And there are much bigger questions uh, about insulin being like, well, now it only costs 35 a month, a, a necessary medication for people to live. And they're boasting about how you only have to pay $35 a month for it, which is quite a lot of goddamn money. But uh, all that aside, you know, well, I'll put aside my leftism my actual care for people who have diabetes and need a, a life-saving medication every month that the government could easily completely subsidize. Put that aside for a minute. This is just a good play. It is true that under the Republicans and the ideal Republican system, they would, they would let that cost go as high as they possibly could. It is true that the Republicans didn't get behind this change, and it is true that it's a big improvement, and it's largely the Dems that did that. So... This is just a good one to do. This is just a very good point, and I think it's going to appeal to a lot of people. It's a tangible, actual thing that people out there have felt and know. Most people know somebody who, uh, in their family who has diabetes. Most people know that those people have a really hard time financially. Most people will be able to hear this and go, actually, that's pretty goddamn good. I can't believe the Republicans voted, voted against that. Pretty good move. Good play. But what to do next? I want to cap the cost of insulin $35 a month for every American in Egypt. Everyone.
for years. People have talked about it, but finally we got it done and gave Medicare the power to negotiate lower prices on prescription drugs, just like the VA is able to do for veterans. That's not just saving seniors' money. It's saving taxpayers' money. We cut the federal deficit by $160 billion. Because Medicare will no longer have to pay those exorbitant prices to Big Pharma. This year, Medicare is negotiating lower prices for some of the costliest drugs on the market to treat everything from heart disease to arthritis. It's now time to go further and give Medicare the power to negotiate lower prices for 500 different drugs over the next decade. They're making a lot of money, guys. And they'll still be extremely profitable. Will not only save lives, it will save taxpayers another $200 billion. <laughs> Starting next year, the same law caps total prescription drug costs for seniors on Medicare at $2,000 a year. Even for expensive cancer drugs, it costs ten, twelve, fifteen thousand dollars. I want to cap prescription drug costs at $2,000 a year for everyone. <laughs> Folks. Weak. Weak. That's weak. And that's a weak follow-up. Amer Americans want... Americans... Th this is that thing again. This is the exact thing I was talking about before with the, uh, yeah, you can get a 10% discount on, on certain tax fees that you have to do if you own a small business in a small qualifying suburb. Yeah, we want to cap your prescription drug costs for seniors at $2,000 a year. The fact that there are cancer drugs that cost $15,000 a year at all is a heinous, disgusting state of affairs. The fact that there are com for-profit companies charging people $15,000 for ne medically necessary, this is the type of thing that, uh, that you do not have to be a politician you do not have to be politically astute to know that these things are wrong, okay? Like, they're in in Canterbury Tales, the 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 old English poem, there is an entire section devoted to decrying the sinful nature of a pharmacist who charges people money for medicine that they need to live, okay? Uh, a chemist, okay? Let's just, you don't exactly have this, you know, this was a stories consumed by peasants in the Middle Ages, okay? You don't exactly have to be, uh, you know, a politically activated person to go, wait, it's kind of messed up that for-profit megacorporations char are charging people $15,000 a year for cancer treatment. There seems like there's something wrong with that. You don't even have to be a universal healthcare person to, to, to recognize that nobody is going to hear, yeah, I want to cap your, medic, your medical prescription costs at $2,000 a year. You know? That's not, a, that's not exactly an exciting thing to get energized about. Especially, especially when there are objectively so many Americans who are in support of a universal health care program. That Americans can talk to people from other countries. That Americans talk to their friends in Canada and their friends in Canada go, yeah, when I, ha when I need a prescription drug, I just go pick it up and I don't got to pay anything. I'm going to get in trouble for saying that, but anyone want to get an Air Force One and fly to Toronto, Berlin, Moscow, I mean, excuse me, and it, well, even Moscow, probably. <laughs> and bring your prescription with you, and I promise you, I'll get it for you for 40% the cost you're paying now. Same company. <laughs> that was a bungle. That was a, that is a really bad bungle. Oh, that is a terrible bungle. Dude! <laughs> Dude! That is like the worst bungle you could have made. He might as well have just, he might as well have just been like, 
Oh my god. Oh my god. Hold on. Here we go. Let me just get this. Here we go. Ready? Joe Biden's like, Joe Biden's like, I am here to assure you that I am not a communist. I would fly you. I would fly you to Moscow to get 40% off on your prescriptions. Now, of course, I ain't no commie. But I know that even in Moscow, you can get a discount. Now, I don't like Russia, and I just did a speech against Russia, and everybody calls me a communist, and I've been desperately trying to say I'm not a communist. Pay no attention to the music in the background. I'll get you your prescription at a discount. That was a, whoo, what a moment. Oh, 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 Earth Rider. Jesus Christ. Same drug, same place. Folks, the Affordable Care Act, the old Obamacare, is, is still a very big deal. <laughs> Over 100 million of you can no longer be denied health insurance because of pre-existing condition. Okay, good point. Except, what did you do? That was Obamacare. It's called Obamacare. Where's Joe Care? There isn't Joe Care. But my predecessor, and many in this chamber, want to take this prescription drug away by repealing the Affordable Care Act. I'm not gonna let that happen. We stopped you 50 times before and we'll stop you again. In fact, I'm not only protecting it, I'm expanding it. The, we, the enacted tax credits of $800 per person per year reduce health care costs. Oh, for wow. Oh, God. This is one of the hardest things to watch here, okay? Ready? Watch this. Watch Kamala's face. Expanding it. The, we the enacted tax credits of $800 per person per year. Do you see Kamala's face there? The look of fear that comes across Kamala's face every time he starts bumbling, every time he starts stumbling. I've watched it happen multiple times now. She just, she, there's like a, there's like a distinct change in her expression. That's like, oh God, please recover. Please recover. Please don't do it again. Reduce healthcare costs for millions of working families. That tax credit expires next year. I want to make that savings permanent. <laughs> to state the obvious, women are more than half our population, but research on women's health has always been underfunded. That's why we're launching the first ever White House initiative on women's health research, led by Jill doing an incredible job as First Lady. To, pa to pass my plan for $12 billion to transfer women's health research and benefit millions of lives all across America. <clears throat> I know the cost of housing is so important to you. If inflation keeps coming down, mortgage rates will come down as well. And the Fed acknowledges that. But I'm not waiting. I want to provide an annual tax credit that will give Americans $400 a month for the next two years as mortgage rates come down to put toward their mortgages when they buy their first home or trade up for a little more space. Just for two years. OK. <laughs> OK. OK. I don't know, where is Joe, has Joe been paying attention to the fact that fucking nobody has a house anymore? Uh, the, the youth vote, and not even just the youth vote, but the slightly younger vote has been dreadfully struggling to get anything but renting in this country. Everyone has to rent. 
What, how is this going to appeal to anybody except for people who are already well established, which are a minority of the vote? Oh, God. Out, out of touch. That's what we call that. That's out of touch. And my administration is also eliminating title insurance on federally backed mortgages. When you refinance your home, you can save $1,000 or more as a consequence. For millions of renters, we're cracking down on big landlords who use antitrust law, using antitrust, who break antitrust laws by price fixing and driving up rents. We've cut red tape so builders can get federally financing, which is already helping build a record 1.7 million new house, housing units nationwide. Now pass. Now pass and build and renovate 2 million affordable homes and bring those rents down. Um, okay, we'll see. I mean, I guess it's good that he's addressing rent, uh, that, that rent is out of control in the United States and that rent is eating up more and more and more of Americans' income. But I'm not going to lie, this is shockingly vague in comparison to uh, what he was just talking about with regard to homeowners. You know, I got this. I'm going to give you $1,000. Uh, I'm going to crack down on uh, big renters who, you know, maybe maybe break antitrust laws. It's not just it's not just antitrust issues. There's, it's not just trust trust busting that's going on in the housing industry. It's the fact that rent is so normalized that wages are so messed up and that rent is generally going up. You don't have to, you don't have to be. Now, it is true that mega conglomerates are a massive problem, but in America, in the modern landscape, you don't have to be a mega conglomerate to use a tool, uh, uh, to use a tool like a Zillow or an apartments.com that is coordinating and influencing uh, uh, rent rates. You can go search that and go, oh, yeah, well, okay, they're raising their rent. I'm going to raise my rent. And people get moved by these algorithms into continually raising the rent. And there's nothing that, um, that renters can do about it because renters don't have any goddamn rights. And that's the thing that he should be talking about. He should be talking about uh, empowering tenants' rights. He should be talking about how we actually address the problems uh, that, that, re that, that landlords, the power that landlords have over renters. But, you know, this is lip service. Obviously, he's not going to go into that, despite the fact that I'll point out most people are renting. Most people who are going to be considering voting for Joe Biden are not homeowners, and they're currently renting. And what they hear is, yeah, maybe I'm going to build new units uh, or something somewhere in America. No idea if it'll affect you. I don't have anything specific to give you to take home. We're gonna we're we're telling you that we're gonna encourage private companies to build more housing. How we're gonna do that, don't know. High progressive says he should have made a Mao Zedong reference. Yes, so just like he did a <laughs> Yes, it just like he did a uh he just did the uh the goddamn uh uh <laughs> Moscow reference a few minutes ago. He should have been like, he should have been like, you can call me Beijing Biden with how I'm going to be going after those apartment owners. Those landlords, you better get scared. <laughs> yeah, Chairman Joe, call me Chairman Joe because I'm going to fucking kill you. <laughs> to remain the strongest economy in the world. We need to have the best education system in the world. And I, like I suspect all of you, want to give a child, every child, a good start by providing access to preschool for three and four years old. You know, I think I pointed out last year, I think I pointed out last year, that children coming from broken homes where there's no books, they're not read to, not spoken to very often, start school, kindergarten, or first grade, hearing having heard a million fewer words spoken. Well, studies show 
The children who go to preschool are nearly 50 percent more likely to finish high school, go on to earn a two- and four-year degree, no matter what their background is. <laughs> I met a year and a half ago with the leaders of the Business Roundtable. They were mad that I — they were angry. I said, well, they were d discussing <laughs> why I wanted to spend money on education. I pointed out to them, as Vice President, I met with over eight — I think it was 182 of those folks. Don't hold me the exact number. And uh, I asked them what they need most, the CEOs. And you've had the same experience on both sides of the aisle. They say a better educated workforce, right? <laughs> so I looked at them. And I say, I come from Delaware. DuPont used to be the eighth largest corporation in the world. And every new inter enterprise they bought, they educated the workforce to that enterprise. But none of you do that anymore. Why are you angry with me? Hell of a, hell of a move to praise DuPont. You know, chemical... Chemical explosions, DuPont. Uh, poisoning the rivers, DuPont. DuPont, you mean one of the most infamous polluters on the planet? One of the most uh, infamous corporations on the entire goddamn planet for corporate workplace disasters and environmental disasters? That's like standing up here and praising fucking BP. Providing you the opportunity for the best educated workforce in the world. And they all looked at me and said, I think you're right. I want to expand high-quality tutoring and summer learning to see that every child learns to read by third grade. I'm also connecting local businesses and high schools so students get hands-on experience and a path to good-paying job whether or not they go to college. And I want to make sure the college is more affordable. <laughs> first and first says, yeah, he's just shouting out his tier four subscribers. Oh, my God. <laughs> Speaking of which, tier three subscriber Discordant Vol, or maybe du DuPont Vol. Thank you very much for supporting the show. Means the world to me. If Joe Biden can do it, I can do it. Let's continue increasing the Pell Grants to working and middle-class families and increase record investments in HBCUs and minority-serving institutions, including Hispanic institutions. And I was told I couldn't universally just change the way in which we did, dealt, dealt with student loans. I fixed two student loan programs that already existed to reduce the burden of student debt for nearly 4 million Americans, including nurses, firefighters. Hold on, I gotta take a minute. There's a LH Fruit in, in YouTube chat. I don't, who are you talking to? Are you, are you sending, are you trying to talk, to, to chat messages at me? Cause I don't know, uh, I don't know why, like why you feel the need to, uh, uh, to, to, to gargle on fucking Grandpa Joe's balls to the point that they're making dents in your chin. But uh, if you're making a, if you're, if you're saying that I'm fucking lying right now, I'm going to have to say maybe you should come up for air is all I'm going to say. Maybe it's time. Maybe it's time for some air. And others in public service. Like Keenan Jones. You're spreading misinformation. It is what it is. What misinformation have I spread right now? Tell me it. Tell me what misinformation I've spread. If you can, like, you know, if you can around the giant wet noodle in your mouth. Public educator from Minnesota, who's here with us tonight. Keenan, where are you? Keenan, thank you. He's educated hundreds of students so they can go to college. Now he's able to help, after debt forgiveness, get his own daughter to college. And folks, look. 
such relief is good for the economy. Oh, you're being too mean to the President of the United States. You said you didn't think he was promising big enough. Oh, this is misinformation, a word that I was, the word that I learned on Twitter from my liberal friends. Shut the fuck up. Shut the fuck up. Absolutely shut the fuck up. Your incessant need to fucking throw yourself in front of a goddamn imaginary bullet for Joe Biden is an embarrassment. If you have, if you think I'm spreading a goddamn uh, piece of misinformation, fucking hit me with it. But I don't think you got it. I think what you don't like is you don't like my opinions. And you're going to come up with any fucking thing that you can invent so that you can go, oh, no, stop being mean to, to my Uncle Joe. Shut up. Shut the fuck up. Shut the fuck up. Joe Biden's job is to appeal to his goddamn voters, of which I am one. Joe Biden has an entire goddamn administration of experts, of people who he claims are supposed to help him goddamn leave, okay? And this guy has barely, barely managed to keep it together, together for four years in the face of what he in his own goddamn words claims is the biggest threat to democracy. And if the best that these motherfuckers can come up with to beat Donald Trump is, uh, yeah, if you're, uh, you know, if you're a first time home buyer, I'll give you a $400 discount spread across your first 15 mortgage payments. Shut the fuck up. LH Fruit said, additionally, you said he wasn't doing anything about renting prices. What did he say he was doing about renting prices? And in fact, I didn't say that. I said that antitrust busting, which is what he claimed he was doing, is or, or trust busting isn't the only thing that matters. And also that it was vague as fuck saying, I'm going to do trust busting means nothing. When you just spent the last 10 minutes saying how you're going to give a $50 discount to every person who considers buying a home, you have to... He, Joe Biden is out of touch. He's not speaking to the people he needs to vote for him. Renters are a lot of people who vote for Democrats, okay? Working people who, who, don't, who, who, who don't know what the hell it's going to help to hear Joe Biden vaguely say that he's going to do trust busting. Oh, what he claimed he was doing? Did you actually look into this or assume that he isn't doing anything? He's trying to sell himself as the president right now. I'm taking his claims and talking about them. Since when is it, is it fucking my job to sit here and be as favorable to Joe Biden as possible when he's trying to sell himself to the American electorate and his promises are vague and boring? What do you have? You're sitting here fucking throwing bullshit from chat like a fucking idiot. And where's your thing? Give me an example then. Oh, if Joe Biden is doing such a good job for renters, show me a link. Give me something. You're sitting here going, you don't, you don't have an example of what he is or isn't doing when you're reacting to his speech. You should be able to have one then. Oh, or maybe you're too busy fucking deep polishing the fucking mushroom of this guy's fucking cock head. Jesus fucking Christ, you people. Pathetic. Let's see it. You Surely you should have an example. I can't fit the entire policy description on chat. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we got him. Full of shit. You didn't have one thing. You're sitting here fucking preaching from chat. And you don't even have one example of, and you, you say I'm spreading misinformation because I disagree with Joe Biden and said his promises were vague. And you don't even have one thing. You don't even have, yo, oh, I couldn't copy paste his entire website description. Fuck off. Fuck off. Holy shit. Fuck off. Holy God. Dude, the Biden bots are so bad. What is wrong with this? What? What? Who? Where do you think you are?
All right, everybody. <sighs> sorry, I'm sorry. I really lost my cool there, everybody. It's just, you know, these Democrat demons. Sometimes I'm just sitting here and the goblins start crawling out and the Hillary Clintons are all over the place and I see Joe Biden and Hillary Clinton crawling all over my chat. And I just, something, something comes over me. And I'm sorry, I apologize, I lost my cool. I shouldn't do that. Fine, how about you type 255 on policy while someone's setting off three more claims? I've been sitting here ranting about uh, and responding to you for like five minutes now, and you couldn't even give me a link to a website that shows that Joe Biden is, that, that, even, gives, that even gives the smell, the sniff, the, the vague essence that, that me saying I don't think Joe Biden is doing enough for renters is somehow misinformation. You rolled up with a big ass claim and you've got fucking nothing. And the only reason I'm calling you out is because I've seen you posting fucking paragraphs in the chat on YouTube for like an hour or two hours now. Paragraph after paragraph saying, oh, you're better than this. You're spreading misinformation. Fucking put up or shut the fuck up. Straight up. The fact that you feel the need to defend Joe Biden to that degree from what I, what, from my, look, I'm not even being a bad faith lefty right now, okay? Half of this speech time I have dedicated to giving Joe Biden, A, I think that was a good message for his audience. If I wanted to review this purely from a lefty angle, all this shit would be a load of crock. This guy is lying to your face. He has no obligation to deliver on any of this. He's trying to sell you so that you'll vote for him so that he can rule over you. That's the real take of all of this. That's the real hot take, okay? So you're getting offended and feel the need to throw yourself on the goddamn floor and lick for Joe Biden. And I'm not even going as hard as I could. I haven't even, I haven't even activated a fraction of my goddamn power. You haven't even seen my abilities yet. I'm just getting started. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Okay, so here's what they say. I don't know. I don't care about Joe Biden. I don't know shit about him. I care about getting this stuff right when claiming people aren't doing anything. Apparently, you need to go back to school on getting things right because your inability to even respond on the fly after accusing me of doing misinformation for stating my opinion in response to Joe Biden's sales pitch for himself, you failed to even, con to even have on hand despite getting all up on your fucking high horse. You didn't even have a single fucking example and you still don't have a single example. Maybe you gotta, maybe it's time to take advantage of that Biden program. That one that, what did he say? He said, if you're a, if, you, if you're a student in a disadvantaged uh, township, uh, you know, below a certain latitude line, you can get a $25 coupon for Wendy's. If you apply to college, maybe you should do that. Maybe you should take advantage of that. Because folks are now able to buy a home start a business, start a family. While we're at it, I want to give public school teachers a raise. <laughs> By the way, you haven't actually illustrated what claim I made that was supposedly wrong. My claim was that I don't think Joe Biden is doing enough to appeal to renters in this goddamn speech. That's what my claim was. You're having a hissy fit because you're a, a weeping liberal bitch who can't handle the idea that maybe Joe Biden 
You've been salty since the beginning of this entire fucking segment. And yeah, I'm taking time out of it to roast because you've been filling the fucking chat for all my goddamn viewers. You've been making them read your fucking putrid blubbering for two goddamn hours. Walls of text whining because I started this out by criticizing Biden. It's very visible to me and everybody else exactly what you're pissed about. You're mad because you have a knee-jerk reaction and a need to feel fucking superior, which is the, you know, that is the calling of the liberal. <sighs> All right. All right. Now we re-rail. Everyone, it's time. We must re-rail. I shall not fear. Fear is the mind killer. Fear. Wait, that's not the right one. That's the, the fear one. Hold on. I shall not derail. Derailing is the mind killer. The little death that brings total obliteration. There we go. We're back on the rails. We are re-railed. We are in our lane. Let's go. The first couple of years, we cut the deficit. Now, let me speak to the question of fundamental fairness for all Americans. I've been delivering real results in fiscally responsible ways. We've already cut the federal deficit. We've already cut the federal deficit over a trillion dollars. I signed the bipartisan deal to cut another trillion dollars in the next decade. It's my goal to cut the federal deficit another $3 trillion by making big corporations very wealthy finally beginning to pay their fair share. Look, I'm a capitalist. If you want a maker can make a million or millions of bucks, that's great. Just pay <laughs> your fair share in tax. He's spitting. He got that Biden flow. Listen to that shit. Look. I'm a capitalist. If you want a maker can make a million or millions of bucks, that's great. You Just want to make him a maker can make a million bucks. Incredible. Joe Biden fucking spitting. Bars. Pay your fair share in taxes. A fair tax code is how we invest things to make this country great. Health care, education, defense, and so much more. But here's the deal. The last administration enacted a $2 trillion tax cut. Overwhelmingly benefit the top in 1%, the very wealthy and the biggest corporation, and exploded the federal deficit. They added more to the national debt than any presidential term in American history. Check the numbers. Folks at home, does anybody really think the tax code is fair? Do you really think the wealthy and big corporations need another $2 trillion tax break? No! I sure don't. I'm going to keep fighting like hell to make it fair. Under my plan, nobody earning less than $400,000 a year will pay additional penny in federal taxes. Nobody, not one penny. And they haven't yet. In fact, the child tax credit I passed during the pandemic cut taxes for millions of working families and cut child poverty in half. Restore that child tax credit. No child should go hungry in this country. The way to make the tax code fair is to make big corporations and the very wealthy begin to pay their fair share. Remember in 2020, 55 of the biggest companies in America made $40 billion and paid zero in federal income tax. Zero. Not anymore. Thanks to the law I wrote and we signed, big companies have to pay a minimum of 15 percent. But that's still less than working people pay in federal taxes. It's time to raise. That's 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 so inc such an incredibly low amount of taxes. Oh, man. Just makes you realize what it would be. You know, we should all just become big corporations. 
I would, oh man, it would be amazing if I only had to pay 15%. You know how much I have to pay as a independent contractor, which is what you are when you're a YouTube channel, unless you make an LLC, which I might have to do at some point. Uh, you pay a lot, okay? You pay a, a goddamn lot. You know, we should all just, we should all just become gigantic multi-billion co corporations. That would solve all our problems. This corporate minimum tax to at least 21%. Yes. So every big corporation finally begins to pay their fair share. I also want to end tax breaks for big pharma, big oil, private checks, massive executive pay when it's only supposed to be a million, a million dollars that could be deducted. They can pay them 20 million if they want, but deduct a million. End it now. You know, there are 1,000 billionaires in America. You know what the average federal tax is for those billionaires? No. They're making great sacrifices, 8.2%. That's far less than the vast majority of Americans pay. No billionaire should pay a lower federal tax rate than a teacher, a sanitation worker, or a nurse. I propose a minimum tax for billionaires of 25 percent, just 25 percent. You know what that would raise? That would raise five hundred billion dollars over the next ten years, and imagine what that could do for America. An aggressive imagine promise. Imagine a future with affordable child care. Millions of families can get they need to go to work to help grow the economy. Imagine a future with paid leave, because no one should have to choose between working and taking care of their sick family member. Imagine, imagine a future of home care and elder care and people living with disabilities so they can stay in their homes and family caregivers can finally get the pay they deserve. Tonight, let's all agree once again to stand up for seniors. Many of my friends on the other side of aisle want to put Social Security on the chopping block. Okay. Let's see it. I want to see Joe Biden get that 25% tax rate. I want to see it. Let's see it. Let's see Dems commit to that. That's a lot of talk. That's a lot of talk. Imagine a world that's good. Imagine good things. Now, is there a path to actually getting it? Guess we're going to find out. You want to know part of the problem with Joe Biden at this point is that nobody fucking believes him because he made a lot of these promises. And people haven't seen a whole lot of it. People haven't seen him deliver on a whole lot of his promises. So he has a credibility problem. Because he can promise whatever the hell he wants, but people don't buy it. People aren't going to buy it from him. When he does manage to actually promise something. I will say, it's certainly better for his electoral options that he promises big. But Joe Biden has made himself a serious problem by not delivering on a lot of his promises. Yeah, remember when he promised about codifying Roe? That didn't happen, even when they had full advantage. No president delivers on his promises? Yeah, obviously. The, no promise, no president does that. Because it's, it's, because it's, it's consent manufacturing. It is, it is, they make promises to you. They tell you they're going to do things. You vote for them. Then they say, well, you voted for me. And they don't actually have to. Your vote is stuck in stone. They got the power. They don't have any actual obligation. No one can do anything to them if they don't deliver on their promises. But you voted for them. And they're in power now. See, you voted for them. It's, it's just a big consent manufacturing process. Okay, I can't get mad at literal drooling idiots in chat anymore. We have to, we have to, I have to spend more time on this goddamn thing. We got to get this Fine. done. 
If anyone here tries to cut Social Security, Medicare, or raise the retirement age, I will stop you. Oh, yeah, true. Good point, Danny. Danny says, remember when we were promised to have less, less fascism on the southern border and it was a big beat reason that people voted for Biden when Joe Biden spent a lot of time talking about how disgusting Trump's border policies are only for him to move forward capitulating to the worst actors in the border states? The working people, the working people who built this country pay more into Social Security than millionaires and billionaires do. It's not fair. We have two ways to go. Republicans can cut Social Security and give more tax breaks to the wealthy. I will, well, that's the proposal. Oh no, you guys don't want another $2 trillion tax cut? I kind of thought that's what your plan was. Well, that's good to hear. Sorry, you guys don't. I will. Republicans can cut Social Security and give more tax breaks to the wealthy. I will. Well, that's the proposal. Oh no, you guys don't want another $2 trillion tax cut? I kind of thought that's what your plan was. Well, that's good to hear. You're not going to cut another $2 trillion for the super wealth. That's good to hear. I'll protect and strengthen Social Security and make the wealthy. All right. Fair play, Joe. That was a good one. Good job, bro. That was a good call. Not that it really matters in the end. Uh, these types of quips back and forth, there's nothing set in stone, but it's a good look. It's definitely a good look. For the people who made it 40 minutes into the State of the Union, I'm sure uh, it definitely makes the Republicans uh, look bad. And it also is at least one sort of public point against the Republicans. Uh, but it also falls into the hypocrisy camp, so it doesn't have all that much power. But nonetheless, decent play. Good play, Joe. Pay their fair share. Look. Blablato says, will you review the Republican response because it was so bad? Um, I don't know. I don't know if I want to see the Republican response. I know what they're going to respond with. Derangement. We know where the state of the Republicans are right now. I don't know if we gain anything from, like, spending a lot of time looking at their responses. It's hilarious. It's awkward. All right, give me the link. All right, give me the link. Maybe we'll watch some of it. We have so much to do tonight, and it's already 830. Too many corporations raise prices to pad their profits, charging more and more for less and less. That's why we're cracking down on corporations that engage in price gouging and deceptive pricing, from food to health care to housing. In fact, the snack companies think you won't notice if they change the size of the bag and put a hell of a lot fewer <laughs> same, same size bag, put fewer chips in it. No, I'm not joking. It's called shrinkflation. Pass Bob and Casey's <laughs> bill and stop this. Bro, oh, what? I really mean it. Okay, that might be the most relatable thing he said the entire time. This is a Grandpa Joe moment, and I'm here for it. Good job, Grandpa Joe. Tackle that chip chipflation. You know, it's the same hedgehog, but more air. They call it sonic inflation. You probably all saw that commercial on Snickers bars. You get, you get charged the same amount, and you got about, I don't know, 10% fewer Snickers in it. Look, I'm also getting rid of junk fees. Those hidden fees at the end of your bill that are there without your knowledge. My administration announced we're cutting credit card late fees from $32 to $8. Banks and credit card companies are allowed to charge what it costs them to, in, to instigate the, re, the, the collection. And that's more a hell of a lot, like $8 and 30-some dollars. They don't like it. The credit card companies don't like it. But I'm saving American families 
$20 billion a year with all the junk fees I'm eliminating. I feel like he should have put this stuff much earlier in. Like, I feel like this should have been, like, he should have done a best hits at the beginning of this speech, and this should have been one of them. Unironically, this is something that was very popular. Um, the fact that Joe Biden is paying attention to something like uh, predatory late fees and hidden fees is actually really good. Um, hidden fees are really heinous. Okay, so here's one. Let me give you an example of just, a, just an off-the-cuff example of how bad uh, hidden fees are. So recently... Um, so, okay, so the city of Seattle has passed a whole bunch of legislation to try and tackle the gross underpayment of delivery workers. Delivery workers, you know, people who work for DoorDash, Grubhub, blah, 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 all those different, you know, Uber Eats. They get, like, there's a lot of them. It's really, really, really big in big cities. There's a ton of people working these things. And they don't get paid very well. In fact, it's, it's pretty egregious. And so Seattle um, has passed some laws that basically say um, that are just like if you're a server at a restaurant where there's a minimum amount, a minimum wage that they must be paid um, that kicks in if they don't make enough with tips to surpass that minimum wage. So basically, um, these gigantic highly profitable food delivery corporations um, that have very little overhead costs and basically are just facilitator apps, these app corporations actually have to grapple with the fact that they have created a disempowered workforce that is grossly underpaid and overworked. And if the, their workers are working and aren't getting making enough from doing that work, there's a minimum wage that's in place now. So a lot of these apps have started doing a new thing. And there is literally a fee that will be added and you can open it up. It's in the, uh, you have to actually like press a button. There'll be like a, a service fees thing. And then you can open it up on the app and see the extra fees. And if you're ordering food within the city of Seattle, it will say um, Seattle city. It's called like Seattle city uh, uh, wage fee. And it's just like a $6 fee that they add to every single delivery in the city now as a hidden fee. It is literally hidden behind an additional menu that they add to every one. It's not a tip. It doesn't go to the driver. It just reimburses the corporation for the fact that in some cases they might have to pay a minimum wage. That's how heinous uh, like hidden fees are. And this is something that appeals to a lot of people in America. And I'm not just talking about delivery things. There's This is common across, oh my God, it's crazy common. The amount of um, lawsuits that have been brought against telecom companies because cell co cell co cellular companies love their hidden fees. They love their hidden fees. So this is something that I feel like Joe Biden should have front loaded because it's something that a lot of people can understand. People who might not watch the whole 40 minutes of the State of the Union address but it's something they can understand and appreciate, something that he's actually paying attention to. The fact that Joe Biden and his administration at know and are thinking about hidden fees at all is a good sign for a lot of people. Kevin Maxwell Smith with the incredibly generous $5. The GOP response is a wasteland of conservative talking points only to be trudged by the wary demon mama. Be prepared for peak cringe. All right, we'll check it out. All right, we'll check, we'll check it out. Fine, we'll do it. Let's continue. We gotta finish this up though. Folks at home, that's why the banks are so mad. It's $20 billion in profit. Rahab says, what are hidden fees? Uh, the thing that I just described, hidden fees are basically a thing that corporations can technically legally do it's extra additional fees. Uh, a, a good example of this is like um, when you buy a ticket. Um, the, the, honestly, the hidden fees discourse, a lot of that started because of a corporation here called Ticketmaster, which is basically a mega corporation that controls a vast majority of uh, like concert and sports ticket sales. And they are notorious for it. Basically, you'll get a price on a ticket and then when you go to check out, it'll be like $30 more. 
and they'll have a little thing. It'll be like, see what fees, you know, uh, it'll be like ticket fees. And then you'll be like fees, what the hell? And then you have to like click another menu to see or click through to another window and they'll say a uh, servicing fee, a uh, processing fee. And they're all these vaguely named fees that they just add on that are literally just them scraping more money and they often will reference something but they're ne they don't b by law in america they don't have to actually like itemize it in most cases so they can just be whatever they don't have to prove to you that you're actually paying for something they're just adding it on and uh if that sounds kind of corrupt and disgusting like wait a second so like you not only are you know have your hand in control of the price of tickets but you also are just inventing random things to charge people it almost sounds kind of like highway robbery like daylight fucking robbery uh yeah it, it is and basically hidden fees have become more and more common and they're really egregious because sometimes they crawl into your monthly bills so when you pay for internet there might be a hidden uh service maintenance fee which who knows what that actually is for? And you can't really reasonably figure out what it's for. They just make you pay it. And if you don't, you don't get your your internet or your phone or whatever, or your water. It's pretty bad. The problem uh, of hidden fees is really bad in America and it affects mostly the majority of people affected by it are poor people um, because they're the ones who's, whose paychecks are most impacted by it and who are most likely to be unable to negotiate out of hidden fees. So, yeah. And then of course, he's talking about overdrafts here, which is another good thing for him to talk about, which is another disgusting thing that happens in America, which is that until very recently, um, banks were allowed to charge you if you accidentally um, pay, if you accidentally charged more to your credit card than you have on balance. And uh, some places, some banks are so fucked up. So first of all, they have the ability and the technology to decline the fee. You know, if you run your card and you don't have enough money on it, uh, they have the ability to just decline the card. However, um, because of overdraft fees, they can just decide not to do that. And it will actually put you into a negative balance, which means you owe money to the bank. And not only because you owe money to the bank and they had to help you, cover your bill, they can then charge you a service fee or what is called an overdraft fee. An overdraft fee is another amount that they determine on top of uh, however much you went in the negative. And what's even crazier is that in a lot of places, now in some states this is outlawed, but in a lot of American states it's not, they can actually charge you an overdraft fee on the overdraft fee and then an overdraft fee on that overdraft fee. And if that sounds like they could basically continually charge you an infinite amount of money for a mistake that they could easily prevent that doesn't actually cost them anything, yeah, that's actually what they can do. And it's actually possible for people to get in debt purely on overdraft fees, which are preventable. Some banks are so egregious that they will actually make you pay a monthly amount out of your account for overdraft protection which means that instead of making you go and do an overdraft, you can pay $2 a month, just delete it out of your account so that the bank won't do that to you. Genuinely disgusting, actually filthy. And uh, Joe Biden didn't get rid of overdrafts. The rational thing of any person would be able to see that that is a heinous and evil thing. However, he did uh, severely limit the amount of overdraft fees um, that you can, uh, uh, that you can actually charge. The Biden administration passed a rule that basically says that they can only charge you like, God, what was it? Uh, let me, let me double check. I want to get the specifics on this one. Let me look at this real quick. It is a benchmark fee between three and $14, depending on where it is. So that is the maximum amount that they are allowed, uh, allowed to charge is between three and $14, depending on where you are and the amount in overdraft. So uh, currently the average overdraft fee in the United States is $26. Uh, his law drops it to somewhere between three and $14, depending on your local jurisdiction. So obviously, 
Not a complete solution, but a huge step up. Instead of uh, 20, 25 to $35 dollars being charged because of a totally preventable thing that banks can easily stop from happening. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I hope that makes sense. That was a little bit of a, a, a big, uh, um, uh, a big fucking ramble, but I hope that makes sense. Banks are still going to stack purchases in a way to force the most overdraft fees. Yeah, of course, they have complete control over it, but it's still significantly better. Uh, most places are going to be pretty low. Uh, I, d I think that overdraft fees should be illegal. Um, that a bank should just have to decline the charge and that's it. If you don't have enough in your account, they decline the charge. It's that simple. They obviously can do it. They do it most of the time. Most rational banks will do that. Um, but yeah, instead they can s carve people for free money. Uh, basically, a an, an advanced, it almost seems like a legal scam to me, you know? And I think it should be illegal. Chariot says, I once got a $50 overdraft fee once after a cell phone bill happened to go bad at a bad time, go through at a bad time. Terrible. Anyway, let's continue. Let's continue. Great to see you, Chariot, by the way. Also, uh, I, I noticed uh, I missed I missed welcoming Tipster. Welcome to the chat, Tipster. It's great to have you. Sorry for uh, for not getting to shout you out before. We have some we have some great people in here. We got High Progressive Chariot. We got Tipster here tonight, looking great. All right, let's do this. Oh, Gayfesh, Gayfesh, welcome. Happy to see you. I hope your watching was great. Hope your uh, Oscar watch was wonderful. Anyway, let's continue. Welcome to everyone who's here. What a what a great crew we've got tonight. I'm not stopping there. My administration has proposed rules to make cable, travel, utilities, and online ticket sellers tell you the total price up front. Oh, look, there he, he actually brought up the online ticket sellers. Like I said, the conversation around hidden fees really kicked up to a, 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 a high level with ticket sales. Uh, oddly enough, this is kind of a Taylor Swift thing. Uh, the Taylor Swift fandom, which is huge, was getting... Uh, Basically, a bunch of people in the fandom were complaining about how much money was being basically scraped from them in ticket sales, and it caused a giant social media thing, and people started paying attention to it more. So there are no surprises. It mattered. It mattered. And so does this. In November, my team began serious negotiation with a bipartisan group of senators. The result was a bipartisan bill with the toughest set of border security reforms we've ever seen. Oh, you don't think so? Hold on a second. Whoa, 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 whoa. By again, serious negotiation of the bipartisan In November, my team began serious negotiation with a bipartisan group of senators. The result was a bipartisan bill with the toughest set of border security reforms we've ever seen. Bro. This is exactly what we were just talking about. Joe Biden ran on the nightmare at the border that was happening under Trump. Remember, remember kids in cages? Joe Biden is now currently boasting about the fact that he set out to make the mo the toughest border uh, bipartisan border bill that has ever been passed. Like that's something he should be fucking proud of. This is literally. You notice, you know how liberals love to do the um, the the ninety nine percent Hitler versus one hundred percent Hitler thing, and they're like, you should always vote for the ninety nine percent Hitler. This is night. Ow! Oh, I just bit my own tongue. Ow! This is ninety nine percent Hitler going out of his way to say, I worked with one hundred percent Hitler to get ninety nine point five percent Hitler law passed. That is so fucking pathetic. I just, and also it, it sells 
terribly to his core voter base. I don't know if you know about this, but a lot of Democrats actually do think that uh, disgusting and inhumane conditions at the border are a failure of American vision. They see that as a failure of delivery on the American dream. Democrats, liberals, and Joe Biden is here going, I helped pass the toughest border reform we've ever seen. I capitulated. Pathetic. Pathetic. Sad. Oh, you don't think so? Oh, you don't like that bill, huh? That conservatives got together and said it was a good bill? I'll be darned. That's amazing. That bipartisan bill would hire 1,500 more security. Jerry the Weeb says, just this week, I was negative $500 in overdraft fee fees. They should be illegal. They should be illegal. That sounds, that, that actually, negative 500 sounds already illegal. Um, I would say contact a lawyer, but the problem is with these types of things is that if you're negative $500, you have a hard time paying a lawyer, which is kind of what the banks bank on. Ha <laughs> ha. I'm sorry to hear that. I hope you're able to get out of the situation. And yes, overdraft fees should be illegal. The agents and officers, 100 more immigration judges help tackle the backload of 2 million cases, 4,300 more asylum officers, and new policies so they can resolve cases in six months instead of six years now. What are you against? 100 more high-tech drug detection machines to significantly increase the ability to screen and stop vehicles smuggling fentanyl into America. That's there he goes, banging that drug war drum again. Remember what I said at the beginning about how his, uh, his, his claims about uh, being anti-political violence is full of shit? He's literally right now banging the drug war drum. We're, we're, you know, we got, we got advanced detection things to stop the flow of drugs coming in from the South. Killing thousands of children. This bill would save lives and bring order to the border. It would also give me and any new president new emergency authority to temporarily shut down the border. Joe Harkonnen has imported a hundred more poison sniffers to ensure that, uh, that, that Fremen rebels aren't, aren't running spice into our cities. Border, when the number of migrants at the border is overwhelming. The Border Patrol Union has endorsed this bill. The Federal Chamber of Commerce is, yeah, yeah. You're saying low, look at the facts. I know, I know you know how to read. I believe that given the opportunity for a majority in the House and Senate would endorse the bill as well, a majority right now. But unfortunately, politics has derailed this bill so far. I'm told my predecessor called members of Congress in the Senate to demand they block the bill. He feels political win, he viewed it as a, would be a political win for me and a political loser for him. It's not about him, it's not about me. I'd be a winner not really. I. Uh oh. Uh oh. Uh oh. Oh no, he's falling apart. Oh, and and Kamala's got the pain face on. Lincoln, Lincoln Riley, an innocent young woman who was killed by an illegal. That's right. But how many of thousands of people being killed by illegals? To her parents, I say, my heart goes out to you, having lost children myself. I understand. But look, if we change the dynamic at the border, people pay people, people pay these smugglers 8,000 bucks to get across the border, because they know if they get by, if they get by and let into the country, it's six to eight years before they have a hearing. Did he just pick up a, hold on a second.
Hold on. What what is this? Is this say is this a what is I I have not heard of this before this event. Oh, uh, when I search it, it's literally all like right wing news orgs. Is this like a is this some kind of like right wing campaign or something? What is this shit? Marjorie Taylor Greene wore a t-shirt to the State of the Union that carried a seemingly simple message. Say her name. Greene used the rallying cry to successfully goad Joe Biden into saying the name Lakin Riley, a nursing student from Georgia whose death is now at the center of a U.S. immigration debate. Okay. Why does he have a pin up there? Why would he do that? Why would he why would he let Marjorie Taylor Greene get him to do that? I'm sorry. I I'm I'm unsure exactly what's going on here. Like it seems like a tragedy genuinely occurred. MTG forced it on him at the very beginning. Why would he hold that up? She's one of the most deranged Republicans. Why would you? And also, she's a notorious troll. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Let's keep going. He's starting to fall apart here. He really bungled that last bit. And it's worth the, taking the chance of the $8,000. But, but, if it's only six months, six weeks, the idea is it's highly unlikely that people will pay that money and gum all that way, knowing that they'll be able to be kicked out quickly. <laughs> Folks, what? I would respectfully say, to suggest my, friend, my Republican friends owe it to the American people, get this bill done. We need to act now. The Dems in this country are so fucking cooked. This is not, like, first of all, that entire segment, he was bumbling and stumbling over himself and completely incoherent. Secondly, the Dems clapping for what they started the segment by selling as the most, uh, what, what did he say? It was the, the, the strictest, the harshest, uh, 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 border reform bipartisan bill this is pathetic and it really does um, you know it, it really does it, it does give the, the, the impression of a controlled opposition doesn't it where the Republicans basically say the most insane and deranged shit you can possibly imagine 24-7 and then for literally no reason at all the Democrats just decide to capitulate to them for no benefit. For no fucking benefit. What person, what Democrat is going to look at this and go, yeah, that's the president I want. I feel like he's going to give me what I want. When Democrats look at the Republican Party and go, those guys are deranged psychos and I want nothing to do with them. And then they see their president bumbling through, capitulating to the Republicans while they boo him. During his capitulation, you would think, you would think if the, if the tactic was working that the Republicans would go, yeah, we loved working with you. Nope. They're bullying him even as he capitulates to them. They are shoving his face in the dirt on national TV during his State of the Union. We are cooked. Okay. That is some fucking, that is, that is some very, very bad signs for the state of American politics.
And if my predecessor is watching, instead of paying politics and pressuring members of Congress to block the bill, join me in telling the Congress to pass it. We can do it together. But that's what he apparently hears what he will not do. I will not demonize immigrants saying they are poison in the blood of our country. I will not separate families. <laughs> he already did. <laughs> I will not ban people because of their faith. Unlike my predecessor on my first day in office, I introduced a comprehensive bill to fix our immigration system. Take a look at it, as all these and more. Secure the border. Provide a pathway to citizenship for dreamers. And so much more. But unlike yeah, that's a good point. Danny Fallon says that he did literally demonize this person. That that the person who's been accused of the crime has not been proven guilty yet. And the president of the United States just said that he was. That's really, that's actually very fucked up. And he did that because Marjorie Taylor Greene handed him a button. Joe Biden, this is, that is, I mean, thank God that this happened 45 minutes into the State of the Union because most people will have tuned out by now, but let's be real. We should, anybody who gives a shit about it, this, about the fucking world at all, anybody who gives a shit about America at all should be looking at this and have a deep sense of fucking horror about the direction that politics is going. This is what passes for the Republican opposition in 2024. This is such a goddamn bad sign. Oh my God. My predecessor, I know who we are as Americans. We're the only nation in the world with a heart and soul that draws from old and new. Home to Native Americans and ancestors have been here for thousands of years. Home to people of every place, from every place on earth. They came freely. Some came in chains. Some came when famine struck like my ancestral family in Ireland. Some to flee persecution, to chase dreams that are impossible anywhere but here in America. That's America. And we all come from somewhere, but we're all Americans. <laughs> Look, folks, we have a simple choice. We can fight about fixing the border, or we can fix it. I'm ready to fix it. Send me the border bill now. A transformational moment in history happened 58, 59 years ago today in Selma, Alabama. Hundreds of foot soldiers from justice marched across the Edmund Pettus Bridge, named after the Grand Dragon of the Ku Klux Klan, to claim their fundamental right to vote. They were beaten. They were bloody and left for dead. <laughs> AD5D2D Derek, thank you so much for the $5. AD5D2D Derek says, this speech really reminds me of Friday Night Funkin'. Every time Joe goes for a while without making a mistake, Kamala bobs her head and claps. And every time he goofs, every time he goofs she shakes her, fa her face in pain. Incredible, beautiful, true. Our late friend and former colleague, John Lewis, was on that march. We miss him. But joining us tonight, our other marchers, both in the gallery and on the floor, including Betty Mae Fikes, known as the voice of Selma, the daughter of gospel singers and preachers, she sang songs of prayer and protest on that bloody Sunday to help shake the nation's conscience. Five months later, the Voting Rights Act passed them a sign in the law. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. But 59 years later, 
their forces taking us back in time. Voter suppression, election subversion, unlimited dark money, extreme gerrymandering. John Lewis is a great friend to many of us here, but if you truly want to honor him and all the heroes of March with him, then it's time to do more than talk. Pass the Freedom to Vote Act, the John Lewis Voting Right Act. And stop, stop denying another core value of America, our diversity across American life. Banning books, it's wrong. Instead of erasing history, let's make history. I want to protect fundamental rights. Pass the Equality Act. And my message to transgender Americans, <laughs> I have your back. Pass the PRO Act for workers' rights. Raise okay. the federal minimum wage. Well, trans people got one line from the president. Meanwhile, a roaring culture war targeting trans people perpetrated by Democrats, perpetrated by leaders, or not by Democrats, by Republicans, perpetrated by leaders in the Republican Party all across the country has been raging for years. And we've barely heard anything about it from Joe Biden. Joe Biden said that he had trans people's back at the beginning of his election. And then he stood by and watched while state after state after state passed disgusting, draconian, authoritarian laws oppressing the rights of trans people, invading the lives of trans people and their families. He's capitulating and attempting to work with people who have, who have gone out of their way to persecute trans people, and then he tries to tell trans people, I have your back. No one believes that. No one believes that. I know a lot of trans people, okay? And I don't know a single trans person who feels like Joe Biden has got their back or the Joe Biden administration is looking out for them. I've heard and seen and hear a lot of fear about Donald Trump. And I don't hear, see, or feel a whole lot of relief about the idea of Joe Biden because Joe Biden has stood by and remained silent outside of literally a single goddamn line. I got your backs. Meanwhile, an entire swath of America has swung into the goddamn uh, dark ages with regards to trans acceptance. An entire swath of red states have lost their fucking minds due to a truly deranged and evil, and I mean that, truly evil, culture war driven against trans people rampant uh, uh, bigotry, rampant misinformation, just the most deranged uh, uh, libel you can imagine directed at trans people on a constant and daily basis. And Joe Biden, all he has to say is, I got your back, one line at the end of the State of the Union. Luna Rose 161 says, so what? Bury our heads in the sand and let Trump win so we all die? Um, that can be your solution. Maybe you should do that. I am so fucking tired of people like you. I am so goddamn tired of idiots like yourself who have so little self-respect, who are so fucking cucked, so doomer, that you can't even conceptualize of critiquing the reigning fucking president of the United States when he has stood by and done nothing for you in the middle of the most deranged, libelous, fucking uh, uh, culture war bullshit where every single day talking heads in the Republican Party are ranting about how they want to kill all the groomers and how they want to drive and eradicate trans people from public life. And Joe Biden can manage to go, I got your backs and do fucking nothing. And when I point that out, you go, so I should just die then? Shut the fuck up. 
How about this? How about you shut the fuck up forever? How about you just never talk? That would be a better solution. People like you should learn to have a goddamn fucking spine and a functioning fucking brain. I'm so goddamn tired of it. It's, I've seen it so fucking much. Every time I even try to critique Biden, anytime I bring up something negative, a hundred fucking losers show up out of nowhere to go, oh, what? So I should just die then? Shut the fuck up. The man is the reigning president and he's bungling it. This fucking drooling idiot is going to guarantee with his own fucking actions that that bitch, Donald Trump, is going to be president again. And you get mad when I point that fact out. That Joe Biden has been shooting himself in the goddamn balls for three years, but especially in election year. It's the middle of goddamn March. And this guy is failing to appeal to the basic people in his goddamn own electorate. And you're mad at me and you're telling me I'm telling you to lay down and die? That's fucking crazy. You're fucking crazy. Stupid. I'm tired of people with no solutions. You mean the Democrats? I don't know, newsflash, motherfucker. I'm not the president of the United States. I'm not the fucking president. I'm a live streamer. I'm giving you my opinions and I'm critiquing the most powerful man in the world. The solution is, I've, in fact, I've done entire videos. The crazy fucking thing about people like yourself is that I've done entire videos on my channel talking about exactly this. I've said exactly what I think Joe Biden himself should do. But guess what? Joe Biden doesn't fucking listen to me. And he doesn't listen to you either. He doesn't fucking care. Joe Biden is fighting for political power. And the least that you can do is have the self-respect necessary to know how to listen to a critique of the guy and internalize that into your fucking crusty brain. I've been fairly angry this stream because I don't feel like I've even been that hard on Joe Biden. In fact, I've motherfucking praised the guy during this, but crawling out of the woodwork is a bunch of people who have stupid shit to say to me. The most asinine and pointless shit, and I can't fucking stand it anymore. I can't, I, I, I don't know how the fuck I'm supposed to sit here and act fucking normal when I say, guys, it's actually pretty bad that Joe Biden d has basically done nothing in a meaningful way. The most powerful man in the world hasn't used even 1% of his power to try and stop an insane genocidal culture war being driven, being ramped up a literal medical legal assault on trans people who are a tiny percentage of the population. And the most powerful guy in the world knows this. He knows they're doing this and he can't work it up to do it. And then a bunch of people go, so you're saying we should just vote for Trump? So you're saying we should just lay down and die? No, motherfucker. Holy fucking God. Over and over and over again, I encounter this. And it's been years. You guys... This shit is pathetic. It's pathetic. The fact that people can't go, wow, this is, this is fucked up. The fact that, that people feel the need to pretend that this isn't the circumstances that we live in, that we are not sitting here with a president who's best that he can muster for an incredibly vulnerable and highly persecuted minority in our country is, I have your back after fucking bumbling through four fucking different sections uh, uh, of, of him capitulating to the right wing while they bully him further from the right. Fuck all 
of my expo chef now! <laughs> True, Danny. True. Holy shit. Brutus Magnuson. I think our best move is to try to figure out how we can get under his skin without helping the other guy, and that isn't easy. We can't get under his skin. I need you all to understand that Joe B Biden is, he, he isn't even in the same plane of existence as you, okay? This is a man who wields the power to obliterate the entire planet. This man carries around with him a suitcase that has the power to obliterate the planet, okay? You don't get under that guy's skin, okay? That's not how this works. What we can do is we can communicate to one another. We can hopefully observe these things and we can try and take care of each other and build structures that keep us alive despite the roiling of these demented old men. What we can do is we can confront people who are deluded by propaganda. And that is what it is. The propaganda that tells you that you just have to sit there and be okay when Joe Biden uh, tells you that he's the guy who's going to save the planet and that if you don't vote for him, it's the end of the fucking world. And then you look and you go, hey, dude, you said you were going to take care of people four years ago. People voted for you. People worked really hard for you. Some of you people in my audience canvassed and campaigned for Joe Biden. I know there are people in my audience who worked for the Dems to get this guy elected and have, and have and, and now live in states where their rights have been stripped because he couldn't even lift his pinky finger to say, trans Americans, I stand with you no matter what. And this nonsense that is being peddled to give four or five speeches, to set a guy a, 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 a role, who a, 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 a position of power, to make a cabinet position or a, an appointee that can go and ensure that their, that their job is to go and counter misinformation about trans people, to constantly be in communication with the Democratic Party, that the opposition is spending an inordinate amount of their time trying to find a way to persecute 1% of the populace. It actually is a pretty big deal that, that, that the Democrats are ignoring the fact that Republicans are talking about this constantly. They're not exactly being secret about it. It's not like they don't know. Republicans are bringing up trans people in the fucking halls of Congress constantly. And Dems just sit there with a blank look on their face. Jesus Christ. I really didn't, I didn't expect the State of the Union to be the topic that made me lose my fucking shit tonight. That made me go on a fucking screaming rant. But watching people sit in chat and, and li literally ignore the words that are coming out of my mouth. And, and not just that, but go out of their way to say things that I didn't say. Like a, like a, like a, a, a like it. It's not, it doesn't even resemble the things that I've said. Drives me fucking bonkers, especially on this particular topic. It feels like being gaslit by a bunch of fucking random people on the internet. 
when it's been years of me talking about this subject. And people act like, like they're like, yeah, we, so you're acknowledging the fact that like, that Joe Biden isn't doing good enough. Well, you know, so I'm just supposed to give up? I don't know, is that your solution? I'm doing what I can do. I don't know if you, I don't know, do you have a, do you, are you, do you live with Joe Biden? Do you have a phone you can pick up and call Joe Biden? Why don't you fucking do it then? I don't know. I can't contact Joe Biden. I can't even contact a person who can even contact Joe Biden. I can't contact a person who can contact, who can contact, who can contact. I'm like a million degrees of separation from Joe Biden right now. But you know what I do have to feel? I do have to feel the pain of people that I know fucking suffering while he goes and says, I got your back in one line of the State of the Union. Meanwhile, uh, Republicans all across the country will devote entire hours of speeches talking about how they're going to persecute people like me. Look, I'm not just talking about you, Luna, and I shouldn't have I shouldn't have flown off the handle in your in your specific direction. But fucking Christ. Like, you know, when you when you post something in a public chat, you know, and it's it's gonna be hyperbolic. You might get a hyperbolic, you not even a hyperbolic, you might get a strong response in return. Because I don't think what I said was fucking hyperbolic. Now I do have a problem because it's been happening for the entire fucking stream. I've had to see people saying ridiculous things about me and it, it pushes me, okay? And you're right, I apologize. I shouldn't have gone as hard on you specifically. But there is a, a recurring theme. There is a, there is a genre of response that I get to me pointing out a very, very fucking basic response to, to, to Joe Biden, when I go, that's fucking not enough. That's not good enough, my man. You're, that there's, there's a response that I get and I keep getting it over and over and over again. And it drives me up a wall. And I feel like I've kept my cool. It's been a long time since I've had a chat blow up. But you got me today. All right. Luna got all the smoke, but for no reason. Look, sometimes that's how it works, okay? And I apologize. Luna, I shouldn't have given you all the smoke, okay? I shouldn't have given you all of it, all right? But let's, you know, let's, let's fucking consider for a second what I'm actually saying. There's a... I'm not, it's not, I did fucking freak out, okay? So don't, let's not, you don't, you don't need to pad me down. I did have a bit, little bit of a, I had a little bit of a meltdown, okay? This is what we call a little bit of a meltdown, all right? But it was a long time coming, okay? The reactor's been running hot for a long time, and I've kept the lid on, despite undue heat. But I shouldn't have directed it all at you. I had, a game, I had a gamer moment, okay? Nuts, of course you've seen me more pissed. Consider this my apology, Luna, okay? I'm sorry. Shouldn't have, I shouldn't have fucking hit you with the thermonuclear bombs. To be fair, I don't need to be fair to me. I shouldn't have hit you with it, okay? I hope you can accept my apology for going off the rails. In truth, I was ranting at a conglomerate of people. Not just you.
All right. Apology accepted, says L Luna. We, we can make peace. But don't think the rest of you are off the fucking hook. And my previous meltdown, that one was justified. This one was a little unjustified. But the other rant, that one. I'm not apologizing for that one. Missed the rant. Okay, to be fair, I shouldn't say it was a rant. I did, I did have a bit of a meltdown. All right, listen, just a little bit. Okay. You know, I used to, I used to bring that spice a lot more. I've, I've been even keel for a long time. All right. But not today. Do we even need to finish this shit? Do we, is there anything else that he's going to say in the next 10 minutes? Because every worker has a right to a decent living more than a seven bucks an hour. We're also making history by confronting the climate crisis. Not he did, high progressive. It was bad. Oh, we got to talk about Gaza. Of course he saves it to the end. Now that right there, saving the Gaza to, the, to, an, hour in, to an hour into your goddamn State of the Union speech, that's what we call a strategy, okay? That says something in and of itself. I don't think any of you think there's no longer a climate crisis. At least I hope you don't. I'm taking the most significant action ever on climate in the history of the world. I'm cutting our carbon emissions in half by 2030, creating tens of thousands of clean energy jobs like the IBW work is building and installing 500,000 electric vehicle charging stations. Conserving. 30% of America's lands and waters by 2030. I'm taking action on environmental justice fence line communities smothered by the legacy of pollution. And pattern after the Peace Corps and America Corps, I launched the Climate Corps to put 20,000. Yes, we hit that too, 85 to 2D Derek. 1,000 young people to work in the forefront of our clean energy future. I'll triple that number in a decade. The future. 20,000 young people to work in the forefront of our clean energy future. I'll triple that number in a decade. Okay. To state the obvious, all Americans deserve the freedom to be safe. And America is safer today than when I took office. Year before I took office, murder rates went up 30 percent. 30 percent they went up. What? Took office, murder rates went up 30 percent. 30 percent they went up. The biggest increase. In what? What are they? What are they saying? I can't even hear what he's saying. What's he saying? Up. The biggest increase in history. It was then, through no, through my American Rescue Plan, which I'm actually kind of surprised. Um, did he say United States Marines? This is. Uh, there's been a lot of heckling in this. State of the Union. I've seen a lot of State of the Unions, and there's almost never this much heckling. It's actually kind of crazy how much there's been. Like, I'm serious. It usually doesn't happen that much. I don't know what he's talking about, but it's because Republicans are more deranged than they've ever been. I mean, that's absolutely true. It's just usually the State of the Union is a fairly chill event. It's not the type of thing that uh, people usually, like, scream at. It's just kind of an odd thing to notice. Man yelling, remember Abby Gate. Oh, okay. Yeah, so he was mad about a Marine that got killed in the pullout from Afghanistan.
Okay. All right. Okay, bro. The American voted against, I'm mad at. I mean, it's kind of like, it's kind of weird. It's kind of weird to, po to protest deaths of American soldiers on the pullout of a war, an ongoing war that was continuing to kill Americans. Like, Americans were continuing to die in Afghanistan. So, that just seems like a weird thing to do. I, I don't know, it seems like a weird, a weird thing to protest, that's all I'm saying. We made the largest investment in public safety ever. Last year- The soldier was his son? Yeah, but that still doesn't really change, right? That doesn't really change the thing. It's kind of a strange thing to protest. Like, if, you're, if your son dies in Afghanistan, wouldn't that be more the fault of people who perpetuated the war? It's, it's a very, it's just kind of a weird thing. In my opinion, that's kind of a weird thing, a weird way to protest. Like, losing somebody in the military is not easy. Um, the military, like, nobody wants to lose a loved one who went into the military, and people often go into the military because they've been heavily propagandized to, because they have been, you know, basically told that it'll deliver them from their financial and life troubles. It's not a good thing. I can understand how sad and terrible that would be. I just find it very weird to, like, protest that during the State of the Union, during this section, be, like, because Joe Biden pulled out of a war, like he was done with the war. It seems like stopping Amer American military involvement would actually um, save lives. I don't know. I don't know. Losing your child in a war does not lead to rational thinking. Grief can make people irrational. Sure. Uh, yeah, no doubt. That it much is absolutely true. For sure. No, de no denying that. Here, the murder rates are the sharpest decrease in history. Violent crime fell to one of its lowest levels in more than 50 years. But we have more to do. We have to help cities invest in more community police officers more mental health workers, more community violence intervention. Give communities the tool to crack down on gun crime, retail crime, and carjacking. Keep building trust, as they've been doing by taking executive action on police reform. Give the tool to crack down on more community violence intervention. Give communities the tool to crack down on gun crime, retail crime, and carjacking. Keep building... What? Did he just slip in that we're going to crack down on crime? It's our Democratic president. We're going to crack down specifically on retail crime? That is a right-wing conspiracy talking point. The retail crime thing is literally like a far-right obsession. They obsess over weird videos of shoplifting, despite the fact that there's none of their claims are based in reality whatsoever. Oh, whatever. Jesus Christ. At this point, I just feel like, is this not, is this speech not exactly what I was talking about earlier with the constant, the absolute constant, uh, uh, needless uh, uh, bending over to the right? Building trust as they've been doing by taking executive action on police reform. Yeah, exactly. As Nutt says, the Walgreens CEO literally lied. Yeah, and he had to cop to it. He had to, he had to cop to the fact that actually, no, they ended up spending more money trying to crack down on shoplifting uh, than they would have if they hadn't made a big deal about shoplifting. He lied completely and misrepresented why they were struggling, when in reality, they were struggling because their competition was beating them. And right-wingers have run with this. They quoted, they've quoted this, this Walgreens CEO forever. And of course, they never update their information because they don't actually care about the issue. It's just really weird. It's really weird to hear Democrat President Joe Biden, you know, uh, uh, Chairman Joe, talking about how he wants to give communities the tools to crack down on retail theft. More retro with the $2 super chat. Thank you very much. Says, yeah, what about paycheck and crimes against workers? That's a good question. What about pay theft? Wage theft? 
He doesn't care about that, apparently, and whatever. He's calling for it to be the law of the land. <laughs> Directing my cabinet to review the federal classification of marijuana and expunging thousands of convictions for the mere possession, because no one should be jailed for simply using or have it on their record. Four years you had to do that. Why? Why? And also, listen to the caveats there. Oh, we... Let's, let's, let's listen through that again. What are the caveats he's got here? I'm going to direct my cabinet to review the federal possession rules because no one should be jailed for simply having or using uh, uh, marijuana on their record. Hmm. That seems like one of those situations, man. Weed is pretty fucking popular in the United States and always has been. It was always insane to do the drug war against marijuana. It's very obvious that marijuana was being used as a way to essentially arrest whoever the fuck you want for an incredibly commonplace drug that is less damaging than fucking alcohol. Oh, this is just pathetic. I don't know. Does anybody, honest, honest question, okay? I know I've yelled at a lot of people. I'm not gonna yell at anyone, I promise. I'm not gonna melt down, I'm chill. I've calmed myself, all right? I've gained, regained control, okay? But honestly, I saw people on Twitter talking about that they felt this was good. Is anybody here really feeling energized or motivated by this for real? I, I promise I won't even get mad about it, okay? I just, I, I really don't believe it's better than it could have been. Okay, that's fair. I mean, yeah, it always, it always could be worse. There's a few zingers. Yeah, I feel that. I certainly feel energized. Okay, well, I might have energized you. It was good optics. Do, you, do we think it was good optics for real? I don't think there was a lot of, I don't know. I guess it depends on the optics. I don't think it was good optics for his own voter base. His own voter base isn't motivated by cracking down on crime. They're not motivated by him saying he's going to make a tough, tough border deal. Lucy says, not going to lie. Lucy, for obvious reasons. By the way, Lucy, it's great to see you. I'm sorry I was ragingly mad when you came in and I didn't catch you. Welcome to the stream. Wonderful to see you. Lucy's not going to lie. For obvious reasons, likes the parts when he says Ukraine needs aid. Okay, yeah. I, I, did, I did think that he did a pretty good job on that part overall. It wasn't complete garbage. All right. That's awesome, Smelody. I'm happy that I was able to do that. It's kind of a shit show either way. For normies, the more conservative stuff probably came off as normal politician shit, maybe. Frost Throne says, I hope this is not ageist of me, but I wasn't expecting him to have enough stamina to last through the whole speech. So honestly, he exceeded my expectations. What I'm getting from this is I feel that the bar is very low for Joe, which to me, that's a kind of a bad sign, right? Like if the bar is so low that people didn't think he was going to be able to get through a one hour speech, to me, that feels like we're already in the bucket, you know, and that him crossing that bar is not a big thing. I saw people being like, Joe's on fire tonight. And I was like, what? really? And now that I've seen it, I'm like, where was he on fire? Because I haven't seen a part where he's been on fire. He did make a few quips, but quips don't make a good State of the Union. Okay, I'll watch this afterwards. save your rage for dark souls oh there's no fucking chance we're we're gonna do dark souls tonight honestly i'm so pissed off right now i've considered that i should just end stream after this <laughs> oh when i was a senator so we can finally finally we'll see i don't know maybe maybe we'll keep going i don't know finally end the scourge against women in america Brutus Magnus had said, watching this on my wo my own, watching it on Dylan Burns' stream, and watching it on De Demon Mama's stream all feel very different. Well, I mean, that's probably a good sign, right? Because that means that you're getting different perspectives. Um, 
I imagine Dylan was probably very positive about this because Dylan is very, very invested in, in the uh, the issue on Ukraine, which uh, admittedly, while I think that uh, I think he took probably the best position that the president of the United States could. Um, that's not my number one issue that I cover. Um, so it's not it's you know, I'm not as invested as someone like Dylan. But I understand why people would be invested in that and why they would see that as a solid option. Vosh was right to get drunk as shit before watching this. <laughs> Did he get drunk as shit? Nuts says, nowadays I just watch Demon Mama and Vosh. I used to watch like 10 streamers constantly. I just couldn't do it anymore. Also, Twitch Twitch poll kind of died in 2021. Yeah, it did. And also, trying to keep up with 10 streamers is kind of hard. I'm honored, Nuts. Despite our various contentions, we also have a lot of good times, Nuts. I'm always happy to have you here. He was pretty sloshed. Well, that sounds kind of fun, I guess. Lucy says, Lucy feels invested in Ukraine since Lucy has people who have relatives fighting and got awarded. And also if Ukraine loses, Lucy's place might be next. Uh, it's not out of the question. Yeah, I, I can understand that completely. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't know. Right now, the Ukraine thing is basically it is just a simple, uh, it is a it is a simple Republican versus Democrat issue. Uh, Republicans are pro Putin because of the Donald Trump cult, and Democrats are pro Ukraine. It's that simple. Uh, lefties, the the like anti Ukraine lefties are not a significant portion of a, of of any real political power, so you don't really have to worry about that. Uh, that said, you know, so there's not, I don't know, there's not all that much I can say about that particularly. He gave the, ex the response that I expected that he would give. Um, but yeah. Anyway, let's continue. Let's finish this out. We got to finish this shit up. There are other kinds of violence I want to stop. With us tonight is Jasmine, who's nine year old. Uh, Lucy says, not, not all Republicans are pro-Putin, more like the MAGA section. The MAGA section is the ruling party of the Republicans. Yes, there are dissenters, but they do not have, like the dissenters to the MAGA cult are not very well organized and they are losing badly. Um, it the The Republican, the, the Republican primaries went exactly as I predicted. Uh, the Republic, the, the like the, the, the path to presidency was identical to what I predicted, which is obviously no one is going to unseat Donald Trump. They're all going to get humiliated. None of them even came close. Most of them uh, under underdid their own expectations. They underdid everyone else's expectations. MAGA, the MAGA movement rules the Republican Party right now. They have the power and they continue to have that. So, yeah, um, it, while it's true that there are dissenters among the Republicans, that doesn't matter for as long as the MAGA, the MAGA section maintains control and they're nowhere near even remotely being out of power. It could be possible that if Donald Trump kicks the bucket um, that, uh, you know, that the MAGA gets scattered, but the MAGA movement in its current form is the dominant faction in the Republican Party. Yeah. Thank you so much, Buck Moon. I really appreciate that. I kind of, I don't know. We'll talk after. We'll continue this. Arlo says, Demon Mom is the only streamer I still watch. Well, that's good. The, the, there is still a, uh, there is still a, a light shining. You're going to hate me for that one, but, you know, cope. Uh, more retro with the $10 says, I am still riding with Biden because of living through DeSantis. We have no choices, but I'm getting Nikki Fried flat flashback. 
Leftist dialogue makes me want to run Charlie C. Nikki Fried overview stream, please. I don't know what the Charlie C. Nikki Fried overview stream is, but uh, I completely get it. I understand people who want Biden to win. I would prefer if Joe Biden wins. In fact, a lot of my critiques, you'll notice, are centered around the fact that I think that Joe Biden is going to make himself lose. But at the end of the day, I don't have Biden's ear. All I can do is shine a light on what is and how it's unfolding and hopefully convince people to move, to adopt a politics that is significantly deeper than just electoral politics. Which is, by the way, why you should press subscribe on my channel. One of the many reasons. You get to see me make jokes. You get to see me rage out once in a great while. You get to hear me talk about this stuff. And you can learn more about what I think about politics and how I think my unique approach to politics can genuinely encourage people to make better decisions. I think a lot of people spend a lot of their time watching the machinery of electoral politics and not a lot of time actually thinking about what ways they can actually affect that and also acknowledging the ways in which they can't and what they should be doing instead. You'll notice that a lot of the time that I spend talking about politics on this channel is not talking about electoral politics. It's talking about political questions with the goal of getting people to think. It's talking about how people can actually build their own and grow their own political power. You know, it's not just we do t take time out of our day to occasionally watch stuff like this, but um, most of what I do when I talk about politics is get people's brains flowing on different topics so that they can self-empower, so they can connect with other people and build alliances that will help them keep alive and well and thrive even in hard times. Um, political alienation, social alienation is a gigantic weak spot for everyone. I mean, for everyone but for everyone outside of the right. The right has stringent structures that force people and often miserably into contact with one another, but they do work. And the left side of the sphere uh, has increasingly over the years suffered from more and more political and social alienation. And this is partially because of the dominance of liberal politics, liberal models of politics, which tell you that your job is to sit there and watch a machine that you have no real say in, you know? And and then feel bad about it or get mad at other people about how they respond to the machine that none of you have an effect on. There's this there's this like it's almost like there's like a like a I don't know. It's like the liberal mode of politics wants you to treat politics like a movie that you watch and then you argue about your theories about the movie. But at the end of the day, the movie is the movie. You can't change the movie on the screen. And I want to challenge people to, to change their approach to that. By the way, if that sounds like something you'd like, press subscribe down below. That's why you got to subscribe. And also make sure you press like. <sighs> All right, let's continue. Let's continue. Sister Jackie was murdered with 21 classmates and teachers in elementary school in Uvalde, Texas. Very soon after that happened, Jill and I went to Uvalde for a couple of days. We spent hours and hours with each of the families. We heard their message. So everyone in this room, in this chamber, could hear the same message. The constant refrain, and I was there for hours meeting with every family. They said, do something. Do something. Well, I did do something by establishing the first ever Office of Gun Violence Prevention in the White House, that the Vice President is leading the charge. Thank you for doing it. Yeah. Meanwhile, <laughs> meanwhile, my predecessor told the NRA he's proud he did nothing on guns when he was president. Oof. After another shooting in Iowa, 
recently, he said, when asked what to do about it, he said, just get over it. There is his quote, just get over it. I say, stop it. Stop it, stop it, stop it. <clears throat> I'm proud we beat the NRA when I signed the most significant gun safety law in nearly 30 years because of this Congress. We now must beat the NRA again. I'm demanding a ban on assault weapons and high-capacity magazines. Pass universal background checks. None of this. None of this. I taught the Second Amendment for 12 years. None of this violates the Second Amendment or vilifies responsible gun owners. You know, as we manage challenges at home, we're also managing crises abroad, including in the Middle East. I know the last five months have been gut-wrenching for so many people, for the Israeli people, for the Palestinian people, and so many here in America. Oh, boy. This crisis began on October 7th with a massacre by a terrorist group called Hamas, as you all know. 1,200 innocent people, women and girls, men and boys, slaughtered after enduring sexual violence. The deadliest day of the, for the Jewish people since the Holocaust. And 250 hostages taken. Here in this chamber tonight are families whose loved ones are still being held by Hamas. I pledge to all the families that we will not rest until we bring every one of your loved ones home. We also... <clears throat> Yeah, also, it should be noted, let's just, let's not forget, okay, that the U.S. ally, Benjamin Netanyahu, has not only gone against the advice of the international community, but also the families of those hostages, and has put, and in fact, likely killed some of those hostages in his insane war against the Palestinian people. So it's all nice and good for Joe Biden to talk about those hostages who are no doubt in a terrifying and horrifying situation. But it, it rings very hollow when he has willingly and unequivocally stood by the side of a, of a guy who has thrown their lives away. Oh yeah, this is super interesting. Here you go, just real quick, just a, just a real quick nice little note, by the way. Today, Netanyahu, this was just 10 hours ago, Netanyahu vows to defy Biden's red line and invade Rafa. You know, it's very interesting that Joe Biden has spent the last few months enabling this murderous, genocidal, race-purging fucking psychopath. And all he can say is sort of a weak, oh, it's so sad for those people who were hurt. And just days after the State of the Union, Netanyahu just openly states, yeah, fuck you, buddy, I'm not listening to you. The reality, of course, is that Joe Biden has basically been, you better not. Joe Biden has power. America has incredible power over Israel that they could flex and they aren't. Because Joe would rather be like, you better not do that, bucko. It will also work around the clock to bring home Evan and Paul, Americans being unjustly detained by the Russians and others around the world. Israel has the right to go after Hamas. Hamas ended this conflict by releasing hostages, laying down arms, could end it by, by releasing the hostages, laying down arms, and sur surrendering those responsible for October 7th. But Israel has a... Ha ha excuse me. Israel has a 
added burden because Hamas hides and operates among the civilian population like cowards under hospitals, daycare centers, and all the like. Oh, dude, he's literally just doing... Ant he's just doing fucking propaganda right now. So does fucking the Israeli military. Th they literally used civilian shields. We have video evidence that has been seen by the UN of the Israeli military kidnapping Palestinian civilians, uninvolved civilians, and using them as, as hostages, as human shields. Dude, this is terrible. This is fucking terrible. Israel also has a fundamental responsibility, though, to protect innocent civilians in Gaza. That ship fucking sailed. What is the what is the civilian death count right now? Let's just get a quick update. According to PBS, let's see, this was on February 19th. So that's a month ago. That's too old. What's the most recent one? I want to see if we can find the most recent one. From the first of this month, the BBC estimates more than 30,000 Palestinian civilians have now been killed in Gaza. Appro approximately 1.3% of the total population. And that's from the beginning of this month, and that's an estimate. NPR says official number on the 29th of February is 30,035 deaths. That is the most reliable one available. And the article leads by saying this is a this is known to be an incomplete count. That is just the known confirmed deaths. Unbelievable. That ship has sailed. Saying it like this in and of itself is disgusting apologia. Saying Israel has the responsibility to protect innocent civilians in Gaza when there are 30,000 dead already? Uh, I don't know. <clears throat> Do you guys, do you guys see why I've gotten so mad? I, I know, I don't want to harp on this. I really did lose my shit earlier and I was a little unfair, okay? And I, and I feel bad about it. I do feel bad. I shouldn't have gotten so fucking mad. But also, do you guys see why I get so fucking mad about this? Do you understand why I get so goddamn pissed off about this guy? The guy that for the last four fucking years even after he was elected, libs have been forcing this motherfucker down our throats. You better be ready to vote for him again. You better be ready. It's going to be the end. And no matter the, the nightmare, no matter the, the fucking pathetic bullshit that he pulls, you are told if you so much as criticize him, you're doing something wrong. You guys see John Fetterman saying that, uh, that people who voted... Uh, uncommitted in a primary in the Democratic primary we're, we're, we're helping to elect Trump that fucking ghoul this is why I get so fucking pissed this is why it gets me so goddamn This war and these fucking clapping seals obligated to clap. Mithra with the 10 pounds says Owen Jones, probably the best Western journalist on Palestine, estimates 40,000 deaths so far. Thank you very much for supporting the show. I really do appreciate that. That is wild.
has taken a greater toll on innocent civilians than all previous wars in Gaza combined. More than 30,000 Palestinians have been killed, most of whom are not Hamas. Thousands and thousands of innocents, women and children, girls and boys, also orphaned. Nearly two million more Palestinians under bombardment or displacement. Homes destroyed, neighbors in rubble, cities in ruin. Families out food, water, medicine. It's heartbreaking. I've been working nonstop to establish an immediate ceasefire that would last for six weeks to get all the prisoners released, all the hostages released, to get the hostages home and ease the intolerable and have a humanitarian crisis and build toward an enduring, a more something more enduring. The United States has been leading international efforts to get more humanitarian assistance to Gaza. Tonight, I'm directing the U.S. military to lead an emergency mission to establish a temporary pier in the Mediterranean on the coast of Gaza that can receive large shipments carrying food, water, medicine, and temporary shelters. No U.S. boots will be on the ground. A temporary pier will enable a massive increase in the amount of humanitarian assistance getting into Gaza every day. Why did it, why did it do that? Why does it say that? A pillow, great to see you. Thanks for coming by. I, I don't want to even make a joke in this part. I don't got any jokes in me. I I just noticed that and it is kind of funny that it says the mommy resistance. I don't I don't get it. And Israel must do its part. Israel must allow more aid into God to ensure humanitarian workers aren't caught. Arlo in YouTube says, uh, the, U the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs says 100,000 people injured, missing, or dead in Gaza. 100,000 people injured, missing, or dead. Let's hear what else he has to say. In the crossfire. And they're announcing they're going to they're going to have a crossing in northern Gaza. To the leadership of Israel, I say this. Humanitarian assistance cannot be a secondary consideration or a bargaining chip. Protecting and saving innocent lives has to be a priority. As we look to the future, the only real solution to the situation is a two-state solution over time. <clears throat> And I say this, as a lifelong supporter of Israel, my entire career, no one has a stronger record with Israel than I do. I challenge any of you here. I'm the only American president of Israel in wartime. But there is no other path that guarantees Israel's security and democracy. There is no other path that guarantees Palestinians can live in peace with, with peace and dignity. There's no other path that guarantees peace between Israel and all of its neighbors, including Saudi Arabia, with whom I'm talking. Creating stability in the Middle East also means containing the threat posed by Iran. That's why I built a coalition of more than a dozen countries to defend international shipping and freedom of navigation in the Red Sea. I've ordered strikes to degrade the Houthi capability and defend U.S. forces in the region. As Commander-in-Chief, I will not hesitate to direct further measures to protect our people and our military personnel. <clears throat> okay, so I think we've got what he has to say about Gaza, which is that he wants to call for a six-week ceasefire after we're already at, already at 100,000 injured, missing, or dead, and that he wants to establish a peer and I was sent a, a, a link, um, which this is from the Times of Israel. The Times of Israel. Biden says Israel will secure a new Gaza pier. Pentagon, it may take two months to build. So two more months before his pier idea will even come into effect. Now, I have seen photos of parachuted supplies that Biden has dropped in. 
and there was an incredible photo. Uh, I wonder if I can find it. Um, I want to see if I can find this photo. I didn't have it on hand. There was a photo that showed both supplies raining in and bombardment from Israel at the same time. I want to see if I can find, hold on, let's see. Oh man, there's so many photos of the supply drops. There was one where you could see uh, the clouds of bombardment at the same time as the, uh, the airdrop supplies were coming in. I don't know if I'm going to be able to find it now. Oh, that sucks. Regardless, it was a it was a great visual representation of the uh, current situation. And of course, I'm not going to say that it's obviously. I think it's a good thing that Biden was willing to dr airdrop supplies into the um, desperate and starving people uh, in Gaza, but uh, it all just feels like way too little, way too late. When you were not willing to, to, to make that step until there were 100,000 missing, injured, and dead, until you got to the, the official count of around 30,000 people dead, like, and, and the entire time you were saying we are not going to budge in supporting Netanyahu while Netanyahu has been spitting in the face of the world, it really does come off as too little too late. And I'm happy to hear that he's proposing a ceasefire, but I want to see what he means when he says proposing, because if he just says it in the State of the Union, that's not good enough. And, this, and that's not going to be good enough for his electorate either. His voter base is not going to be okay with him just saying it in a speech. This is one of the issues that Democratic voters are most activated on. This is one of the issues in which he has alienated so, so much of his voter base. Because as it turns out, people take the topic of genocide seriously. And, and some people out there might take objection to me saying the word genocide, but I don't hesitate to say the word genocide in this particular incident. The intent is there, the structure is there, the deaths are there. The, the leadership of Israel has been open in the language that they use, in their intent to, to purge living people from land that they wish to control. And as it turns out, Democratic voters tend to take that issue very, very seriously. So this all comes off as way too little, way too late. All right, let's finish this. For years, I've heard many of my Republican and Democratic friends say that China is on the rise and America's falling behind. They've got it backwards. I've been saying it for over four years, even when I wasn't president. America's rising. We have the best economy in the world. And since I've come to office, our GTP is up, our trade deficit with China is down to the lowest point in over a decade. And we're standing up against China's unfair economic practices. We're standing up for peace and stability across the Taiwan Straits. I revitalized our partnership and alliance in the Pacific. India, Australia, Japan, South Korea, Pacific Islands. I've made sure that the most advanced American technology can't be used in China, not allowing to trade them there. Frankly, for all this tough talk on China, it never occurred to my predecessor to do any of that. I want competition with China, not conflict. And we're in a stronger position to win the conflict of the 21st century against China than anyone else for that matter, than any time as well. Here at home, I've signed over 400 bipartisan bills there's more to pass my unity agenda. Strengthen penalties on fentanyl trafficking. You don't want to do that, huh? 
pass bipartisan privacy that says to protect our children online. Oh, by the way, what he's referencing here, um, oh, what is that called? The online. What is the name of that uh, current law? I always forget this one. Does anybody have the name of that one offhand? It's called like the, the like Keep Children Safe Online Act. Oh my God, it's deranged. Okay, it's one of those. Uh, it's one of those laws that. Uh, it, you remember? Do you guys remember um, SOPA, PIPA, and COSA a couple years ago? Those laws that were like, we need to keep children on safe online. And then it turns out that they were like massive censorship bills that would basically uh, give private corporations and the government the ability to basically strike down anything with very little oversight. Is it COSA? Is that the current one? Is COSA? Maybe that's the one I'm thinking of. Yeah, the COSA, the Kids Online Safety Act. The Co the COSA Act is it is like <laughs> it is it is one of those laws where it's like uh, the name of it. They design it so that if you criticize it, they can be like, "You're crazy! You don't want to protect children." It basically, the COSA Act uh, is is designed to basically force companies to purge anything that is like inappropriate for minors in incredibly broad strokes. It's it's basically uh, uh, it's basically an attempt to. And one of the things that they fixate on is that like they don't want you to be able to like in general access sites. They don't believe you should be able to discuss sexuality, which by the way would mean that basically any channel that is led by a gay person would be targeted by this because uh, I don't know if you guys remember this, but uh, YouTube for a very long time was forcibly and secretly tagging any video made by any LGBT person as having the topic of sexuality, um, just inherently. Uh, which is one of the main tactics uh, that, that the Republicans like to use now. They like to use a rhetorical tactic of framing anything that has to do with being trans or being gay as inherently sexual and therefore inherently dangerous to minors. Like anything at all. You, a, a trans person working at McDonald's, their existence is sexual and therefore they shouldn't be allowed to do that. And this is, this bill uh, operates using similar language. So it's crazy that Joe Biden is signing off on this type of stuff. Isn't YouTube still doing that? Uh, it's impossible to prove in full at this point, but uh, likely yes. And there has always been an issue with um, uh, extremely hard uh, uh, and unfair judgment of any topic that even remotely touches sexuality and sexual health or um, even just discussions, br like broad discussions of the existence of sexuality or gender identity. Um, these types of laws don't actually protect kids. They only, um, they only damage, they only create uh, a, a carve out for people to be targeted unjustly and then ramp up moral Puritan, uh, um, moral Puritan based um, censorship. The, the goal is like, uh, the goal is to indirectly uh, grant control to the uh, two very specific moral positions, like, for example, Christian morality, uh, with no regard to people's actual rights, and they just use children as an excuse. None of the rules that are put in place here actually protect children. None of them are, are like, like impossible to circumvent. None of them actually give children uh, 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 any real safety. They're just designed to basically give control to the most morally conservative in the country by law. No surprise, really, in this case, that Joe Biden is getting behind of these types of laws. I should do a whole segment on this, honestly. Uh, 
off the cuff right now, uh, I feel like I'm not doing the best job arguing this. So I'll have to do a segment in the future specifically about this bill going into deep detail. But these, um, but the like COSA, SOPA, PIPA, these bills and all of their variants, there have been multiple attempted bills that are like pitched to protect children online. And then you look into the actual bill and it has absolutely nothing to do with actually protecting children. Oh yeah, here's an article from the EFF. Don't fall for the latest changes to the dangerous Kids Online Safety Act. The author of this bill unveiled an amended version, but it's still an unconstitutional censorship bill that continues to empower state officials to target services and online content they don't like. COSA remains a dangerous bill that would allow the government to decide what types of information can be shared and read online by everyone. It would still require an enormous number of websites, apps, and online platforms to filter and block legal and important speech. It would most certainly still result in age verification requirements. Some of its pre uh, provisions have changed over time. Oh, yeah, I think at one point COSA was trying to push through a law that if you wanted to access a porn website at all, you would have to upload your driver's license. Like you would have to, if you want to go as an adult, go to on your computer and watch fucking porn, you would have to upload your driver's license to that fucking website. I'm pretty sure that was in the original text of the older version of the COSA. Is that still in the current version? All right, this is a stun lock, but seriously, it's actually wild. A pillow says that's how it is currently in my state right now in North Carolina. Holy shit. I didn't even realize that North Carolina actually passed that law. That's fucking crazy. That was also passed under the guise of protecting kids. Jesus fucking Christ. That's how it is here in Utah. What the fuck? That's, it's actually insane to me that people are so scared of the existence of pornography that they feel like you need to, in the comfort of your own home, you would need to upload a fucking driver's license to be able to look at porn. That's insane. That's, that's fucking crazy. And of course, a lot, a lot of these laws are designed to be able to take down resources, to be able to, to be able to be used aggressively by people who want to take down resources completely separate from talking about being able to just use your adult right to access the materials that you want online, uh, completely separate from that. These, these laws are also used to be, to basically cater to the lowest common denominator to people who have nothing else better to do than to go online and report websites for being problematic in some way or another, which ultimately uh, will often target, as we've seen with the book banning situation, the book banning situation, all of the book bans were done under the guise of protecting children. And then a handful of, of, of hyper-Christian fundamentalist psychopaths spend all of their time reporting every single book that has even a shred of a gay person appearing in it as dangerous. And all of a sudden, there's no one there to push back because a couple of lifeless freaks backed by fucking coke money or whatever can sit there and spend all day looking for every reference to a gay person in a book and then justify it using their their own personal moral worldview. This is dangerous and the law is there to favor them. All right, let's fucking do this. Let's move on. We got to finish this shit. I've been going for fucking ever. It's Harness. five hours into the stream. Jesus Christ. Harness the promise of AI to protect us from peril. Ban AI voice impersonations and more. And keep our truly sacred obligation to train and equip those we send into harm's way and care for them and their families when they come home and when they don't. <clears throat>
That's why the song Support and Help of Dennis and the VA, I signed the PACT Act. One of the most significant laws ever. Helping millions of veterans expose the toxins who now are battling more than 100 different cancers. Many of them don't come home, but we owe them and their families support. We owe it to ourselves to keep supporting our new health research agency called ARPA-H. And remind us, remind us that we can do big things like end cancer as we know it, and we will. Let me close with this. Yay. I know you don't want to hear any more, Lindsay, but I got to say a few more things. I know it may not look like it, but I've been around a while. <laughs> when you get to be my age, certain things become clearer than ever. I know the American story. Again and again, I've seen the contest between competing forces in the battle for the soul of our nation, between those who want to pull America back to the past and those who want to move America into the future. My lifetime has taught me to embrace freedom and democracy, a future based on core values that have defined America, honesty, decency, dignity, equality, to respect everyone, to give everyone a fair shot, to give hate no safe harbor. Now, other people my age see it differently. The American story of resentment, revenge, and retribution, that's not me. I was born in mid-World War II, when America stood for the freedom of the world. I grew up in Scranton, Pennsylvania, in Claymont, Delaware, among working-class people who built this country. I watched in horror as two of my heroes, like many of you did, Dr. King and Bobby Cunningham, were assassinated. And their legacies inspired me to pr pr pursue a, a career in service. I left the law firm and became a public Bruh. defender because my city of Wilmington was the only city in America occupied by the National Guard Bruh. after Dr. King was assassinated because of the riots. And I became a county councilman almost by accident. I got elected to the United States Senate when I had no intention of running at age 29. Then vice president, our first black president. Now president to the first women vice president. The energy's winding down. The three cars doing it. In my career, I've been told I was too young. <laughs> By the way, they're going to let me on ascended elevators for votes sometime. They're not a joke. And I've been told I'm too old. Whether young or old, I've always been known, I've always known what endures. I've known our North Star. The very idea of America is that we're all created equal and deserves to be treated equally throughout our lives. We've never fully lived up to that idea, but we've never walked away from it either. And I won't walk away from it now. I'm optimistic. I really am. I'm optimistic, Nancy. My fellow Americans, the issue facing our nation isn't how old we are. It's how old are our ideas. Hate, anger, revenge, retribution are the oldest of ideas. But you can't lead America with ancient ideas that only take us back. You lead America, the land of possibilities. You need a vision for the future and what can and should be done. Tonight, you've heard mine. All right, all right, okay. I don't need to hear his last little wrap up here. We gotta do, we gotta make time, okay? Oh, Jesus, what have I done to myself? All right, we have a hot mic Biden a hot mic after the speech people told me to listen to. Let's hear it out.
Don't worry, Mr. President. This is one of the big <laughs> great speeches. I was telling the Secretary, you know, I was in Jordan and uh, Israel last weekend, and we just, you know, we got to keep pushing what we're doing on the humanitarian stuff and all this stuff. So, I told him, baby, show me this. I said, baby, you know, I'm going to come to Jesus. Sure, just, just. I'm not going to go good. That was good. Okay. Okay. He said, we're going to have a come to Jesus moment. Uh, okay. And then he said, oh, I'm on a hot mic. That seems staged. That's a really fucking weird thing to say. And it's also really weird that he goes, oops, I'm on a hot mic. That's good. Okay. We'll see. I'll, I'll believe it when I see it. They, there has Nancy Pelosi did this weird thing too. Nancy Pelosi did this thing where she was like, that BB Netanyahu, I don't even want to call him Mr. Cause I don't even respect him. He's such a naughty boy and I don't like him. And it was, it meant nothing. They didn't do anything. They just kind of said, he's a naughty boy. Ah. And it was just kind of like, oh, okay. Uh, let's see it, dude. You have all the power in this situation. You have all the fucking power. I don't know. All right, let's see the Republican response. It's time for the... Re you guys said this was two minutes. It's 17 minutes. Do you know what that means? It means I have to take a fucking bathroom break. We're going to do the Republican thing. Don't go anywhere. We're doing Republican response to this, and I'm going to play you a killer song. If you haven't heard the bathroom song, you're in for a fucking blast, okay? Okay. Listen to this shit. It's crazy. It's amazing. Hey, Chet, Demon Mama has to go to the bathroom to listen to the Demon Mama bathroom song. She streams 20 hours a day and nine days a week, so let's give her and her bladder a little fucking break. <laughs> In a minute and she's still in the bathroom. I'm not a math whiz, but I can count to two. Let's all calm down and stay on the most while we wait and chat. Maybe someone here also needs a bathroom break. Demon Mama went to the bathroom. Not like I'm counting, but this track that says, so, so, so. so don't you fret my little li list, cause I wrote this track down to give you something bottom while she's taking the break. Christ, can someone go check in the bathroom? I hope she doesn't walk the door. Walk the door. She doesn't walk the door. She walks the door. Get a little
Okay, we're just fucking with me now. Like and subscribe. All right, everybody. My lovely, lovely imps. We have watched the Biden State of the Union. I may have lost my cool at a couple of I may have gone a little too far at a couple of moments. Not against Biden, but against some of Biden's pawns and supporters. And I, I apologize. I apologize. I may have lost my cool. But now we're going to see some other people who have not just lost their cool, but completely lost the plot. And that is the Republicans, okay? The Republicans issued a response to Joe Biden's State of the Union speech. Now, I haven't seen this yet, but I have heard some things about it. So let's find out. Let's watch it together. This is Senator Katie Britt, the Republican response to Joe Biden's State of the Union speech. Let's do this. Let's do this. Wait a second. All right, let's do this. Honor of serving the people of the great state of Alabama and the United States Senate. However, that's not the job that matters most. I am a proud wife and mom of two school-aged kids. My daughter, Bennett, and my son, Ridgeway are why I ran for the Senate. I'm worried about their future. All right, lady. All right, lady. Don't involve us in your xenogender kink, okay? Let's not, let's not, let's not, don't, uh, listen, it's okay. I don't care what you do in the bedroom with your husband, but you know. Future. And the future of children in every corner of our nation and that's why I invited you into our home tonight. Like so many families across America, my husband Wesley and I just watched President Biden's State of the Union address from our living room. And uh, what we saw was the performance of a permanent politician who has actually- Yeah, this is definitely coming off as super authentic, definitely not practiced, no script here, no, nothing fake going on here. No professional politicians going on here. Been in office for longer than I've been alive. Attention, my amazing constituents. You know, I have only ever done anything for the good of my family and the Lord in heaven. And what I saw presented by Joe Biden was a performance only doable by a fake fraudulent politician. And while you might point out that I myself am a politician, I am a different type of politician. And certainly the studio lights and makeup and staging of this set, which is my kitchen, but it's my kitchen and not an actual set, but it's also a set because I clearly have a big camera and lighting and a makeup team here with me. None of the left, pay no attention to any of that. For I am here to tell you that Joe Biden is a faker. Oh God. Dear mama, you're doing more of an impression of, of the orange guy than her. Well, I, I mean, I was, I was doing a, an, a, a parody, okay? I guess it was a bit of an impression. 
I did it wrong. Mine was, wasn't was cringy enough. You have too much confidence. You need to do the fake meek thing. I am just a humble homemaker and and millionaire and um, and politician who's on national television on CNBC right now. And I don't have a platform at all because I am simply a tiny mouse. Oh, come on. Oh, everybody, I can't do it. Fine. You know what? Fuck it. I'm, God damn it. Fuck you, people. One thing was quite clear, though. President Biden just doesn't get it. He's out of touch. Under his administration, families are worse off. Our communities are less safe. And Excuse me. I think I nailed it. She's doing, she's doing basically everything that I was doing. Our families are worse off. Our communities are less safe. Our country is less secure. I just wish he understood what real families are facing around kitchen tables just like this one. You know, this is where our family has tough conversations. It's where we make hard decisions. It's where we share the good, the bad, and the ugly of our days. It's where we laugh together, and it's where we hold each other's hands and pray for God's guidance. And many nights, to be honest, it's- This feels like it could be the intro to like a Tim and Eric bit. Where Wesley and I worry. I know we're not alone. This is where our family discusses difficult issues, like our shortage of eggs. And if it wasn't for the Cinco Me egg, we would never have enough eggs. Now, my husband only has to take one simple pill and he can lay as many eggs as he wants. Our family was going hungry before we had the Me egg. And so tonight, the American family needs to have a tough conversation because the truth is, we're all worried about the future of our nation. The country we know and love seems to be slipping away and it feels like the next generation will have fewer opportunities and less freedoms than we did. Okay, someone needs to tell her that you don't grin like a maniac when you're supposed to be conveying concern for the future. When you're going, the future is dangerous and danger lurks around every corner. Your children might be destroyed. It makes you come off like the one who's going to be destroying them. It kind of makes it seem like you're going to kill people's children. I, yep, yep, I realized what was wrong in my impression. I wasn't doing the psychopathic grin. I worry my own children may not even get a shot at living their American dreams. My American dream allowed me, the daughter of two small business owners from rural enterprise. <laughs> I lived a simple upbringing, the daughter of two boat shop owners, and actually my dad also owned a pool shop. That's also what he did. And I, I didn't have any real opportunities, but the American dream allowed me to become a local politician. Guys, Alabama to be elected to the United States Senate at the age of 40. Growing up, sweeping the floor at my dad's heart. Wait. Wow. I, I actually, I gotta say, credit, I would not have guessed that she was 40. I, I would not have guessed that. Damn. Hardware store and cleaning the bathroom at my mom's dance studio. I never could have imagined what my story would entail. To think about what the American dream can do across to just one generation in just one lifetime. What are you talking about? Your parents owned a hardware store and a dance studio. You're exactly the type of person who would become a fucking senator in Alabama. That is like, that is, that is the, the type, that is the person that becomes a, pro, a career politician. What are you talking about? What do you mean?
That's, a, that's like the most stereotypical background you could possibly have. It's truly breathtaking. The, you cannot tell me this isn't a Tim and Eric or, or, or maybe a Nathan Fielder thing. Oh my God, that's what it is. This comes across as a section from The Curse. But right now, the American dream has turned into a nightmare for so many families. The true- Oh, she got serious. She finally stopped smiling. She hit the part in the script where it said, stop smiling. Unvarnished state of our union begins and ends with this. Our families oh, are Oh, it's hurting. coming back. Our- Why are you smiling when you're saying, our families are hurting. They're gloriously, deliciously hurting. Why? Why would you do that? Why would you do that? <laughs> Our country can do better. And you don't have to look any further than the crisis at our southern border to see it. What? What is this? What? <laughs> Our country can do better. Southern border crisis. Oh my God! It's it's the it's the oblivion uh, uh, dialogue thing. Talk tough to me. I love tough guys. President Biden inherited the most secure border of all time, but minutes oh, yeah? after taking office. He suspended all deportations. He halted construction of the border wall. And he announced a plan to give amnesty to millions. We know that President Biden didn't just create this border crisis. He invited it with 94 executive actions in his first. Oblivion dialogue option, 94 executive actions. Border crisis, children hurting. One hundred days. When I took office, I took a different approach. I traveled to the Del Rio sector of Texas. That's where I spoke to a woman who shared her story with me. You're from Alabama. Why are you going to Texas? You're from fucking Alabama. Pay attention to Alabama. She had been sex trafficked by the cartels starting at the age of 12. She told me not just that she was raped every day, but how many times a day she was raped. The cartels put her on a mattress in a shoebox of a room, and they sent men through that door over and over again for hours and hours on end. We wouldn't be okay with this happening in a third world country. This is the United States of America and it is past. Why, I'm sorry, but why would you do a, a ghoulish grin at any point in this entire section? First of all, Listen, we accelerated from zero to 60 really fucking fast here. And terrible fucking nightmarish stuff like this does happen in the world, okay? But it's a very weird jump to go um, from talking about border policy between Joe Biden and Donald Trump and also just just totally missed stating what actually happened when Joe Biden took office and then jumping immediately into an, uh, an unbelievably graphic uh, story about an anonymous person that she talked to in Texas. All right, let's keep going. It's time, in my opinion, that we start acting like it. Oh, uh-oh. 
Sex trafficking victim says Senator Katie Britt telling her story during the, uh, the, during the State of the Union rebuttal is not fair. The woman whose story Alabama Senator Katie Britt appeared to have shared in the Republican response to the State of the Union as an example of President Joe Biden's failed immigration, immigration policies told CNN she was trafficked before Biden's presidency and said that legislators lack empathy when using the issue of human trafficking for political person, purposes. I hardly ever cooperate with politicians because it seems to me that they only want an image. They only want a photo. And to me, and that to me is not fair. Wow, that is that not true? I work as a spokesperson for many victims who have no voice, and I really would like them to be empathetic. All the governors, all the senators, to be empathetic with the issue of human trafficking because there are millions of girls and boys who disappear all the time. People who are really trafficked and abused, as Britt mentioned. And I think that Britt should first take into account what really happens before telling a story of that magnitude. This happened during Bush Jr.'s presidency. Wow. I mean, that is, of course, just like a Republican politician. Ghoul. Human ghoul. As if the weird, uh, inhuman smiling and hyper-practiced, uh, uh, you know, dialogue was was not enough of a hint that this person is uh, is is functioning on a level of evil uh, that is blatantly visible by their actions. Uh, you know that should that should really sell it home. Jesus Christ. President Biden's border policies are a disgrace. This crisis is despicable, and the truth is, it is almost entirely preventable. From fentanyl poisonings to horrific murders, there are empty chairs tonight at kitchen tables just like this one. I'm not going to lie. I have, I have seen, like, Kingdom Hearts OC reenactment scenes more believable and less wooden than this. Not even joking. Because of President Biden's senseless border policies. Just think about Lake and Riley. In my neighboring state of Georgia, this beautiful 22-year-old nursing student went out on a jog one morning, but she never got the opportunity to return home. She was brutally murdered by one of the millions of illegal border crossers. President- Wait. This is actually a really funny way to, st to tell this story because one out of millions did a crime. It's like in her own speech, she undermines her own point. But again, like the people that she's speaking to are like, they're, they're waiting for activation words. They're, and they're, they're following the like, oh, sad. You know, it's got like the little light that pops on. Sad now, angry now. Biden chose to release into our homeland. Y'all, as a mom, I can't quit thinking about this. I mean, this could have been my daughter. This could have been yours. And tonight- Unironically, literally doing the propaganda video from the beginning of Helldivers 2. Oh, sweet liberty! Sound familiar? This could be your family getting killed by bugs. President Biden finally said her name, but he refused to take responsibility for his own actions. Mr. President, enough is enough. I feel like there's a there's a part of me that resists the urge to do fact checks on this, but I feel like it's a fairly important fact to know whether it's actually true. Was the remember the case has not been proven yet. There is a suspect, but they have not this person has not been proven guilty yet. But is the suspect even 
one of the people that was granted amnesty by Joe Biden? Do we have any idea when they entered the country? Like, what if, um, what, like, what if that guy entered under Trump? Would this all be Trump's responsibility then? And of course the answer is no, these people don't give a fucking shit. They're telling a emotionally, hyper emotionally charged story for the purpose of manipulation. So th that's, this is the reason why the like fact checking thing doesn't even work that well against these people because they don't fucking care anyway. Innocent Americans are dying and you only have yourself to blame. Fulfill your oath of office, reverse your policies, end this crisis and stop the suffering. Sadly, we know that President Biden's failures don't stop there. His reckless spending dug our economy into a hole and sent the cost of living through. OK, but it just didn't. That's just blatantly false, like verifiably false. You don't even have to look far. His there hasn't been any reckless spending under Joe Biden, and it certainly hasn't dug the economy into a hole. Like, yes, cost of living is up, but none of that has literally anything to do with Joe Biden's spending bills. It just literally doesn't. It's just, it's, I, don't, I don't, God, this is crazy. I don't know. I'm not going to sit here and spend a lot of time defending Joe Biden, but this is just crazy talk. This is, this is, this is nutso babble. The it's roof. baby babble. We have the worst inflation in 40 years and the highest credit card debt in our nation's history. Let that sink in. Hardworking families are struggling to make ends meet today. And with soaring mortgage rates and sky high childcare cost. Yeah, um, real quick, I wonder, do you think there might have been um do you think there might have been what the fuck happened? It's it's 2024 now. What happened? 2020, there was something that happened in 2020, and a bunch of people like I feel like a bunch of people died or got sick and the economy was really fucked up and corporations got a fuckload of handouts from the government under Donald Trump. What would the fuck was it? What was it that I was thinking? What the fuck? Oh yeah, COVID. That's right, a global pandemic occurred. And um, yeah, a lot of people are in fucking credit card debt because of that, because we live in goddamn capitalism. And until you actually address the problem of capitalism, and yes, I mean capitalism is a huge problem. D credit as a structure is, is a necessary part of capitalism. It has been a part of capitalism since the beginning of it. You know, you might not really be able to talk about much until you recognize, oh shit, yeah. As it turns out, under capitalism, when there is a massive disaster, people have to go into debt in order to stay alive. You know who didn't have to go into debt in order to stay afloat? Mega corporations, which your guy fucking handed money out like, like, like Pez candy to. Whatever. Let's continue. Idiots. These people are so lost. They're also struggling to how to plan for tomorrow. The American people are scraping by while President Biden proudly proclaims that Bidenomics is working. Goodness, y'all, bless his heart, we know better. I'll never forget stopping at a gas station in Chilton County when he- I, I'm sorry, but I don't feel like even conservative, look, I don't feel like even conservative Christians would buy this shit. This is the most fake shit I've ever seen in my entire life. This is the type of person who would be like, I, I don't know, maybe they will. I guess some people will. The MAGA cult definitely will. But I feel like this comes off as so goddamn fake. I feel like even the Christians I used to know wouldn't buy into this crap. The gentleman working the counter told me that after retiring, 
he had to pick up a job in his 70s so that he didn't have to choose between going hungry or going without his medication. He said, I, I did. That's like, that is like the dream of Republicans, you idiot. Republicans oppose. They literally booed at Joe Biden saying that he passed rules combating big pharma during the thing you're talking about. What are you talking about? Everything right. I did everything I was told to do. I worked hard. I saved. I was responsible. He's not alone. I hear similar concerns from fellow parents, whether I am walking with my friends or whether I'm at my kids' games. But let's be honest, it's been a minute since Joe Biden pumped gas, uh, ran a carpool, or even pushed a grocery cart. Meanwhile, you're having your own little moment there. Biden moment. Well, the rest of us see our dollar and we know it doesn't go as far. We see it every day. And despite what he tells you, our grocery, grocery, grocery cart. communities are not safer. For years, the left- they, they objectively are. They, they just ob objectively are safer. Yes, actually, yes, the murder and crime rates are going down. Violent crime rates are going down. That is a matter of fact. Okay, let's go. Has coddled criminals and defunded the police all while letting repeat offenders walk free. The result is tragic, but foreseeable. From our small towns to America's most iconic city streets, life is getting more and more dangerous. Oh, I can see, I can see she's been watching those TikToks where people find like a candy wrapper next to their car and then it plays scary music and they go, I was almost human trafficked at the Costco parking lot. Boom, 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 boom. And unfortunately, President Biden's weakness isn't just- I was listening to a true crime podcast while walking downtown after hitting the vape pen, and I got so nervous. My town felt so dangerous. What, did anything happen to you, ma'am? No, but I was so scared hurting families here at home. He is making us a punchline on the world stage. Look, where I'm from, your word is your bond. But for three years, the president has demonstrated that America's word doesn't mean what it used to. From abandoning our allies in his disastrous withdrawal from Afghanistan to desperately pushing another dangerous deal with Iran. President Biden has Oh yeah, I forgot. I love that I love it when MAGA idiots do the the coping thing about Iran. The Iran deal was universally agreed upon to be the safest path forward. Donald Trump quite literally his personally Donald Trump's decision to randomly tear up the Iran deal was quite literally one of the worst things that could have ever happened for the safety of the Middle East and the safety of the rest of the world. He basically personally guaranteed that Iran would charge forward developing nuclear, excuse me, nuclear weapons. And they have because he tore up the deal. It was a phenomenally stupid act. These people live in a complete realm of falsehoods. They may as well, they may as well live in uh, a Pee Wee's fucking playhouse. They may as well live in the goddamn Lord of the Rings. They don't live in reality. They don't engage with reality and they don't care to. Failed. We've- Our world is so dangerous. Every day when I walk outside in my population 200 town, I feel terrified because of the criminals that I've never encountered, but that I've heard are coming to get me. We've become a nation in retreat. And the enemies of freedom, they see an opportunity. 
Putin's brutal aggression in Europe has put our allies on the brink. Iran's terrorist proxies have slaughtered Israel. Wait. Wait, what? Did she mix up her lines there? She's supposed to be ant. She's supposed to be pro Putin. Uh oh. Oops. She did a slip up. That's what Joe Biden said. Oh, she just agreed with Joe Biden. Oh shit. Bra Dark Brandon rising. Really choose and American citizens. They've targeted commercial shipping, and they've attacked our troops nearly 200 times since October, killing three U.S. soldiers and two Navy SEALs. Meanwhile, the Chinese Communist Party is undercutting America's workers. China is buying up our farmland, spying on our military installations, and spreading propaganda through the likes of TikTok. You see, the CC. Oh man, conservatives, they're so fucking funny. These guys, okay, keep in mind that people like this bitch here, these people make their kids ins install apps on their phone that are called things like Sky Angel, God's social network. And it'll be an app where the only thing that you can get is like Veggie Tales memes and uh, bi Bible verses every single day in your in your DM invo inbox sent to you by various angels. When I was, let me just tell you a quick story about uh, the type of, of propaganda that these people love, okay? When I was a kid, it, growing up in a super, super Christian uh, uh, cult, one of the most popular products that was going around the church was a, um, was a, set top box, you know, like a cable box. I know they're not very popular anymore, but we used to have this thing back in the day. We used to have this thing called cable and you'd have a little box on top and they had this thing called sky angel. And it had a whole bunch of, of, of movies, uh, uh, basically not like, like preloaded, but it had like, uh, it had data files for movies and you could put the, the box, you could attach the box to a TV, a pay-per-view or whatever, or you could attach it to a DVD player and you could put in a movie like say The Matrix. And what it would do is it would automatically censor problematic content in those movies at strategic times. So you'd set up the little sky box thing, the sky angel box, and you'd be like The Matrix. Then you'd put The Matrix in, you'd press play on it, and then it would start. And it would do things like, it would be like, uh, you know, Neo, he'd be like, you're a real son of a, and then it would blank it out and say clown on the screen instead. And it would do that for whatever movie you set it to. That's the type of stuff that the like Christian, Christian hardliners like this person, these, these super, you know, super Republican conservative Christian types. That's the type of a uh, propaganda they love feeding to their children. And then they're like, TikTok exists and it's, Chinese communist propaganda. Son of a biscuit. That's another common one. I'll, sho I'll shove it up your toe, you son of a clown. That was one that was really popular. We used to say that all the time when I was in Christian school. People would say that. Shove it up your toe, you son of a clown, as a joke. He knows that if it conquers the minds of our next generation... It conquers America. And what does President Biden do? Well, he bans TikTok for government employees, but. Okay, but th th this is really not landing well. Whoopsies, whoopsies. Also the reason why TikTok was banned for government employees is because TikTok had severe data leak issues. Which, by the way, there are a lot of apps that should be banned for that. Uh, I feel like they're being a little selective. Uh, Twitter is a kind of not so great on the data safety front. I have a feeling that one's going to be banned for government employees soon, too. Creates an account for his own campaign. Y'all, you can't make this stuff up. Look. 
We all recall when presidents <sighs> faced national security threats with strength and resolve. That seems like ancient history. Right now, our commander in chief is not in command. <gasps> the free world deserves better <gasps> than a dithering and diminished leader. America <laughs> deserves a dithering and diminished leader. Oh my God. Deserves leaders who recognize that secure borders, diminished. stable prices, safe streets, and a strong defense are actually the cornerstones of a great nation. Just ask yourself, are you better off now than you were three years ago? Me? There's I am, for sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing better than I was three years ago, for sure. I don't know. I think a lot of people probably aren't. But also... Um, I, I have a feeling a lot of people felt like they were doing a lot better once D Donald Trump left. I bet a lot of people would have responded to that, but I mean, whatever. Let's continue. No doubt we're at a crossroads, and it doesn't have to be this way. She did the she hit us with the Kubrick stare? She did! Wait, my hair is in the way. Hold on, my hair was in the way. Oh my God, why? Why does it keep getting in the way? There's no doubt we're at a crossroads and it doesn't have to be this way. We all feel it. But here's the good news. We, the people, are still in the driver's seat. We get to decide whether our future will grow brighter or whether we'll settle for an America in decline. Well, I know which choice our children deserve, and I know the choice the Republican Party is fighting for. We are the party of hard-working parents and families and we want to give you and your children the opportunities to thrive. And we want- You know what? You know, that, so true. <laughs> so true. So true. You know, my favorite, my favorite hardworking parent moment was when uh, Donald Trump spent all that time with Jeffrey Epstein. <laughs> or maybe that time when uh, Matt Gates. Uh, what did Matt Gates do again? Oh yeah, when Matt Gates was finding underage women to invite to his weird parties and offer them money for sex. <laughs> Allegedly. <laughs> Hardworking parent, am I right? Mo, what about uh what about when Jim Jordan covered up all that shit? Remember all that child molestation uh shit that was going on? Remember, remember that? Jim Jordan, hardworking parent right there want families to grow. It's why we strongly support continued nationwide access to in vitro fertilization. We want to help loving moms and dads bring precious life into this world. Wesley and I believe there is no greater blessing in life than our children. And that's why tonight I want to make a direct appeal to the parents out there and in particular to my fellow moms, many of whom I know will be up tossing and turning at 2 a.m., wondering how you're going to be in three places at once and then somehow still get dinner on the table. Uh, maybe, if you, maybe if you had a hardworking Democrat husband who also uh, didn't think it was gay to help around the house, maybe you wouldn't have to worry about being in three places at once. You know, just saying. Or maybe a wife, you know, you could consider that too, you know. What, think about it this way. If, if women can be in three places at once to deliver for their kids, imagine what two women can do together. Just saying, just saying. First of all, we see you. 
we hear you and we <laughs> wow that's a bold move a bold move to break out the democrat line of we see you we hear you what is this timeline oh stand with you i know you're frustrated I know you're probably disgusted by most of what you see going on in Washington, and I'll be really honest with you, you're not wrong for feeling that way. Look, I get it. The I'm gonna tell you exactly how you feel, and then I'm gonna tell you that you're right to feel exactly how I told you how to feel. Who wrote this? I, at first I wondered, at first I was wondering why the hell did CNBC let this air? And now I'm realizing why CNBC let this air, because it is one of the most embarrassing and cringe things I can possibly imagine. And by comparison, it does actually make Joe Biden's State of the Union seem better. This is Democrat propaganda right here. This is this is deep Democrat sleeper cell. This is this is lib 40, 40 chess. Ask in front of us isn't an easy one, but I can promise you one thing it is worth it. So I am asking you for the sake of your kids and your grandkids, get into the arena. Every generation has been called to do hard things. American greatness rests in the fact that we always answer that call. We always answer the call to, to, to run a hardware store slash dance studio. We always answer the call to be petty business, small business tyrants. We always answer the call to write the fakest, most condescending message we possibly ever could. It's who we are. Never forget, we are steeped in the blood of patriots who over what i don't think that's the turn of phrase <laughs> it just got really bloodborne in here <laughs> what the fuck i am steeped in the delicious the fragrant blood of champions i mean patriots through the most powerful empire in the world. We walk in the footsteps of pioneers who take- They didn't. Wait, they didn't, they didn't overthrow an empire. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? The, the, the British Empire still exists. They currently have a reigning monarch. There is a current emperor of the British Empire right now, currently. You didn't overthrow it. You made a new empire on, a, a, you know, you resisted territorial holdings for sure, yeah. But what are you talking about? They didn't overthrow the empire. What the fuck is going on? We now carry forward the same flame of freedom as the liberators of an oppressed Europe. We continue to- <laughs> Wait! <laughs> Holy shit! She actually thinks- Wait a minute, she actually thinks that Americans uh, liberated Europe? What are you talking about? We now carry forward the same flame of freedom as the liberators of an oppressed Europe. <laughs> What are you talking about? <laughs> this is incredible. I didn't ex I didn't think we were going to get into like old history memes at the end. Remember how I said that these people may as well live in Lord of the Rings? We carry the same flame as the hobbits that dropped the ring into Mount Doom. We carry the light that brought Gandalf back from the grave. And we share the feathers of the great eagles that carried us to our destination, back to our home in the Shire. We continue to draw courage from those who bent the moral arc of the universe. And when we gaze upon the heavens... She just... 
<laughs> when you when you walk when you just walk out of Dune Two, I will bend the moral arc of the universe. I will bring glorious jihad to all of the known stars in the name of my father, Duke Leto Atreides. Never forget that our DNA contains the same ingenuity that put man on the moon. America has been tested before and every single time We've emerged unbowed and unbroken. Our history has been written with the grit of men and women who got knocked down. But we know their story. They should have gotten knocked up. Because they did not stay down. We are here because they stood back up. So now That's what Joe Biden said. Why are you repeating his logic? Why are you repeating his line? He was the one who said, I get knocked down, I get up again. That's what he said. It's our turn, our moment to stand up and prove ourselves worthy of protecting the American dream. Together, we can reawaken the heroic spirit of a great nation. Because America, we don't just have a rendezvous with destiny. We take destiny's hand and we lead it. What? I'm sorry. Huh? What? Can we hear that again? the heroic spirit of a great nation. Because America, we don't just have a Iran- Okay, okay, I'm sorry, but delivering this with like the, delivering this with the intonation of like a, a like an antidepressant ad. Here in America, we don't just brighten your day, we brighten your life. Da 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 Try and brightify. Side effects include. That's a very weird way to, to do this. Rendezvous with destiny. We take destiny's hand. I'm I'm waiting. I'm just waiting for the oh 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 Zambic. Bring it in right here. Hit me with it. I'm ready. And we lead it. Our future starts around kitchen tables, just like this with moms and dads just like you and you are why i believe with every fiber of my being that despite the current state of our union our best days are still ahead wait our best days are wait a second hold on a second wasn't that the I feel like there was a campaign that used that one. And I, I don't think. That was a joke. That was from a Joe Biden speech. That was you. Can, this is from a Joe Biden speech. I just searched a uh, political slogan. Our best day days are still ahead. And it's all from Joe Biden speeches from four years ago. What the fuck? Did Kim Guilfoyle also say that? The first results say it was Joe Biden. Anyway, whatever, let's go. May God bless you and may God continue to bless these United States of America. Oh, oh, she's struggling to hold it. Oh my God. They, oh, they really did her dirty with this. 10 seconds of holding on that. Watch, oh my God. Can you see the fault lines forming? Oh my God, this is amazing.
incredible. We got a 30 second clip of conservatives reacting to it. All right, let's hear. We got I want to see what the conservatives have to say about it. Okay, let's see it. This is the this is an American uh, conservative show. Let's see it. Let's see what they have to say. May God bless you and may God continue to bless these United States of America. I don't, I, I'm sure she's I'm a very, fan of her. I'm sure she's very nice. May God bless you. <laughs> Holy shit, that's so good. Oh, that's, ah, almost knocked over my own goddamn. Hold on, I want to see something. It looks like there's a bunch of these. Hold on, I want to see. I want to see this. I want to see what other people have to say. Now I'm. Now I'm in for it. Ooh. It was an excellent choice to deliver the response to the State of the Union. At 42 years oh, old, she's the. Chris Hayes has got a million quotes. Oh, I want to hear the quotes, please. Let me see it. Youngest Republican woman ever elected to the Senate. The first woman senator from Alabama. It's a mother of two. She's married to a former NFL player. She's widely considered to be a rising political star with genuine political acumen. Senator Lindsey Graham of South Carolina even suggested that, quote, she represents the future of the Republican Party. The party clearly expected her to knock it out of the park. New York Times reports that a close ally of Senator Britt sent talking points to conservative influencers ahead of the speech, suggesting words of praise, including, quote, she came off like America's mom. She gets it. They compared her response to Ronald Reagan's famous Berlin Wall speech and described it as reminiscent of his message of that shining city on a hill. Before she uttered a single word, the author of these talking points declared that Brit's speech was pitch perfect. And for the first 60 seconds or so of the speech, it seemed fine. She was smiling at her kitchen table, talking about the future of America. But it quickly took a real turn. We see you. We hear okay, you. Okay, so so far this is just... And oh. we stand with you. The Daily Beast described the speech as, quote, bizarrely delivered with an over-the-top dramatic cadence that left political operatives and observers struggling to make sense of it. The performance was so bad that Republicans, some Republicans watched the high-profile speech with a grimace. According to one strategist, Here everyone's effing losing. This is what I want to see. I want to see the Republican reactions. Let's do it. Conversation was similar on social media where conservative activist Charlie Kirk received a lot of replies to his post asking his followers if they liked. Hold on. I want to find this. Sorry, everybody. I, I want to find this for myself. Charlie Kirk. Charlie Kirk. I got to find this tweet for myself. All right, let's do it. Let's see it. Let's do it live. We're doing it live. Here we go. Charlie Kirk, did you like Katie Britt's speech? Man, it was so disappointing. It was horrible. Good job, Republicans. You sure sent us your best. Jesus, that was bad. I tuned out after 40 seconds. It was like an actress trying to get the part in a big new movie. No, it sounded like a teenager crying to her parents at about a bad day at school. I didn't watch it. Listening to Tucker J Carlson interview Alex Jones. Content was spot on and I do like her. Delivery was a bit too dramatic. No, very babysitter reading a bedtime story. Why does the GOP have such a hard time getting someone to do a rebuttal? Unfortunately, no. It started with the right tone, but after the first two minutes, it needed to shift to a brighter and more inspirational message. Instead, we got a B-grade Hallmark movie moment with an unknown actress playing the lead. <laughs> The up and down emotions was bizarre. No, the delivery was ridiculous. It was awful. Way too, too dramatic. Oh, that's Laura Loomer. No, the weird breathy almost whispers and awkward smiling while discussing terrible things happening were very off-putting. Awful. Annoying. 
Uh oh. Uh oh. Nick Fuentes. Oh shit. Fuentes didn't like it either. Oh no. Hey, we got one positive person. Yes, she did a great job. Oh, two positive ones. I cried for the entirety of Katie Britt's speech, which was refreshing after laughing for the entirety of Joe Biden's uh, State of the Union. It was forced and ineffective. I get why they brought her on, but I think it missed the mark. I did. It was real. Damn, Delta Dawn. Thanks for the positivity. It was painful to watch Boo from Bertha Jane. Wow. I'm sorry, but no. I'm a fan. She had a great message, but I didn't completely buy into the emotions. She came off as creepy, over overacting. Hell no. It already won the 2024 Razzie. That was the worst State of the Union rebuttal I've ever watched. She had the same tone and substance of my Sunday school teacher, and I was eight at the time. It was awful. This Republican response lady is super creepy. No, we're not 12-year-olds. Oh, Gary Bernstein liked it. Vice President Katie Britt. Doesn't seem authentic. She was awful. No, it was horrid. It was so disappointing. Wrong in every way. It was horrible. Absolutely horrible. I feel it was uniparty sabotage by putting her on. Holy shit. That's what I said. It was lib 40 chess. Wow. They hate her. Wow, they fucking hate her. That's incredible. God damn. Well, well, I guess we caught it. I guess we've seen it all now. Oh, I want to see what the... Oh, wait, there's one last thing we can do. Good evening. I want to see the comments. Oh my God, the comments on the YouTube video. She delivers this whole thing like she just killed the person who was supposed to actually give the speech. This chick would be the first to lead the purge. This was the creepiest response I've ever seen from the Republican Party. I literally told my family she must have somebody in the basement right now. I had to see if I was alone in my perception. Based on these responses, I'm not. Potentially the most sociopathic yet Disney Channel delivery I've ever seen. Imagine thinking that every household was still a nuclear family and then blaming Mexicans for everything. Why is she smiling when, ta when talking about how families are unsafe? I'm not American, so politics aside, this is a really scary person. The crazy HOA committee member who comes to your door to remind you you can't leave Amazon packages on your doorstep overnight. Nothing says I'm a Christian who cares about the poor like a golden crucifix studded with diamonds. True! If the Republican Party thinks this is a representation of a suburban woman, it's no wonder they overturned Roe. This is what they think women are like. Wow, so, uh, so out of touch. This is the most insane crap I've ever heard. She smirked while talking about supposedly horrible things. This is about as sick as it can get. This seems like an educational video for psychiatric residents on how to recognize a patient presenting with rapid cycling bipolar disorder during, during an ER interview. Wow, holy shit! Holy shit! <laughs> the woman experienced those horrors in Mexico, many miles away from the U.S. border. Border. It also happened 20 years ago during President Bush's term, and the woman didn't confide to Brit. She's already on her website for everyone to read. Hannibal Lecter, I'm the scariest dude ever, real or imagined. Katie Britt, hold my spritzer. <laughs> Oh my god, that might be the best one so far. Oh. She claims she's worried about her children's well-being, but she named her daughter Bennett and her son Ridgeway. Wait, she named her son Ridgeway? 
Did I miss that? Evening, America. My name is Katie Britt, and I have the honor of serving the people of the great state of Alabama and the United States. I am a proud wife and mom of two school-aged kids. My daughter, Bennett, and my son, Ridgeway. Are Ridgeway? His name is fucking, how did I miss that? Am I an idiot? His fucking name is, Ri oh God. <laughs> Come on, this is an op. This, this is, this is liberal 40 chess. Joe Biden did it. He did it. He's actually going to win thanks to this lady. Thanks to the son named Ridgeway. My large adult son whose name is fucking Ridgeway. Jesus Christ. What a name. Imagine going to school and being like, my name's Ridgeway Brit. That is the most Republican name. Oh my dear God. My, my cousin, uh, Henry Kluge and his sister, Clampin Kluge. Sometimes we all get together and we're like, Ridgeway, Clampin and Kluge. I would name my son Banjo before Ridgeway. Yet yeah, straight up. My God. Did she have an SUV? It does sound like what you like a name for a uh, a make model of SUV. Wow, that is bad. All right, everybody. I don't think there's anything else we need to say about the Republican uh, response to the Joe Biden State of the Union. I didn't think it was possible for Republicans to make Joe Biden look better, uh, but that did it. And it definitely raised my mood. Anyway, if you had fun reacting to this with me and uh, enjoyed my funny jokes, impersonations, and other general nonsense, make sure that you press subscribe down below and make sure you press like as well, because I'd love to have you as a part of this community. Holy shit. That was, in, that was insane, everyone. Was that worth it? It was totally worth it. Thank you. Thank you to those who told me to watch this. That was, the, that was tonight's gift. I now realize we're definitely not able to, we're not gonna be able to do the other content that I wanted to do tonight. Not even a, sh not a shot in fucking hell. That took way longer than I expected. And we're, we can't do the democracy stuff tonight, which means my stream title was officially a lie. I'm not done yet though, I'm not, not quite yet. There we go. I renamed the I renamed the stream. I was desperately waiting for Dune. Don't worry. I'm going to talk about should I talk about Dune? Maybe I should. I don't know. I got to think about this. I got I need to catch my breath for a minute. Marina with the $10. Thank you so very much for the super sticker. Thank you very very much, Marina. Also, there were a couple of other ones. Mother Mir set with the $5. Good evening, Demon Mama and chat. I've been wanting to start HRT for a long time, but the hassle the government keeps making me go through is so dumb. Nice remix, though. Really sorry to hear that, Mother Mir said. I hope that you are able to get safe access to HRT as soon as possible. There is a reason I support safe access to information for DIY. More retro with the $2. Beware AI. It's black bo box possible deniability. True. I agree, More Retro. Thank you very, very much. 
and more retro with the previous five dollars i meant to say you should do a research stream at how this mirrors the florida dem primary there's more to do than voting but people are bent on quitting on a stopgap that's true i really appreciate the support thank you so very much Another bored person with the $5 says, I wish both of these geriatric mummies would just void their diapers on stage so the public would stop seeing them as capable leaders. It's fucking true! Also, Brutus Magnuson says, My partner's mom, who voted for Biden, is terrified of immigrants flooding in. Middle America is destroying the Democratic Party. That just sounds, uh, I don't know about middle America, that just sounds like a racist. There are Democrats who are racists. Like, it's fairly common, unfortunately. I do kind of want to talk about D Dune 2. Timid Frogs with the $2. Thank you so very much. Great segment. Love the glasses. Don't worry. I'll do your memes. Don't worry. I'll, I'll hit your memes. Don't worry. I got to figure out what I'm doing. I'm just, I'm taking a breather for a second. I got so fucking mad during the State of the Union. You know, I really try not to do that. I really do, but it was my genuine feelings, you know? Where's this sweater from? This is from Killstar. It was part of their Christmas collection. It's one of my favorites that I got from Killstar. The Mia Mulder video. Yeah, we won't be able to do that tonight. I, I want to do it, though. I really do want to do it. I just didn't... I didn't expect that it was going to take a, this long to get through all of that. I really didn't. I'm invested in these new filmatic adaptions of Dune. Oh, I have a lot to say about that. Um, there are... Oh, God. I have so much to say about Dune, too. All right. Maybe I should do that. Okay. Let's do the meme real quick. Let's do the Mario Party meme. Let's check this Mario Party meme. Let's do it. Mario Party meme. Let's do it. Has any of you played Mario Party 5? I don't no. think so. Yes. Wait, Bran, have you played every single Mario Party game? Yeah. Oh, Who okay. Are you, wh why are what you kind surprised? of question is Why that, would bro, you even Evie? bother asking? Come on. All right, but it doesn't matter. Eevee! Yell it! You yell it loudly! Uh, why? I will pick! Why? <laughs> <laughs> It's too early, man. It's too early. Oh my god. It's like Evie got stabbed while he was saying that. <laughs> Brent, has any of you played? That, that guy just gave himself uh, esophageal polyps. He is never going to be able to speak again. That is like the I just shredded my vocal folds. Holy shit. Jesus Christ. It's missed. Holy, holy shit! It's it's Rubik's Ron, and Pipe Peter. Hello. Uh, hello? Hello? Uh, hello? Uh, hello? You broke. Alright, 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 Ruby.
Kubik's run? He really kicked Pipe Peter's ass, though. Luna Rose, have you seen the recent drama with Killstar workers' rights issues? I haven't. Uh, I'll have to look into it. Um, that's really unfortunate. Um, yeah, that sounds terrible. Unfortunately, uh, I have heard they've had conflicts in the past. It seems really difficult to uh, it seems really difficult to find clothing brands that are uh, ethical in any way these days. I can't. I don't think I can do Dark Souls two tonight, even though I really want to. Even though I really miss Dark Souls two, I don't think I've got the energy for it. Um, I'm not gonna lie. I'm feeling pretty goddamn drained after that State of the Union shit. I, d I think I will talk about Dune, though. Let's talk about Dune. I want to do a Dune review. I'm sorry, I know. I warned, I said it would only be if we had enough time. Uh. My lovely, lovely imps. That was a bad start. I'm gonna do that again. I'm gonna fix that. I'm gonna do a better start. I'm gonna do a much better start. Hold on a second. We can do better than that. I can do much more better than that. Hold on. Hold on, I, have, I gotta have this ready. I gotta be ready. All right, ready? <clears throat> Yes, my lovely, lovely imps. I have now seen Dune 2. Dune Tuner. Dune 2. I've seen Dune 2. And I actually quite enjoyed it. But I wanted to talk about it a little bit. There's so much that I was thinking about when I was watching Dune 2. I am a very, very big fan of the Dune universe. I love the Dune games. I've played a whole bunch of them. The first Dune thing that I ever had contact with was actually David Lynch's Dune, which I love. And I know that David Lynch himself, uh, he David Lynch describes the Lynch Dune as a great sorrow of his life, which is one of the most heartbreaking things I've ever heard, ever. Because even in its flawed and imperfect state, it is still, in my opinion, a really enjoyable film, specifically because it really went there. Okay, so that, that was my introduction, okay? It really went there with the psychedelics. It really went there with the strange designs, with the otherworldly feelings. It was doing a lot of stuff, and it is imperfect. Don't get me wrong, there's flaws in that film but I still like it. That was my introduction to Dune. And I saw it as a very young kid. I'm talking like I must have been six or seven, maybe eight when I saw Dune the first time. And I won't lie, it scared me shitless. Just so we're 100%, I was scared out of my mind by half of the stuff that happened in Dune. But it also made me kind of fall in love with that universe. And Throughout the years, I played various Dune things. I enjoyed Dune art. And then I uh, fairly recently decided I'm going to actually read, finally read through the entire Dune series, which has been a great decision. Really enjoyed it. I enjoyed the Dune part one, and I expressed in my review of Dune one some of my mild criticisms. And I just saw Dune two. And I have so many thoughts. First of all, I think that Dune Part 2 is a stronger movie than Dune Part 1. I think uh, it is just all around pretty much better in every aspect, with very few exceptions. The movie looks better. The, the, the pacing, uh, while a little bit fast, definitely feels a little more uh, engaging and exciting. The special effects look even better than the first one. Um... Maybe the soundtrack was a little stronger in the first one, but I haven't made up my mind on that. 
Um, and there was there was a lot of stuff that I really enjoyed about Dune Two. Um, the the camera work was fantastic. the The casting was spot on. In fact, I think that's probably my favorite thing about Dune Two. Um, uh, Timothy Chalamet is an absolutely incredible yeller. Like, seriously. My friend said it was hot when Timothy Chalamet yelled. And I was like, huh? And then I went and saw the movie, and I'm like, half of his lines in the movie are him fucking losing it. Just screaming at the top of his lungs. And it was awesome. I loved it. He ha Like, he really gives it his all. And he's good at it. He screams well. It was great. Um, the, they, the Emperor, uh, Emperor Shaddam IV uh, of House Carino, the Emperor of the Known Universe, is played by Christopher Walken, which is such a perfect fit. I literally, I can't even imagine a better fit than that. Um, huge shout out. Um, to, uh, Leah Sadu. Leah Sadu played, um, Lady Fenring. Fenring, I think is how it's pronounced. Lady Fenring. Um, and even though her part was fairly small, she absolutely sold it. Um, what, oh, why am I blanking on his name? Uh, Austin Butler. That's, I was blanking on his name. Austin Butler played Fade Rotha. Nailed it. Just did a great job. A very, very different interpretation than other ones that I've seen of Fade Rotha. Um, but I really liked it. Uh, he played the character very well. Uh, kind of like a dangerous, but ultimately somewhat naive sociopath. Um... <laughs> And he, he just nailed the, the role really well. Of course, we have a lot of uh, returning roles. Um, uh, I, uh, I, I did actually like Javier Bardem as Stilgar, although a lot of people said he was kind of hamming up the accent a little bit. And I do agree that was a little bit strange. But, um, but I do still think the performance was very good. And he really looked great. He definitely sold the the gravity and uh and religiosity of the stillgar character um yeah um hold on one second um rebecca ferguson played uh uh jessica again returned to for the role of jessica but they had her tricked out with these face tattoos because in this film, uh, she is sort of enlightened to the position of a, uh, like a religious leader. Um, and she actually like, she basically becomes a different person. Um, I'll get into like the plot stuff in a minute. I'm just kind of talking about the different roles that I thought were very well, for, very well done for right now. Um, also, uh, the, 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 the sort of visuals of the film while the first one had also had really, really solid visuals, um, I feel like this one was a little more bold overall um, with, with the, 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 the parts of the world that they decided to show. And this especially came to a peak when they visited uh, Gady Prime, the home world of the Harkonnens. And I learned after seeing the film that they actually shot that entire section on infrared film. The entire section on Gady Prime was um, essentially all black and white, and it was mega high contrast. Like I'm talking, people's skin seemed to glow with like 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 polished marble. It was upsetting, uh, and the the like, it was the deepest darkest black point that you can possibly imagine. It was all the brightest whites and the darkest blacks you could possibly imagine as far as color is concerned. And the everything about that section felt like an upsetting and somewhat sickening dream. Uh, they had these really cool effects where they had these fireworks that weren't actually fireworks, but they were like 
They were like cannon shots that blew up into like goo or ink. And they were they were detonating up in the air with these ink bombs that were like black ink and splattering all over the place. And the, the base was just thumping the entire time. There's a, a deranged, bloodthirsty crowd. Amazing. They had these really cool, in that section, um, there's like an arena battle in that part of the movie. And they had these, these uh, like attendants that were like a gladiatorial attendance. And they were wearing like latex outfits with these enormous like six foot long horns, giving them the look of like a, uh, they looked like a Hercules beetle walking around with little whips. And it was amazing. I, I loved it. Oh my God, it was, it was incredible. And of course they had, like I said, a lady, Lady Fenrig ring, Lady Fenring played by Leah Sadu was featured in this section and she nailed the mood very well. She was doing some psychic witch stuff. Amazing. Um, the worms looked awesome. All of the ships that they showed, they revealed a lot more spacecraft in this one. And they all, the designs were all really spot on and weird. At one point in the movie, there was like a, um, there was like a, a, a it looked like a like a lotus seed pod, if you know what I'm talking about. You guys know everybody. That's like the iconic tryptophobia uh, image, where it's got like these weird. They had a ship that looked like that. It was like a a heart shaped ship that had a bunch of holes in it that fired out a bunch of missiles. Crazy, disgusting. There was a there was a Harkonnen ship that was like a a giant bloated tick. It was like a harvester that was carrying, or it was a a like almost looked like a balloon that was harvesting a, a uh, or that was carrying a harvester. And it looked like this big bloated tick just with a thing hanging off of it. They, it was awesome. The, the mood setting, the visual choices, the, uh, uh, the camera work uh, was great. And the special effects really, really did blend uh, very seamlessly with the rest of the film which is something that a lot of movies struggle with. Even with the extremely advanced CGI technology that exists now, a lot of movies um, have the tendency of giving the impression that the actor isn't actually there. And that didn't happen in this film at all, basically. Um, they did a very good job of, of, of using the CGI uh, in such a way that it didn't feel like you were watching a character on a soundstage. It felt like they were in the location, even when they sometimes obviously weren't because you can't be on a weird alien spacecraft. Um, all of that was really solid. Um, there was a couple of things that I had some issues with in this film that I wanted to talk about. And the first one is probably the most glaring issue. And this is the same problem, by the way, that I had with the first Dune movie, which is that, <laughs> and this is actually the first thing I said after I walked out of the movie. Uh, I was shocked at the decision to make a, like the most famous piece of sci-fi about psychedelics into a movie about Xanax. W very, very weird decision. And I do not know why they did that. I have no idea what the decision, what, what, where the brain process was. Because Dune is so weird in that way, okay? It is very strange. Um, when you, you, the books, the Dune, inter uh, the, the Dave, David Lynch Dune, these are all movies, or these are all pieces of media that embrace the, and even the games often will embrace the weird psychedelic, it depends on the game, I guess, but they'll embrace at least portions of it. Um, in Dune, the presentation of dreams and the narration of characters' thought patterns when they are on, when they are like in an environment that is literally saturated with a, with a hallucinogenic drug it, it is, you will get disoriented reading Dune. And aspects of that, like, psychological, psychedelic 
uh, uh, disorientation are present in other interpretations of Dune, and they are just really not here in the Denis Villeneuve Dune. Um, I was very surprised by that. The only scene, and this was my favorite scene, is the one that I already mentioned, which is the, the Gady Prime birthday uh, infrared scene, which truly felt like you were experiencing something trippy. There's actually, there's a scene in the movie um, where Paul, our main character, Moadib, uh, consumes this, uh, this liquid that's called the water of life. And the water of life in the Dune books is basically, um, it's basically like, a, it's always described as a poison. It's basically um, Datura, like a, 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 a nightmare hallucinogenic drug that can kill you and does make you have a bad time no matter what. No one will ever have a good time drinking the water of life. Um, and in fact, like the ritual that is involved with the water of life uh, usually kills somebody, if not multiple people. And in the movie, he drinks this and he has kind of like a cloudy bad dream and then goes to sleep. And I was so surprised at that decision to, to, to have like the scene basically just be kind of like a, you're, he kind of has like a mushy dream and then it just is over. And he's just, he's like, oh, I'm going to sleep. And I, I was like, bro, I, I don't get it. I was very confused. Uh, it, Alex Love says, doesn't it kill any male that drinks it? Yes. In, um, in the universe of Dune, it will kill any male that drinks it. However, um, that's actually not 100% accurate because actually the reason that it kills any male that drinks it is because it will actually kill anyone that drinks it. However, in the universe, the Bene Gesserit, which is an all-female order of psychic women, more or less, the Bene Gesserit train themselves to psychically modify chemicals. So if they drink a poison, they can like sort of go into a trance state and they can use their minds to change the chemical structure of poisons. So the real reason for why males always die when they drink the poison is because the only other people who drink it generally are Bene Gesserit women. And they have the ability to transform the poison into something else. So... It's kind of a little bit misleading there, but yes, um, yeah, yeah. Um, so those were some of the things that that those were some of my thoughts about the Dune Two movie. And I have another criticism, which is that the movie needed to be a lot longer, or they needed to make a third part. In my opinion, one of the biggest problems of the uh, of of this film was that it felt uh it felt like the they were rushing through the plot and that's both in comparison to the book which it is an adaptation of and also just generally in the in the book the what happens in the movie okay sorry I should start this way in the movie the events that are depicted on screen occur in about a span of six months is what is the time that is shown on the, you know, on screen. In the books, the period, the same period for all of those same events to happen is closer to about five years, like somewhere between two to five years. And um, it really shows, most of the time, this type of thing wouldn't really matter because, you know, uh, you can just kind of be like, uh, well, whatever. We're not going to show that time in the same way or we're going to avoid talking about the exact time. But in this movie, they actually really did put a time limit on themselves because at the beginning of the movie, we learn for sure that, or actually at the end of the first movie, we learn that Lady Jessica is pregnant with a baby. And 
So she's pregnant at the very beginning of this movie, and she's still pregnant at the end of this movie, and she's not close to having the baby yet. She still has months to go. In fact, I think they literally say, I've been pregnant for six months at, some, at one point. And uh, that's kind of an interesting decision, because what the events that are actually depicted in the movie are pretty goddamn intense. Um, over the course, you're, we're supposed to kind of buy the idea that over the course of six months, like almost an entire war unfolds uh, um, and also a religion is built and it starts to strain believability. Um, not just as a product of the like claimed time that, 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 you know, is, is, uh, is sort of, you know, they say, Oh, it's only happened in six months and you go Re really this whole war unfolded in six months. Like, before a baby was born, you managed to do, like, an entire planetary war and also build a new religion? That, that's a little bit, hmm? But also, there's another problem, which is that it's reinforced by the fact that the screen time for everything that needs to happen feels extremely truncated. We see uh, very scarce few uh, conflicts in a war that we're constantly told is happening. They mention, oh, the war is happening, the war is happening. And there's basically like one major conflict scene in the war. And that scene is to do all of the heavy lifting for an entire planetary war. And in the books, of course, it couldn't be further from that. In the books, there's not only is there like a time skip where we find through a very strange process of, 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 of a stoned out of his mind, tripping balls, Paul thinking back on what happened. But there's like a time skip with his like his like LSD memories, but also the book has just hundreds of pages devoted to various war activities and war strategizing. And it's really good and fun um, and interesting that happens between Paul, the Fremen, and the Harkonnens. That, that struggle is really built up as a part of the story. And it just isn't on the screen in this uh, part Dune Part 2 movie. You Characters reference it a lot. They say, oh, we've been struggling on Dune for a long time, but it's not actually shown all that much. And it's a little bit unfortunate. Um, actually, it's really unfortunate. And I feel like with more screen time, the movie would have been a lot stronger or even just doing another movie, having this part say what it does and then have another movie to do a whole bunch of other stuff. I feel like that would have actually been a really good call um, because it feels rushed and it, it damages the, uh, it damages its own storytelling and also feels like certain things are completely rushed through. Um, the, the drinking of the, Paul drinking the water of life, which is forbidden because he's a, he's a, he's a man. He's not supposed to drink the water of life. And yet he does it anyway to prove a prophecy. Um, and which is of course a fundamental deception is not given the time that it needs. That is an incredibly important moment in the narrative. It's incredibly important to the themes of the film. Dune 2 being a movie that, you know, talks about the nature of, of, of a messiah. It talks about the nature of religion. It talks about like uh, fate and whether or not we can change what we are, the, the, the like sort of paths that we're set on. And it also, and, and that moment is a pivotal moment in Paul's character arc, you know? Um, he's, uh, in, in that moment, he's kind of deciding in a lot of ways to become something that, that he doesn't want to be. And that's another weird thing. Because in the movie, he spends most of the movie basically saying that he doesn't, I don't want to be the Messiah. I don't want to run, lead a jihad. I don't want to do any of that. And then he just kind of has a moment of where he just snaps. He just kind of does it. And he's like, actually, I changed my mind. And this is very different from the book, by the way. Um, and obviously, you know, uh, adaptations they're different than the, the thing that they're adapting, but nonetheless, they're tied to it. In the book, the process of, of Paul becoming uh, becoming the Lisan Al-Gib. Al-Gib? Lisan Al-Gib? Lisan Al-Gib. I always pronounce it wrong. Um, 
the, the this messiah figure is one of him continually making decisions that that like he he basically keeps making exceptions he's just like ah i don't want to become the messiah but god it would be so convenient and perfect and strategic for me to make this decision here and I can see that if I make this decision, it will put me closer to becoming something that I claim not to want to be. And we don't really see any of that in the movie. We just kind of see him, he basically takes a drug and has a personality change, which is not at all what, what Dune, like, happen, like, the book is not about that portion at all. It's not like you take a drug and you become a bad person. Uh, in fact, it's a very, very specific critique of religious leadership and 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 hero worship that the movie fails to deliver on and as a result dune 2 has a problem in undercutting its own message and its critique of of messiah which it is doing it is definitely a movie that is trying to critique the concept of messiahs it is trying to critique the concept of apocalyptic religions um it is definitely trying to do that but it it has a shallow critique as a result of not having enough time for us to truly see um, what Paul is struggling with and the choices that he is making that leads him to that place. Um, yeah. And um, as a longtime book fan, I respect your critiques, but I have major disagreements. I mean... Sure. Uh, and I'm, I'm totally open to hear those, but this is sort of my read uh, of this and my comparison from my experience reading the book versus, um, versus the, the film. And there are aspects that are similar. Like, there are things that do change Paul. Like, I mean, his experience with Spice, basically, Paul is the most abused like child who has ever lived in the dune universe he's been like triplicately groomed by like three different organizations i mean that literally he's been like triplicately groomed he's been groomed by the bene gesserit he's been groomed by uh by the atreides um by the atreides uh like house royal culture and he's also been groomed by mentat training which like mentat training is like a grueling process that teaches your brain to be a computer. And um, when he when he takes the spice, it kind of makes him have a mental breakdown, which is depicted in both uh, the movies and the book. Um, and that does definitely change him uh, because he, he can't exactly handle it. But it's not really the main thing that, uh, uh, it's not like, that's not the one thing that does it. It's not like that's the thing that breaks him and he becomes like an like a overnight becomes like a like an evil character. He has multiple moments throughout the books where he makes decisions that put him on a different path, where he struggles with whether or not he actually wants to be this thing that he sees in his future. He wants to on on one hand, he seems like he wants to avoid it because it it doesn't match with his conceptualization of self. Um, and it, it's not quite this, that, that doesn't quite hit to the same degree in the movie. And in my opinion, the movie's critique of, of the Messiah figure, uh, struggles as a result. Um, that is true. Um, they, they do, uh, uh, uh as not an Android says, uh, not an Android says Paul wasn't as self-reflective in the movie, but I feel like Chani filled that role. It's true, but it has a different effect. It is true that Chani, Chani's role was largely to uh, sort of represent what, what Paul claims he wants to be, like somebody who is fighting for what he believes in and not just for power. But that's, but, and that part is good. His dynamic with Chani as portrayed in the movie is hits really hard and it's good. But it doesn't have the same effect of like portraying someone coming to different junctures and continually sort of siding with the one that gives him more power. Find basically coming to a, a juncture and going, yeah, but 
I'd, I'd do better in the war. I'd be able to save these people if I took this power. And that power basically pulling him towards a destiny that he doesn't seem to want to, he on one hand doesn't seem to want to fulfill, but at, as he goes into it more and more, he becomes more and more of that person that he initially said he didn't want to be. And that doesn't work as well in the film, even with the Chani thing, because it's external now. It's his disagreement with another character as opposed to a conflict that's happening with his, within himself. It's still present, but it's very different. Um, and, uh, yeah, um, there is another pyro guy in chat says, my biggest problem with the part two film is the lack of the spacing guild and chome in general but i think that villanueva did a good job at adapting something with a limited runtime um so i was shocked at the sort of lack of mention of the spacing guild uh uh in uh in in the, the movies because i feel like that's gonna have a problem and in fact i I kept kind of sticking on the spacing guild thing because I feel like it messes up um, the dynamic of the struggle. And let me explain. I'm going to get into some little lore stuff, okay? So in the Dune universe, there is... Oh, God, now I'm going to forget the term. See, this is the problem with me being a lore head. I remember the concept, but I don't remember the name. Okay, in Dune, there's basically this concept of uh, three powers that balance each other out in the universe. There is the empire, the emperor, the, the throne of the emperor. There is the Bene Gesserit order, and then there is the spacing guild, okay? These three, I can't remember the exact name that they call it. They call it something. It's like the triumvirate concordat or something, or the concordat, something like that. And those three are massive powers that are supposed to in the in the mythology of the uh, in the propaganda of the empire and of everybody else they're supposed to balance each other out it's a balance of power okay and the spacing guild is very enigmatic it is it is kept at a at an arm's distance for a lot of the books but it's present and it's mentioned and it is seen in its effects and it has implications that are very present that are totally not present in that are not present in the movies. It's in fact it's barely mentioned in the movies. Everybody who knows Dune knows the term, knows the little phrase, the spice must flow. Why must the spice flow? Well, the answer is because the spice is a drug that allows for these these creatures, these beings. They're, they used to be humans, and they're not really humans anymore. But these beings called navigators, uh, they basically live a life of perpetually being tripping out of their mind on spice. And it allows them to fold space and time. And they can do that with enough spice. They can do that on a level that they can tell, like basically warp entire ships across the known universe and nobody else can do that and they cannot have a society that spans across the universe if they don't have interstellar travel and the only way to do interstellar travel in this universe is to have these guys hopped up on spice it is the only known way to do it the spice must flow because the spacing guild navigators need the spice to be able to make everything run People would be stranded on their own planets and the entire empire would crumble in an instant if the spice stopped flowing and they could not have the navigators continue to warp space and time. That's the basic summary. There's, of course, there's a little other, there's other powers and stuff that's there. For example, there's the Houses of the Landsrad, but that's getting into, that. those are a subsection of the Empire it, to a certain degree. We'll, 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 I don't want to get too complicated. I'm trying to keep it simple here to explain what I'm talking about with the movie. I know it's not a perfect summary of the lore, but I think it's a pretty decent job, okay? Um, 
That's why the spice must flow. And in the movie, the absence, the spacer, the spacing guild is mentioned, I think, one time in the original movie. It's basically a line or two here or there. Um, and we don't understand why the spice really must flow. We don't actually get why it must flow. And also, that upsets the power balance because part of the, uh, part of the intrigue and also part of what Paul is able to do is that he's able to play these different factions against each other. Um, and, uh, you know, the fact that the Empire is threatened not, not just because uh, of, like, money or anything like that, but because Paul is able to basically... Uh, with, by allying with the Fremen, by organizing the Fremen into a, a uh, you know, r fighting army, a, a unbelievably efficient fighting and killing machine, by being able to monopolize all of the spice fields on Arrakis, he's able to basically choke or threaten the spacing guild, which in turn completely threatens the em emperor. It's an interesting thing that's just not present. So instead what we have is sort of like a two-party struggle um that it it's an odd it's an odd decision and also of course they missed out an opportunity uh to depict some of the one of some of the weirdest stuff um in the uh the weirdest stuff in the dune universe the spacing guild is a strange and fascinating and enigmatic organization and of course most people are very familiar with the um this character from the Lynch Dune, which uh, people actually, there's a theory, and I don't know if this is true or not, um, but there is a theory that uh, that the Lynch Dune guild navigator design was so impactful that Frank Herbert actually incorporated it into his later books because there was no physical description of the guild navigators before... Um, oh my god, what was the, I think it's called, uh, was it, fuck, oh no, now I'm not remembering which book it was in. Anyway, a book that came out like three or four years after the Lynch Dune. But this is the creature, of course. The, this human, vaguely humanoid, swollen brained thing with a weird triangular mouth. These guys don't appear at all. And there's no real stand-in for them either. We just are kind of left in the dark as to why the spice is so important. Chapter House Dune. That's the one. Chapter House Dune. Previous to that, they're mentioned, their abilities are explained, but they're never physically described. And in Chapter House Dune, it's described specifically as having a big swollen head and a, a floppy nose and a triangular mouth, which is exactly how uh, it was depicted in the Lynch Dune. Um, and of course in the Lynch Dune, they were, it was a crazy hell of a scene. Like what a, what an amazing and, and transfixing scene. This, the revelation of this strange monster and its ability to travel through space. Um, not an Android it says space folding is based on a technology called the Holtzman field. Yeah, but they can only use that technology because their brains are big enough to psionically engage with it. The navigators are only able to, to use the, the Holtzman field effect because their brains are so huge and psionic. They could have just yeeted themselves into the abyss of space until they reached Arrakis. Okay, come on. You are, you are technicalitying me so hard right now. You might be right, Pyro Guy. And I said this was a theory. This was a theory that I read. So it is possible. Um, that there was a description of a navigator before this, but I, I don't know if that's true. I, 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 I would have to go and dig deeper and I'll, I'll be sure to pay attention and give an update as I'm reading through the books more. Uh, cause I have not yet read, uh, I have not yet finished Dune Messiah. So, you know, I have a ways to go and we'll see if we encounter another one. Regardless, the Lynch Dune navigator was a, a shocking and fascinating uh, interpretation and I liked it um, 
So, um, where was I? I got off on a navigator thing. There's no, there's no spacing guild. Um, there's no guild navigators. And so, um, the, the struggle feels a little different in the Dene, Denis Villanueve, uh, 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 Dune. Um, but with all of these critiques said, I still really enjoyed the movie. And I want to give a special shout out to the sound design because um, it was great. The sound design used thudding bass so unbelievably well in that it really helped magnify the emotional experience. Everything in these films feels like a vibration, uh, a vibration of your goddamn bones. And I love that because of course, like it, it aligns thematically on Dune, vibration calls worms. Every step is a potential thud that could call a worm. They use the thumpers. And throughout the entire film, there's this recurring, just, just barreling bass constantly for so many different things. Um, so I, I, really, I really did enjoy um, the, the sound design for these films, the, 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 there's a lot of sound detail. I don't want to just fixate on the bass, but that was really the part that stood out. Like I mentioned in the Gady Prime, the the Gady Prime segment, they have these these jelly bomb fireworks that are just amazing, and each one of them comes with this like goopy thudding bass that sounds like you're listening to like an amniotic sac that has a bomb in it. It's crazy, and I love it. Um, I, I really really enjoyed that. There's there, the 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 Dune Part Two, the Denis Villeneuve, uh, uh, Dune, it does epic very well, and I mean it. It really does. It 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 suffers in that it's a little bit more shallow than what I usually, you know, crave when I'm thinking of Dune. You know, the there's a part, there's an aspect to to everything Dune that is very messy and complicated and and otherworldly and mind-bending that isn't 100% present in these ones. However, it it does do the epic nature very well. Everything is larger than life and thudding and terrifying. And I like that. And dramatic. Um, while there's maybe a little too many slow-mo glamour shots, they look damn good. And I can't blame them for wanting to take as many slow-mo glamour shots as they did because they looked fucking incredible. Um, the characters, uh, the outfit design is amazing. The, uh, uh, the, 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 the casting is perfect. And so you get amazing actors in amazing outfits with beautiful cinematography and you have incredibly epic, breathtaking glamour shots at every turn, and it feels great. And it definitely sells uh, a, a, an exciting space adventure. And I think that it will, I think that these movies will provoke further interest in Dune. And I think people are gonna be in for a real trip because uh, everything else Dune is off the walls, bonkers, dream world, nightmare stuff. And I love that, that's the stuff I love. Um, there were a lot of things that uh, I feel, I, I've been thinking about this movie a lot. As you can probably tell, I've been rambling about it for like almost an hour now. Um, and um, and there was a lot of, there's been so much stuff I've been thinking about in my head. One of the things that I've seen people talking about is like, you know, that they like to see when an adaptation really adds something of its own. You know, when it when it brings something new to the uh, to, to the mythology. And at first I was kind of like, well, did they really succeed at that? And then I thought about it a little more. And I think, yeah, they did. The one of the best examples was the little goofy thing that I did, the, the little bit I did with the blah, 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 that shit. That stuff, the Sardaukar chants were, are actually a legitimate, like amazing touch. Like I actually think they're very cool and they add depth to the Sardaukar. And even in the books, 
um, we get a lot of lore and information about the Sardaukar, but but that that chanting scene, the ritual battle chant with the guy going burger goblin burger girl, whatever, amazing. And it's such a mood setter that you really it sells the danger and the strangeness and the the fucked up uh, murder culture of the Sardaukar. I think that's awesome. I, I don't know if that part is actually throat singing. There's a lot of throat singing in the soundtracks, which is awesome. But I don't actually know if this, I mean, I guess they probably are. It's probably modulated throat singing, I guess. Um, in the, the uh, I should talk about the OSTs in a second and I will. Um, I don't know what they did to make the, the, the chant sound like that. Um, I really, really like throat singing. My viewers will know I pl regularly play many different, uh, you know, uh, throat singing uh, tracks. I'm a big fan of throat singing. I think it's a fascinating talent, and there are so many different versions of it that have their unique touch. It's something I really love. It appeals to me a lot. So I like that generally. Uh, I don't actually know if that's what they used. It does kind of sound like it, but it's also so modulated and w warped which I also like. Um, I think the Sardaukar were done very, very good by this adaptation. And, uh, and I think that that alone is probably a really good, uh, a really uh, something that this adaptation adds to the mythology. I think that people are gonna think about the Sardaukar like that and think about their weird chants. I do, when I'm reading parts of the book, you know? Uh, another thing that I want to say that I think they did really good was the firearm weaponry is really great. There is a there's a specific scene in Dune Part 2 where they're doing a raid on a spice harvester. And they have an ornithopter, you know? And it's flying around and it has this gun that's like, it's like a, all I can describe it as like a space shotgun. And it, this, first of all, it sounds amazing. The sound design for it is just incredible. It's got this like extremely weird rhythm to it and it, and is super, super punchy. And uh, I love the gun. And it, it, it's so cool and scary. And it's like, you get this shot of them flying around and aiming it and then it's just like and it makes this like fucking monstrous noise. It's great. And I love that. I love that the the De Denis Villeneuve Dune um, spent a lot of time thinking about the weaponry. The las guns that they use, which are like a big part in the book, they're always talking about las guns. Um, there's a bunch of details about them that don't really matter uh, all that much for this conversation, but the las guns are a big thing. Uh, there's some special use cases, and they're very powerful, but they have massive drawbacks, and they can't always be used. And in this one, they they the las guns are like these big, these sweeping, instant cutting lasers. They're horrifying. They just metal disappears, gone, and you just there's a part where they slice a giant ship in half with this like like ground mounted gun, and it is it's great. It's it's terrifying to think about, like uh, like a like an infinitely sharp beam that can cut through anything instantly, and they they can do it with no effort. They basically just move their body like this, and a gigantic structure just cuts in half. So cool. Um, so the the firearm weaponry in the uh, Denis Villeneuve uh, Dune is another thing that I think that they're going to add. That they're going to be able to add to the um oh and in the first uh the first dune they have these guns that shoot like drill bits they have these little pistols that go pew, and they shoot like a small drilling bullet that will drill through the shields and to my knowledge those were just invented like i don't think those bullets or guns exist at all in the uh in the text they were just like oh that kind of makes sense let's do it and that's fucking cool super cool um yeah, it's very, 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 very well done. Um, oh, yeah. There's one other criticism I wanted to bring up. This has been a little rambly, but I feel like I've talked about a lot of stuff, and I feel good about what I've said so far. But there's one more thing 
that I want to bring up before I wrap this review up, um, which is there is one big criticism that I have, and it's in the depiction of Fremen society um, that didn't make a lot of sense to me, and I don't know why they chose this. So in all of the in all of the royal houses, we see a cold uh, imperial austerity, all of them. Even, even in our good guys, quote unquote, the Atreides, who are by comparison, you know, you know, they're fairly nice oppressors, basically. Uh, they're mildly heroic oppressors. Um, they're slightly easier to appreciate. But in all of them, we see very austere, brutalist uh, choices in design. Their structures are cold. They're proper. They're hyper clean. They're sanitized. And that's even true in Arakeen, which is a off-worlder built city, basically. Uh, or at least most of what we see is. Uh, Arakeen is a city that was, uh, that was, you know, basically built for oppressors to live in and to be a central point for off-worlders to have their palaces and for the empire emperor to visit and whatever. It's a off-worlder palace that has, like, you know, other people, you know, Fremen and whatever living around it. But the actual structures, the core structures uh, that are prominent in Arakeen are all these, these cold and austere things. And in Dune 2, we get to see the inside of a siege. And... In every other version of Dune, sieges are like, they're like a totally different world. They are full of life. There are gardens inside of sieges. There are factories and, and markets and, you know, festivals. And there are like, again, there are gardens and ecological research facilities inside of sieges. They're incredibly like lively completely they they are purely fremen culture they are not uh, there are they are depicted as uh, they're described in the books every room is like covered in brilliant tapestries because they live in ca the, like the 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 sieges are like cave cities they're like built into mountains they're like dug out of mountains so they hang brilliant colored and patterned carpets and and text textiles all over all of the walls and they're like d described as very beautiful um and then in this movie they look like just normal ass caves every depiction of the inside of a siege that we get are basically brutalist caves which made no sense to me and i don't know why they made that decision um it was a very very weird um very very weird decision they look like um and, and also we, when we see depictions of we see basically no depictions of fremen life inside the siege um except for people sort of scurrying away and hiding which is not how the sieges are depicted in the book or really in any other dune media in fact uh the sieges for the most part outside of when they're like actively being attacked are like full of life and food and and all kinds of activity um they're described as being places where like uh there's a there's a really great scene in the dune book where lady jessica is considering the fact that sieges are so safe they're especially in the south which is where we see the siege in the dune part two movie they're so safe that people don't even think about the possibility of being poisoned, that they just make and bring coffee for each other. Like she can't even believe it because even in her home, even on her home planet, uh, she could never do that. They always had to have like a person check, for, check all their food for poison and she will be sitting there and someone will just bring her a delicious cup of coffee, uh, like spiced coffee. Someone will just bring it into the room and she just can drink it without ever having to think. That's, that's the life that is depicted in the sieges and that we never see that. And it deeply undercuts the, the depiction of the Fremen. Um, yeah. I don't know. There was just nothing to go off of in, uh, 
in Dune 2. And I do feel like that's a that was a mistake that I wanted to bring up because I think it's pretty bad. The Fremen are uh, central. Uh, they are the most important group of people, single group of people in the entirety of Dune. Um, yeah. And to, 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 to sort of drop the ball on depicting their brilliant and and uh the the whole p part of the point is that the the people who are involved in the empire are they've deranged themselves they live miserable lives they are richer than the entire universe can possibly imagine 90 percent of the entire universe cannot even imagine how rich the like the 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 nobles of the empire are and how luxurious their lives are and yet they're fundamentally uh bereft of even basic pleasures and that is something that becomes very apparent in uh uh the uh, in the depiction that is present in the books that that the fremen as uh brutal as their existence can be on a planet that is uh constantly working against them as as oppressed as they are as as much oppression is meted out on them um their cities are wondrous and thriving and incredible and as beautiful as anything you'd encounter anywhere else in the universe um so it was a miss on that front anyway i've been talking about this film for some time now and I want to just say, I do recommend it. I think you should go check it out. I do think it's a great movie. And it felt like seeing, it really, it really, it brought some, brought some joy back in my heart. You know, going to the theater and seeing a movie and just being like, damn, I had a good time. Even with all the things that I was like, hmm, I don't know what to think about certain aspects of the, of the plot and whatever. It was a fucking solid film. And it felt great. It felt great to go see a sci-fi film, a fiction sci-fi film, and not have it be, uh, you know, a cinematic universe weirdness, uh, uh, you know, product placement bullshit. It was very nice. And also to have it be technically and artistically competent. It has flaws, not perfect, but it's a really goddamn good movie. I highly recommend it. There are aspects that I think if you're a Dune fan that they'll get lodged in your brain and you'll walk away from the film going, oh yeah, that is a part of the mythology of Dune for me. It is for me. I know now, whenever I think about the ornithopter weaponry, I've got that that fragmentation sh space shotgun mounted giant punt gun thing in my head. I know whenever I think about the... Uh, you know, whenever I think about the Sardaukar, I always think about that blah, 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 chat chant. Oh, good question. Trans girl Jade says the biggest question that needs answering though is, did you get a wormussy? I didn't, and I'm super bummed about it. Uh, I got in, and I really, really, really wanted to get the wormussy. For those who don't, you all know this is the most memed thing. Literally, the actors. And 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 uh, and interviewers and everybody's been talking about it. They've been making jokes about the worm the the popcorn box. That's it's a it's a it's a worm hole. Okay, it's a worm hole. It it's a worm Okay, um, the uh, the the whole uh, from what I understand. Sorry, I rambled there for a second because I was looking at something. Basically, what I uh, found out is that the AMC theaters, which is where I went, uh, like drastically understocked the worm bucket. And so even though I, they were supposed to keep having it for some time, they were completely sold out. Um, and that sucked. So I didn't get my worm bucket. Um, I would love one. If anyone got an extra one and wants to send it to me, uh, shoot me an email at demonmamaonline at gmail.com and I would love that. I'll even buy it off of you for a reasonable price. But um, yeah, 
they totally didn't have enough. I couldn't pre-order it. I couldn't really, I couldn't get it. And that bummed me out, but you no, know, whatever. You live, you learn. I got to enjoy a bunch of delicious popcorn without the worm bucket. I would have really liked the worm bucket. But if anybody has an extra, tell me and email me. Also, if you enjoyed this long and passionate review of Dune 2, I strongly recommend that you press subscribe down below. I talk about a lot of different stuff. One of those is media that I'm passionate about. So if you had fun with this, if it got your brain working, if you end up going and watching the movie, subscribe. And also tell me. Tell me your thoughts about the movie down below. Tell me if you went and saw it. Let me know. I want to hear your Dune thoughts. I love Dune. I truly love Dune. Anyway, thank you for watching. <sighs> there we go. I hope you enjoyed it, Pyro Guy. Thank you very much. That's really kind of you to say, Pyro Guy. Thank you so much. All right, it's 12.30. We've been streaming for seven and a half hours. It's time. It's time for me to wrap up. But before I do that, let me just double check. Let me just make sure that I didn't miss any donos while I was ranting. Excuse me, goodness. While I was ranting and rambling about everything Dune related. And then I'm gonna go vibe out. Because honestly, I felt pretty bad about getting so mad earlier. And I'm sorry. I shouldn't have taken it out. I shouldn't have taken it out on people who didn't deserve it. I know I probably shouldn't worry about it so much, but I do feel bad. I got really fucking pissed off, though. Piftle Cakes with the Tier 1 gifted sub, Jinx. Thank you. Mix Dizzy with the Five dollars. Deeply, deeply appreciate that. Mixed Dizzy says, the Dems are playing into the trans culture, culture war now. They arrogantly passed a parent's bill of rights law that'll be used to forcibly out kids. Yes, I heard about that. That was in my state of Washington and it was very fucking disgusting. A uh, huge failure of the Washington Democrat party. Really pathetic. Um, literally just didn't contest it because they hope that the, that the local courts will uh, will turn it down. Terrible gamble. Unbelievably stupid gamble. And in a Democrat-dominated state, just terrible. Oh, Timid Frog, I'm sure you'll enjoy watching it. I'm sure the VOD watchers are going to enjoy watching me fucking lose my shit. I definitely, listen, I definitely said some funny jokes. That was a rant for the ages, but I just feel bad that, I feel bad that I got so mad at, um, at, a, at somebody who's been a longtime viewer who didn't deserve it. I had been provoked before, and I've been getting hit with these goddamn Biden bots. They're so goddamn pathetic. Uncle Gumbald said, I, I got nostalgic, not gonna lie. I know, I'm sure people did. I used to get so much more fired up. But I, I don't know. I try to use my anger effectively, you know? I know I can't obsess over it, but whatever. Anyway, it was wonderful having you all here for my stream today. We had, even by the end of this seven hour stream, we still have 200 people watching, which means the world to me. Thank you so much for watching. Consider telling your friends about this stream. I would really like the stream to grow. We finally passed 29K. The last time I did a video about Biden, I actually lost a bunch of subscribers, which really bothered me, but also good riddance. Even though it bothered me, also I don't want fucking people who can't handle me to, to criticize Biden to be my subscribers. So if you know base people, tell them about the show. Tell them to come tune in. It'd be wonderful. Anyway. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you all very soon. And remember, do not fucking die. Good night, everybody. Bye for now.